Right, so hello. Greetings, everyone. Um, welcome to the Mary Magdalene Studies Association Conference for 2023. I can't believe it. This is actually the seventh year we've done this, seven years. Um, I founded this in 2017 after I moved to France. I'm just going to do a little introduction about you know, what it is, why we're here. And then I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, performer, who's called Jaya, and I'll explain what she'll be doing in a minute. Um, so after I moved to France in 2017 from Scotland, I was researching, as ever, sort of currents of esoteric Christianity, Gnosticism, Catholicism, Brexit, what's the meaning of life? And I, I, I came into contact with the living current of tradition that says Mary Magdalene came to Gaul after the crucifixion and resurrection that she escaped. Um, and there are variations of that story. Um, uh, but it was, um, it's very deeply rooted in French religious history. And um, uh, in the 12th century, even part of her remains were found in the south of France. And they're venerated to this day in a cave in Provence, which um, many people have you know, visited on pilgrimage. So I thought this is very interesting and has huge imp implications for what we understand about Christianity and the suppression of the feminine wisdoms. I've always been a, um, a devotee of the goddess as an academic. I think academics should be open to feminine wisdom. And is it true that that was crushed in the early church by Peter and the, the, the male disciples? If it's true that Mary Magdalene was even possibly the consort of Christ and then was attempted to be written out of history, this has huge implications for, for why things went wrong in, in, in the last 2,000 years of history. Um, I mean, so let's say it's a working hypothesis. I'm, I'm an academic sort of exploring the hypothesis that she might have been Christ's consort. She might have made it to Gaul. Um, you know, but I'm open to evidence. And the point of creating an um, academic association was, A, there isn't one. I looked carefully and I tried to find one. There isn't one. And yet Christians are supposed to be scholars. You know, there's, there's academic associations to study all kinds of other stuff. But not Mary, Mary Magdalene, like one of the most important apostles. I found that weird. So that's what we're doing here to try and bring together scholars and practitioners and also artists, novelists, filmmakers, because Mary Magdalene has become a sort of, um, you know, a venerable icon of a sort of resistance movement within Christianity against um, patriarchy and the oppression of feminine uh, wisdom. And there are many versions of Mary Magdalene. So in, in we've had six previous conferences and every, Every time there's a different, you know, speakers with different versions, and we've got some interesting ones lined up today. We'll be exploring different aspects. You could say there's as many Mary Magdalene's as there are people on the planet, because everyone sees her in a different light. Um, but that, I think, is, is why it's worth doing. <clears throat> so the other reason I've done this is because um, I'm really a peace scholar. I, I did my doctorate at the University of London in peace scholarship, and I and, and I specialise in interfaith conflict resolution. I think so many religious conflicts exist on the planet, disputes between different groups and, and ideologies. So I'm interested in the bigger interfaith implications of Mary Magdalene. Why isn't she mentioned in the Quran? Um, did the early Arabic scholars around Muhammad ever know of her? Um, she was certainly mentioned in the writings of Mani, who was a Christian Gnostic in Iraq, who strongly influenced early Islam, as I've explained in my commentary on the Quran. Um, and of course, Islam believes that everybody should get married and enjoy sexuality, and there's nothing sinful about that. They don't, and, and Muhammad was totally against this idea of celibacy as the way to God, godliness. He, he thought that was bonkers. Um, so you would have thought they would have really been interested in Mary Magdalene and made something of her as a figure. So I'm scratching away in Islamic scholarship to see why, you know, who's who's working on that. Um, so um, let's see. Um, the idea is a, an open forum for people that, that have registered to speak and um, 
And then we've also started publishing a journal, which I have here, um, the Mary Magdalene Studies Association journal, which carries um, news about scholarship, discoveries, um, articles, and so on, including artwork. So it's very, very eclectic. We're interested in the history of art. A number of people have done PhDs on Mary Magdalene. Um, uh, as, as portrayed in art. Uh, in medieval Europe, she was quite an important figure. She's often, you know, she has an iconic presentation of someone with long hair that's been weeping a lot. Um, and, um, but there are, there are other forms of representation. Um, <clears throat> so that's interesting. Um, and also even in music. So I've discovered somebody's just written a PhD at the um, University of Cardiff on Mary Magdalene in music presentations and wrote a piece of music herself as part of her PhD, which is, you can look this up, it's on, it's on her website um, at the University of Cardiff. So, you know, it's, and there are, every year there are some new scholars working on different aspects of this. Um, will we ever find out the absolute truth? You know, um, well, what is truth in history? If she walked into the room and started telling us her story, you know, maybe. Um, so I'm open to that. Um, because my theory of transpersonal history is that history is not just documents and facts. It's, it's memories which can be accessed perhaps through things like past life regression, um, deep hypnotherapy. Um, you know, maybe we, maybe we need to learn to tune into the past in a more subtle way. Because if you think about it, quantum theory explains everything that's made of vibrations, quantum waves in a dance. Maybe if we tune our minds as historians to become more subtle to vibrations, maybe the traces of truth are left all there and we can tune into them. So I'm into... I'm into revising history, historiography as a profession in the light of quantum theory and quantum metaphysics and um, you know, new science and saying we need to revise and upgrade our historical methodologies and that these past events in some way still resonant, we can tune into them. And, and I think we're all, we're all embedded with an inner Geiger counter that enables us to distinguish truth from falsehood. We have a sort of um, intuition. In the Christian um, language, that's called synderesis. It's our, it's our moral consciousness within us, in our souls, which tells us when something is true at a deep level. <clears throat> so that's what I'm really after here with this Mary Magdalene Studies Association, is to find the real truth of what's going on. Um, and I should just add, it's not, we're, not, we're not promoting any one particular version. You know, I'm not saying, yes, Mary Magdalene came to France and is buried near Rennes Chateau. No, she didn't come. She died in the war in Galilee, as Bruce Chilton said, who was one of our former speakers. You know, let's, let's have all the different... Oh, and there's another chap who did a PhD in France saying she didn't exist. There's no Mary Magdalene. It was all a scribe and error. And um, he proved in his PhD, which was passed, that... Actually, there isn't a Mary Magdalene at all. So that's an extreme version, the non-existent Mary Magdalene. Um, that seems a bit unlikely because there are so many Gnostic texts that have come down, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, Epistus Sophia and others, in which she is speaking. And she does have this iconic role as a teacher of Gnostic wisdom. Um, she's called the Apostle of the Apostles. Is that all just made up? Is that a projection? I, I somehow doubt that. I'd be very surprised. Um, <clears throat> it seems that she was perhaps someone who'd had spiritual difficulties and Christ had helped heal her. You know, everybody goes through rough patches. And according to Bruce Chilton, she became the, the head of the, let's call it the aromatherapy division of the, the, the Sangha as it was roaming around Galilee. She'd be the one, if you had troubles, you'd go to Mary Magdalene and she'd help you with healing oils and and um, clear whatever was troubling your mind. You know. that's, that's quite nice. And also to say another way in which she's interesting nowadays is through film. Obviously we have films, um, 
Um, there have been a few new recent movies which feature Mary Madeline quite strongly and which are very interesting. Um, <clears throat> and we're going to hear from one of our speakers later on about them. Um, and who is herself a, a filmmaker in the goddess tradition. Right, <coughs> I think, oh, I just wanted to share here in France, this is the uh, main kind of popular French history magazine, um, Secrets, Secrets d'Histoire, comes out periodically, and you can get it in all French news agents. And here's a whole issue on Mary Magdalene, um, dedicated to her art, um, you know, so that the tradition lives on. Um, and <coughs> there are people researching it. Here's a picture of the, the famous Last Supper. You know, was she there? Is she in the picture? Um, and there are various churches dedicated to her, including one in Veselay, which we went to, which is not far from here, which has um, some of her relics. And also down in the south of France in Provence. Um, a crypt is there, which has um, some other relics. Somebody has done a PhD at the University of Oxford recently also <coughs> on exploring the sarcophaguses of Provence in the Middle Ages here in France, um, because it was quite a, a thing to find a sarcophagus and then say it was very, very old. It brought kudos to the, the count in whom the country it was found. And this woman has researched because Mary Magdalene's sarcophagus was found in that time, the 1200s, and it's now the Basilica of Saint Maximin la Sainte Baume. This is a picture of this underground cave. And this woman at Oxford has, has researched this and other such sarcophaguses. And, you know, again, it's a question of was that really her body or was it like, you know, someone else? Um, so there are mysteries, um, and among the relics are, are uh, on that particular body, there was some red hair. She's always shown as having red hair for some reason, and, and people have tried to analyse it, you know. And in fact, they found things that do seem to point to it being original. Some pottery was found with it that came from first century Syria, you know, exactly the right place. Um, Finally, um, why does it matter? Um, well, um, there are scholars that look at the micro details, you know, and analyze the hair, or is it uh, the DNA of people from that time period and so on. And that's interesting, and we, we gather those kind of pieces of evidence. But I'm interested in the bigger picture. I'm interested in the meaning of history. I'm a philosopher of history. And later on today, when there's time on the program, I'll slot in a little talk about uh, the importance of Mary Magdalene for the philosophy of history. And um, we, we meet at a critical time in world history and European history when people are still poised on mutual self-destruction. And my mother was an anti-nuclear weapons campaigner and would be turning in her grave. Her middle name was Mary. Um, at the thought that Europeans might be about to blow ourselves up with nuclear weapons, which would then become the Third World War and you know, I don't think people in any continent would escape. So the question is whether there is some wisdom about peace that Jesus and Mary Magdalene stood for that is still relevant to our time, that transcends um, chronological time and is more to do with psychological time. And then what is that wisdom? That's, that's the reason why it's worth pursuing, I think. And, and what kind of gnosis is, is embedded in that, in that wisdom, and how can we access it? So that's the sort of deep context of what we're doing here. Um, and as a Druid Christian myself, I'm very interested in these, these Gnostic undercurrents to Christianity. Um, and here in the middle of Gaul, where we're based, which is Druid heartland of Europe, um, you know, the Druids were very wise people, I think. Well, they, they didn't have sophisticated technology, but they had an inner psychic technology. And I think that's why they resonated with the Christ story. And as St. Columbus said, Christ is my Druid. You know, there was a resonance between the Gauls who'd been oppressed by the Romans, conquered by Caesar, slaughtered in their hundreds of thousands um, for just the glorification of one military guy gone crazy. 
um, for his ego. And from a Druid perspective, therefore, the Christian story makes perfect sense. It's like the karma of the Roman Empire um, converting to the faith of one of the people who's crucified. I mean, it's an astounding story. Um, and I think we can make sense of it if we look at history as a series of undulating waves. Um, but also there are particles, i.e. events, which happen. And they have archetypal resonance, as you all would say. They mean something. History isn't just sort of flat, horizontal. It, it, we belong to many dimensions. And in the Druid community, we believe we live in the midst of an interdimensional matrix in which the gods and the underworld and this world are all, you know, co-present to one another. And my reading, if, I, if you read the Gospels in depth, as I've done and comment on them, you see that's where Christ was coming from, too. The kingdom of heaven is among us. You know, um, don't look for the end of the world. It's, it's already here. You know, this is a Druid talking. <clears throat> so I think the Christians of Gaul, like Saint Martial, who was the local Christian here in Limoges and Toussaint Croix, this, they, they realized that, as did Saint Columba. And of course, finally, to finish, the Druids were peacemakers, mediators. And you couldn't be a Druid unless you'd sworn to not involve yourself in direct physical violence personally. You had to be above the battle. Um, and I think that was Christ's position as well, because he never, you know, that wasn't his way either. Um, and Mary Magdalene and him must have had amazing conversations about peace and non-violence and what you do, you know, <clears throat> in the face of injustice and oppression. And I think what they were trying to do is, is make a stand for peace and love. And eventually it was, it was magnified, it was broadcast in miraculous ways, whether they foretold or saw it or, you know, there are many mysteries. Um, okay, so that's just to start the ball rolling, right? And a few thoughts to, to um, share. I hope that's of interest. And there's going to be many more um, revealed as we proceed. Right, now I'd like to introduce our first uh, speaker. I'm gonna pause for a moment. <clears throat> um. Right, so um, <clears throat> I'm gonna just introduce our first speaker who is has come a long way to be here. She lives in Colorado normally, in Boulder, and is a world traveler. Um, Jaya is um, an author and a counselor and a coach who specialized in relationships and, and dysfunctional and, and how to, how to, you know, how to understand your sexual nature, your erotic nature. And she's, she's discovered um, a technique, a key to classifying the forms of sexuality that human beings have, uh, which is fascinating. We met through the Wisdom um, Keepers Association, which we both belong to, which meets monthly. And um, she's quite, um, you know, um, famous in that she just recorded a brilliant uh, series on Netflix for um, the study of relationships and how we could improve them. And that's fascinating stuff because obviously, you know, if Jesus and Mary Magdalene were in a relationship, they might have been discussing some of these issues. And, it's, and the question of Jesus' own sexuality that comes up, as well as Mary's, or, you know, <coughs> anyway, these are things that are fascinating to discuss. Um, so Jaya's come all the way here via Barcelona and Ibiza, where she's been working, um, with a team of people, a fantastic <laughs> musician, <clears throat> who's going to be accompanying her during this musical performance of a, um, yeah, I think, um, a, a musical piece um, about Mary Magdalene and her significance. And so without further ado, let me hand over to you, Jaya, and um, take it away. Thank you. All right, so Christian, you want to come up here with me? Yeah. Put the board? Uh, is that sure? Sure. Um, Say a little more. Hello, everyone. Can we see you? Yeah. Okay. Talk to you. So I just wanted to begin by 
sharing a little history about the show. Um, this was written by me as my student thesis 20 some almost 20 years ago. And Christian and I were in college together at the time. And I was really fascinated by Tantra, sacred sexuality, and started studying Mary Magdalene. And when it came time for me to write my senior thesis, I decided to write it about, about Mary Magdalene and had a number of different influences. So I wanna just talk to what influenced this show. Um, the Magdalene Manuscript. I don't know if any of you have read that book, but it it has the idea. <laughs> Ginger's read it. <laughs> that um, it, this Egyptian aspect, kind of like tantra, tantra, Isis and Osiris, and this mythology of resurrection with Osiris and Isis and their sacred relationships. So the idea of sacred relationship and resurrection and how that all coincided. And so I, I started the show just about Mary Magdalene and Christ's relationship. And this guy here, I happened to, we happened to bump into each other and have a very mm -hmm. divine feminine, divine masculine relationship that has its own very awesome story. And we, we had a experience, I will call it a spiritual awakening per se, in each other's arms, that was a very, felt like a very divine feminine, divine masculine, Christ Magdalene type of awakening. It was one of my very first awakenings, very young, of a full-on kundalini, we became one. It was a very big event in our life. And if I haven't said this person's name, his name is Christian Demel, and Christian will be doing the piano for this piece today. Um, and so part of the show is influenced by books that I was reading, like the Magdalene manuscript. Part of the show are actual words that he and I said to each other or sent to each other. So part of it was also based upon the dynamic that was happening and unfolding between the two of us. And so, so Magdalene manuscript, what other books? Um, the Moon Beneath Her Feet was another one. There's even a little excerpt from that book in, in the show. Um, so you're, so you're going to hear things like the Ka body, which is the Egyptian reference to creating an immortality, Im, immortal body. But there's also things like the Methuna, which is a tantric ritual. And Christian and I were practicing a lot of tantra at the time together. So there's a, a lot of reference to some of those things. So just wanted to give you a little background history on that. This is the first time we're putting it to music. So um, we, this, and, and it's interesting because it's also the full circle of our relationship where we had this very intense experience in college and didn't know how to make sense of it at the time. And now we've reunited again in our lives. And so, it's a really interesting moment right now to be doing this show again, which happened in school, and for us to reunite our lovership and for him to play the piano underneath and underscore the show. So you're experiencing something that no one's experienced before in that we are not using canned music underneath, but live piano that Christian will be playing. Can anything? Oh. Oh, okay. So, yes. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, so the, when I first was writing the show, it was just about Mary Magdalene and Christ and the sacred relationship aspect. And then as I was researching, I came across something called the Magdalene Laundries. Are any of you familiar with the Magdalene Laundries? Yeah? Thomas? And so I, I watched a film about it that was based on a true story and I was really struck by the fact that the last Magdalene Laundry closed in like 1996. And they were still putting women in these spaces where they were forced into forced labor, often laundries, um, and all the bodies of women that were found buried in these spaces. So just a, so as I was seeing that, I started forming this story in my brain of a woman in a Magdalene Laundry speaking to Mary Magdalene, praying to Mary Magdalene. So the show is two women 
or it, there's a there's an older woman in the show too that's in the Magdalene Laundry. So these women who one is really in the suffering and trying to understand what's happening with the Magdalene Laundry, and the other is Mary, is actually Mary Magdalene in her love affair with Christ. And so you have these two very juxtaposed stories, one that's very dark and colorless and one that has a lot of love and celebration in it. And so you'll see that as you go through the show. And what was interesting for me was I had written it, all of Mary's parts and then all of the woman in the laundry's parts. And then I cut it all up and I, in my creative process and put it all in these interesting ways together to see how it would all fit and work together. And so that was a really fun process in terms of like, okay, this scene here goes perfectly with this scene with Mary and putting it out of order. And, um, and so you'll see how that all came together as well in the show. And just a trigger warning, it does have pretty intense content in the show, um, themes of sexuality, things, themes of abuse and trauma, just because the, the pieces that are within the Magdalene Laundry have those traumas within them. So letting you all know that, that that is coming. And also I may slip into an Irish dialect um, every now and then because I did, when I performed this show and I also toured with it for just a, a minute and in different places that invited me to come to do a ritual version of it. Uh, I did it in an Irish dialect. I haven't done it in the Irish dialect since I first did all that. So, but if I slip into a little Irish dialect, um, that's, it's just because I have a little somatic memory from doing it so many times in the dialect. But my plan today was just really to read it for you all with the music. Uh, so you get the experience of it. Good, anything else? I'm just sort of responding to some of what Thomas said in the lead-in is just this idea of the the waves of history and just sort of acknowledging you've reflected that in our own dynamic and relationship, this wave of returning mm -hmm. to a moment and the wave of being back looking at um, Magdalene and Christ and the wave of Magdalene in the past, Mary in the past, and these characters in the present and the wave that's there. So there is just something very synchronistic about being here all together with you, being together with you and you, um, mm -hmm. and putting the piece together. And part of what's fun in that vein, musically, just to share is that some of the songs that you'll hear are fully improvised today. There's a sense of what they're gonna be, but who knows? Some of them are emails or poems that Jaya and I wrote to each other in college that 15 years later have been sent to music now. You won't hear those words, but so there's this interesting cyclical mm -hmm. aspect of the peace, of our relationship, of being here and how you let us in. And I think of the story of the Magdalene yeah. Christ story, there is a cyclical nature. Uh, Catherine McGowan, I think her name is, she has a series, it's fictional history. She actually says in it, it's not all fictional. Um, she has a series and in it, they say over and over again, the time returns, the time returns, the time returns. And the idea is that these sacred relationships return over and over. And we see these archetypal patterns over and over and over of, of divine couples who teach the way of love. And this story really is a, a story of love. So to me, it's all about love. And the other phrase that I really love within those books and also that Jesus says is for those with eyes to see and ears to hear. So may you have ears to hear what's here for you today. <laughs> Great. You ready? Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to start with uh, just reading a little setup before we go in of the characters so that you know and a little bit of setting the stage for the show because we don't have the visuals of me actually performing, performing. So um, we'll set that up a little bit. So whenever you're ready, Christian, we'll underscore it. The Magdalene. Characters. Mary Magdalene, priestess of Isis, lover of Christ. She is a strong, wise woman. 
dressed as a goddess, a devotee of the goddess in the Isis cult mysteries. She wears a snake armband and tribal jewelry. She has tribal markings similar to the Olid Nile, and her hands are adorned with henna. Young woman, she's the opposite of Mary. She's been victimized and appears weakened. She represents the victimization and shaming of women. At the top of the show, she's pregnant. And as the show goes on, she becomes more maddened and disheveled. She speaks with a Northern Irish dialect. She is a prisoner inside of a Magdalene asylum. Older woman. An older woman inside of the Magdalene asylum, she's hardened her voice rough for many years inside of the asylum. She also speaks with an Irish dialect and is played by the same actor as the young woman. Staging. The stage is split into two contrasting sides. To stage left, we have a large onk, which is the top of the show looks like a large cross, but is later revealed to be an onk. There's a small altar with ritual tools, incense, candles burning, the side of the stage is filled with colors, rich fabrics, and textures. It feels temple-like. The other side of the stage is stark, black and gray colors. There's a simple mat on the floor. Three black boxes are stacked behind. The words, God is just, are illuminated on the boxes. There is no color, only a feeling of desolation and emptiness. Opening, house lights down, house music fades to silence. Curtains open. There's a single candle lit on stage right. The following prayer is said in the candlelight. Young woman, Mary, Mary of Magdala, apostle of the apostles, priestess of Isis, mystery of mysteries, I know you were not the sinner they have tarnished you to be. Let me transform. Let me learn the power of your love. In the past, let me be free. In the present, let me always be. And for the future, may I see. You are the egg, your love of the phoenix. May I be reborn into the sacred love you shared. Scene one. Silhouette lighting comes up in deep shades of crimson to reveal the shadow of a crucifixion. This reflects Christ on a cross. Music rises and we see a figure writhing in agony on the, clock on the cross. Lights slowly come up and it is revealed that it is Mary as she steps off the cross. As the lights shift, we see that the cross is actually an onk. The music rises and Mary begins to speak. Mary. Yeshua wasn't the only one crucified that day. I have been crucified by the patriarchal church for over 2,000 years, and it continues today. Sinner, four, brother, four. Dirty. They have made punishment for women. I never was a prostitute. I never was an adulterer. I was and still am a priestess, a holy woman of wisdom, a servant of the one. And today I step down from my cross and I pick up my sword of love because the time has come to reveal the truth about the greatest love ever held in the eyes of God. A love that began when I danced for the crowd at the temple at Magdala. Scene two, light shift to emulate sunlight. Middle Eastern music comes up and Mary dances with her sword for a moment. I can feel my memory of first seeing him. He walked into the temple and the lightning of change struck my life. My pounding heart shook my body. We stood frozen and we knew our dreams brought us together. My dreams left out his beauty. Dream sequence, chime. 
Lights shift and Mary begins chanting as if in a dreamlight state. She performs rituals with water and fire. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya I meet you once more in this dream, this dream of initiation, this dream of enlightenment. Let us begin again. Mary dips her hands into water and pours it into other bowls. Your body is the container for consciousness. Your body is the container for consciousness. This bowl is a symbol of the container. The water is your soul recreated no matter the form of the container. Mary uses fire to emulate fire coming from her hands. All is burned away in the fires of love. With fire, I initiate you into this path of power. No guilt, no shame, no judgment, no fear. Mary makes the sign of the cross. The presence of the present, the way of the goddess. Eat of her flesh, share this fruit of the earth. Mary eats mangoes and pomegranate fruits. Breathe the perfumed air, feel the spirit on your skin. Mary lights incense, has oils and makes symbols in the air. Allow your senses to awaken. Lay your head on my breast and together we will heal our past wounds. You see the truth and the magic of the divine queen, that which others would call a whore. I am ready to emerge, my king. Chime. Light shift back to a daylight scene. Mary moves back into the memory of seeing her Christ for the first time. My dreams taught me how to love him, and my love grew and encompassed everything until I became love itself. As he stood before me that day, his eyes pierced me and made me even more radiant and alive. I felt as if I were recreated. He knowingly asked, are you the Magdalene, the temple priestess? I smiled and led him into my teaching chambers. We see Mary walk to her altar, now inside of the teaching chamber, just like in the dream. She and Yeshua are in deep conversation. To Yeshua. I thought I would be your teacher, but here you are an equal, also teaching me. You have awakened my seven energy centers and I yours. This is beyond the dreams of initiation. I have never experienced intimacy such as this. I see into you and you see into me and we see the one truth. I am in you as you are in me. There is so much love and warmth in this room. Thank you for allowing me to love you. Every event in my life has led to this, this perfect moment here and now. Scene three, lights on Mary's side of the stage fade to blackout. Performed as a one person show, the actor moves from Mary's side of the stage to the side of the young woman. She shifts body positions as she changes from the young woman to older woman. Lights come up dimly. Young woman, praying. From the past, let me be free. In the present, let me always be. And for the future, may I see. You are the egg, your lover, the phoenix. May I be reborn into the sacred love you shared. It's so cold. Quiet down, they'll hear you, and then they won't let you speak ever. Why can't they spare us some light, some warmth? What is this place? Welcome to the Magdalene Asylum. Asylum? I'm not crazy. Why am I here? Could be any reason. Too many boys dressing too fancy, messing around before marriage. Parents sent you off. Some of us don't know why we're here. I have a child coming. I know it's a girl. I can feel her. And you're not married. To them, that child's an illegitimate. Lots of girls here have had babes out of wedlock. 
so I'm being punished for my sins. He told me he'd love me, he'd care for me, told me he'd marry me, but he ran. I started showing and my dad sent me here. He said I was an embarrassment to the family, but this, why are you here? I told my family a boy took advantage and I was indecent. They sent me away the next day. They said I was too pretty, my fault. I provoked him to do it. Have you heard from your family? Not a word in eight years. Eight years. After a while, you forget the outside world. This place becomes all you know. Mother, father, lover, home, hell. It's all you know. My father said this place will wash my soul clean. That's all we do here is wash. They say Mary Magdalene washed her soul clean doing penitence, so doing the laundry all day is ours. What's your name? My real name is Celeste, but they take even your name from you. Here I'm Bridget. Someone's coming. Keep quiet. They don't like us talking. I don't think your prayers are going to save you now anyway. Mary. Mary of Magdala. Apostle of the Apostles. Priestess. Mary, are you there? The church told me I must pay for my sins and be washed clean of them like you, Mary. Please let them see I'm good. I'm so afraid. What if they take away my child? Scene four, blackout. Celebratory music comes up along with lights on Mary. She's dressing for her sacred union ceremony, her wedding with Yeshua. Once dressed, she greets people who are arriving at the ceremony. Music shifts when she sees Yeshua and begins to speak. I come here of my own free will to seek partnership with you, Yeshua. I come with all my love, honor, and sincerity, wishing to become one with you whom I love. I have shared with you the teachings that have been passed down to me from my ancestors. You are the energy of genius. You understand concepts that take most men lifetimes. I'm honored to share with you this sacred ritual of union. I feel our love as it spans eternities. Through the next vow, she binds hands with ribbons and yarn. I promise to share your laughter and your dreams. I promise to be in service of you in all ways. I promise to see you for who you really are. I promise to be a catalyst for your growth and to allow you to cause alchemy within me. We bind our hands, so be it. To Lydia and Serum who are attending the wedding. Lydia and Serum, thank you so much for opening your home here at Cana and for being witness to our union. Let us now celebrate with food and wine to the audience. I can see that day so vividly, our wedding feast and his first miracle, turning water into wine. Love knocked at my heart and I opened the door wide for Christ to enter. My devotion to the beloved brought me to ecstasy. I could feel our coming together was for a very special purpose. I knew he would remember his power and all would be as it would. Scene five, blackout. Sound of baby crying in the dark, sobbing. No, don't take her, my baby, my beautiful baby. Just let me hold her in my arms once more. Baby crying fades away into silence, sobs. No, no, she's gone. I hate them. Sobs, then praying. Did you have a baby, Magdalene? Please help me, please help me see my baby again. Beat, then frantic. Will they ever let me out of here? I'm going mad. My knuckles are bloody to the bone. My eyes hurt with tears of fire. More sobs. We buried another girl today. That makes three since I've been here, including Bridget. Will they bury me too? 
or hang me on the cross like Jesus. Scene six, lights come up. Mary smiles as she sees Jesus, but that smile turns to a frown as he tells her he must be crucified to Yeshua. Crucified. Mary circles the stage, asking ancestors for help. I must be strong. He needs me now more than ever, and so will Judas. Yeshua has chosen him to turn on him. Change is upon us. Ancestors, give me strength. Goddess, guide me. Give me knowledge. Mary begins to chant to the mother. Ancient mother, hear me calling. Ancient mother, hear my song. Ancient mother, hear me calling. Ancient mother, hear my song. Mary continues chanting, rocking, until in a trance-like state, voices of the ancestors come from her, lights shift, voice of the ancestors, sung in a pre like a priest giving mass. You learned in the temple how to cultivate sexual energy for immortality. The impending crucifixion of your blessed Yeshua gives you the opportunity to directly experience this knowledge. Perform the seven-day Methuna rite, manifest the Ka body, and he shall rise again. Amen. Mary as a discovery to herself. Mithuna, the ritual of sacred sex that created the energy for immortality. To Yeshua, I support whatever you're guided to do, even if it means losing the man that I love. But our love is everlasting. Only the form changes. I understand that you want to leave this material form, but how will I touch you when the container for your soul is gone? We'll create a new container. Remember Isis and Osiris. When Osiris was murdered, Isis resurrected him with the power of her love. We can create that together, my beloved. Life and love everlasting. Every night we practice the holy marriage of the flesh. I screamed his name into the stars and soon carried his child within my womb. Yeshua, the sacred father and lover. Gratitude overwhelmed me. Our last night together, after the Passover meal with the apostles, we completed the Methuna rite. Music comes up, lights shift as Mary shares a ritual with Yeshua. I share this wine with you. Symbolic of the blood of life, holding up the goblet, drinking. I anoint you, my love, with sandalwood to calm the mind and awaken your passion. Mary anoints him with sandalwood. We gaze into each other's eyes, becoming so vulnerable that only God's face is present. Only God's face is present. And now, we will make love as the divine feminine and the divine masculine harmonizing together in holy union. Blackout, muffled screams, hand held over her mouth. All we hear are the muffled screams that can be ad-libbed. No, stop, please don't, no, please, no. We hear further crying and whimpering protests, a door slams. How can you say you are a man of God? Candle lights. Beat, defeat rises up in the young woman. It's the fifth time this month he put his filthy self inside of me. I have to get out. Freedom. Magdalene, are you there? Just let me die. Candle blown out. Scene eight, blackout. Music comes up, lights rise on Mary kneeling on the cross. She does a zagarit. Kisses the cross and then addresses the audience to audience. I knew Yeshua never died on the cross. He only left his body for a while. He went into a deep trance-like state where he healed and built up the energy necessary to ascend. He wanted to leave the material world behind as he could do more work in his spiritual body. I helped him roll away the stone on the third day. 
to Yeshua. I am overwhelmed with happiness. Tears do not flow from my eyes because my whole body is weeping with joy. I will go and tell the others as you have asked, but it is difficult for me to tear my eyes away. I want to stay here with you. I love you. I want to always gaze into those eyes that really see me. Mary keeps her eyes on Yeshua as she backs away. She suddenly turns and runs to audience. I came upon Pilate as I journeyed back to the apostles. To Pilate. The Christ is walking among the living. I have seen him with my own eyes. To woman, to the audience. A woman was walking by with a basket of eggs and he stopped her, took one from her and said, if he is risen, then this egg is red. Imagine his surprise when it turned a deep crimson. When I got to the disciples, I felt I no longer stood in the dappled sunlight. I seemed to have grown very tall and looked down as if from a great height. There was no past behind me, no future before me, only this eternal moment where Christ lives in which nothing that has been can ever be lost and the long awaited fulfillment of hopes and dreams and sacrifices is realized and forever present. And so in the timeless present, we are all redeemed. We are one. Love is the law, I said. The law is love. Scene nine, dim lights. Young woman, no, I will not attend mass. No, I won't eat. You can strip me naked and mock me all you want. You can beat me and cut off my hair. I don't care what you do to me. I just want to see my daughter. Today is her fourth birthday. Where is she? Scene 10 lights up to audience. I named our daughter Sarah. Looking into her eyes, I'm reminded of the miracles that a woman and a man can create together. I gave Yeshua a gift beyond any measure of my love, and I loved her as I loved him. We fled after the resurrection, our danger great. She was taken from me and we went into hiding to keep her safe. Yeshua reunited us. He visited us many times in his luminous body. Of course, today I have my own luminous body and eternally we are together, one as what is beyond all form. Scene 11, light shift as the young woman ties bed sheets together to hang herself. Young woman delivered frantically as she ties sheets together through tears. Return and Mary, give me strength. I choose freedom. This is the only way. They say this is a moral sin, but I know you will raise me up. Forgive them, mother, for they know not what they do. You are the egg, your love of the phoenix. May I be reborn into the sacred love you shared. I call out your name, Magdalene. We see the young woman hang the sheets, put her head in the noose, blackout. We hear the boxes fall, choking until stillness. Scene 12, lights up. I call to the feminine in all of us to rise. I call to the feminine in all of us to rise. She is birth, creativity, Shakti, love, moon, darkness, earth. There is no need to be afraid of her power. For we are the masculine embracing the feminine and the feminine embracing the masculine. We are the light loving the darkness and the darkness loving the light. One can never fully consume the other. This is a story of love. All women are me and I am all women, loving deeply, bearing sacred children, carrying the power of our ancestors. Tell my real story to your children and someday I will be lifted to Magdalene, sacred lover and teacher of Christ.
Mary begins to dance in celebration. A light signifying Yeshua comes on and she dances. She dances in the light. Curtains come to a slow close as music rises and the house lights come up slowly. Come sit because we can answer some questions. Sure. Bravo, yes. bravo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Great. Any questions? I'd love to, we can just open it up um, unless there's anything you want to share about your experience with the piano or. Great. It was lovely. Thank you so much, all of you, for um, being present for that. And um, it was really lovely, really fun to revisit after 20 years. Yes. May I ask? Oh. Nope. I think they'd love to have you on the camera, too. <laughs> I'm going to come on in here. And this week May I ask a quick question? Yeah. So that was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, how has your understanding of uh, Mary Magdalene progressed? In other words, so as of now, today, with all the information, with the uh, I don't know if you've uh, studied the same things that I have, the uh, Magdalene revealed, uh, all the, um, the, the Nag Hammadi and the Gospel of Mary, where they talk about physics, you know, <laughs> and there is no sin, only adultery. But in the Hebrew, adultery means idolatry. It means worshiping something else instead of the beautiful message that I understand our Yeshua brought, which is love. So mm -hmm. I'll be quiet and listen now to how, how you have progressed or not <laughs> in your understanding mm -hmm. with all this new information through the internet that's come to fruition? I would say that it's less about understanding for me at this moment and more of an embodiment of direct experience. It has deepened from an intellectualism to a, a, an embodied knowing of truth. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think before it was like glimpses of that truth and now it's a, a, a deepened, deepened About the heart, the yeah. spirituality, the spirituality, the yeah. heart. It is, in, but that's it. It lives within you. It is within and it is, um, it is in practice, you know, in, in all of my divine loverships. <laughs> it is in practice. What a blessing. <laughs> thank you yeah and i think too that just on a, from an intellectual level there's also i just ha came across a book that i've been reading here as i've been preparing for this show and, and rereading some stuff but this book i came across called the magdalene mysteries and it really goes into how this relational archetype returns and returns and returns from inanna and to what was Anana's consort's name? Demutzi. Demutzi, that guy. 
um, Inanna and Demutzi and, and even like it talks about uh, Robin Hood and Maid Marian being the same archetype. Again, we have a Marian as a Mary and Robin, like these same, um, I just am really fascinated right now with this idea of the time returns and how these, how we embody these sacred relationships as a as a way of living and a, and a practice and a teaching for the rest of the world. I have that book and yes, oh. as well. <laughs> so, yes, it's a big. I've got a question for, for Diane. Yes. So uh, first I want to really thank you for your fantastic performance. And Christian, it was very moving. I was uh, gently crying back a few times. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a very hard centered thing. Um, and it's epic. I mean, what if this could be performed in the Vatican? What if the Vatican <laughs> could issue an official apology to New Vatican? goals. <laughs> you know, I mean, the implications of this. I mean, it's you've created a piece of theatre, okay? But you're also telling a narrative story about Mary Magdalene and Jesus. You're reclaiming her for the storyline. Mm -hmm. And you're claiming, as many other people have done, that the the wedding in Cana, written in the Book of John's Gospel, is actually them. You know, what if that's true? Right. Um, and I've read some things that say it was John the Baptist and, and Mary Magdalene's wedding as well. Like that's an interesting that's story. Another twist. Another twist. Yeah, yeah. So many plot twists. Here. Right. Um, but I'm just thinking. Um, <clears throat> How would history have been different if if this narrative had been accepted from right. the beginning? Right. If the archetypal Jesus salvator of the world was actually the salvific couple, if if it was God and goddess doing the salvation mm -hmm. through through them. Yeah. I mean, Christianity would be very different, wouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> um, and the way leadership would be. Yes. We'd have that female Priests, priestesses. Yeah, we've, we've, we've had a whole different way of looking at sexuality and at gender and peace. Mm -hmm. um, Something that was interesting to me, Brian Murescu, who I know we're both a fan of, who wrote The Immortality Key, if any of you have not read The Immortality Key, but Brian, um, I had the pleasure of meeting him, Ian and I, my, my other partner who's here, um, and we he was we were asking him about Dionysus and Christ and a bunch of stuff and he said that what did he say it was something about the the biggest cover up was taking the sacred union out of Christianity and then the, I pardon me then the Caesars wouldn't be in control then the Caesars wouldn't be in control yeah and how much of a political move the whole thing was and like I didn't even realize how much politics was tied into religion and the popes and just everything and, and how much that affected things. Mm. And so, in the beginning, the Caesars had to answer to the popes, remember? I mean, the kings, the Caesars, they had, mm -hmm. they had to go for permission to the popes. Yeah, king, pope, god. <laughs> oh, well, don't, don't get me started on Caesar. Um, <laughs> Druids aren't great fans of Caesar. Um, <clears throat> can I ask Kate, um, just give us some comments because you're a goddess devotee. You have a goddess center in Stroud. Um, what did you think of this performance um, from a sort of goddess perspective, Kate? Did it resonate with you? Um, tell us about it. Yeah, absolutely. I really, really enjoyed your performance and um, it was wonderful musical accompaniment and uh, the, the juxtaposition of... Um, you know the the uh, Mary Magdalene and then the Magdalene inmates. You know that those stories interweaving and somehow just just bring them together like that was very powerful, really. Um, uh, and and so the you know the um terrible abuse of those poor women in the Magdalene laundries that that whole system which was the shadow in, in some ways you might say of the Catholic Church um uh to, to kind of 
juxtapose that with this refreshing story and interpretation of um, the love between Mary and Jesus was was really wonderful, and um, and I really I found that that embodiment that that for sure I can you know I can just feel that in you, and so there's so much there's that that in itself is a transmission, and um, there's the scope for healing and um, harmonizing energies that way with with what you're doing. Um, and and my experience of of goddess is is I, I hadn't come across that term transpersonal history before Thomas, but that it that is how I experience my research it, it it's all of those things it's reading it's going out into the land and experiencing and it's exchanging energies with the spirit of the land which to me is goddess and there's all of those things so so I just feel as though in a way you've you've done a similar thing with your research and um lived experience of the energy of of Mary Magdalene but also the so-called fallen women you know um that 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 lived experience of what was put on to Mary Magdalene you know um is is very affecting yeah thank you it was wonderful thank you <clears throat> Oh, thank you, Kate. Yeah, on on the point of the um, the Magdalene laundries and the fact they found lots of bodies, right? Um, one of our later speakers today is a man called John Crow or John Constable. Um, I hope you know we'll all be able to hear because he's been working in Southwark. He's a kind of shaman of the inner city of the um, London borough of Southwark, where I used to live. And Southwark was the place where the prostitutes were allowed to be in London. In the, they weren't allowed to work in the city of London, but in medieval London, they could be south of the river, the borough of Southwark. And that's where all the great um, brothels were. And it was, it was blessed by the, the, um, the church. Uh, the Bishop of Winchester technically got the taxes and, you know, supported this. And for hundreds of years, um, they these these prostitutes worked. Now John Crow, who'll be talking later, um, encountered the living ghost of one of these prostitutes doing some shamanic work in Southwark, who said, I want you to redeem me and my sisters, and led him to a graveyard where they found the bodies <laughs> of five thousand <laughs> prostitute women that were buried in many times. He's going to be talking all about this later. Mm -hmm. And he did a performance, a bit like yours, but called the, the Southwark Mysteries, which has been performed in Southwark Cathedral, which is all about this, um, you know, the, the outcast, the, the prostitute. And anyway, Mary Magdalene is woven into the plot line. He'll be, he, he won't perform the whole thing because it's a three hour thing, but he's going to be talking about it and what inspired him. And there's a crossover between, you know, the Southwark Mysteries and and the Magdalene mysteries that you explored, I think. Um, so that's going to be quite powerful, you know, um, to, to hear the two things on the same day. Mm -hmm. um, there's an ambiguity and ambivalence, isn't there, about the role of the prostitute in history? Because on the one hand, she's the sacred priestess who initiates. Mm -hmm. um, and in the temples of the ancient world, you know, I mean, the priestess is... Well, the sex counselors of the day, if you want, but it wasn't seen as something dirty or wrong. Um, so I don't know what what is the future. What does the future hold? If if this is if we take on board this divine sacred consulship mm -hmm. is the new model. If we rewrite the Christian story and put Mary Magdalene back in, what does that do for a relationships and b for sexuality. I mean, you're a sex coach. Mm -hmm. You must have thought about this. Well, I think it up levels the consciousness around our consciousness around sex, for sure. 
and doesn't have, um, I've been also reading a lot about Sophia as the light and Sophia as the dark. And I think that there's this interesting aspect of unification of that within, once we start to unify and come from both the feminine and masculine perspective and sexual and spirituality and sexuality, that we start to unify and, and no longer have as much shame about any of it. So that's one thing. And so I think it up levels consciousness around sex. So it creates a different conversation, allows us to have the conversation. Um, and I also think that then we also have spiritual leadership that gets to shift because now we have vulva bodied humans, women and people who identify like that to be in that position more, especially within Christianity if we put Mary Magdalene back in, in that position. I thought one of the most moving lines in your text was about this light and dark. Um, that came from this guy. Okay. <laughs> about how we are both the light and the dark, and and we kind of create each other, the light and the dark, mm -hmm. and, and neither overcomes the other. It's like a twist on, it's a reinterpretation of St. John's Gospel, which is, you know, the light is the all-triumphant, the dark can't overcome it. It's a slightly more sophisticated theology. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually think we should apply that to cosmology in, in relation mm -hmm. to to matter and energy and dark matter and dark energy. I, I My view of cosmology is it's a recycling process. The stars and emptiness, space and form are somehow recycling all the time, which is why we have an eternal universe. And it's more a, a cyclical. Universe. Yes. Instead of the Big Bang going out to some linear entropy that like came from nowhere goes to nowhere, I prefer a circle, spiral kind of cosmology, which fits with this light. The light and the dark are the same at different phases of their growth process. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, that fits. I thought that was all summed up beautifully in, in those lines. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was. Do you remember writing that? whole thing is like a list, right? Um, no, it was, I don't remember. It was a card. Yeah, yeah. I think you sent me like around Thanksgiving or something. Yeah. Again, in college. Yes. Yeah. And the line was, we are the masculine. Yeah. We are the... Masculine, loving, and feminine. Yeah. And I think I changed it just a little from what you had written. But it was something like, we are a man loving a woman. We are a woman loving a man. And one can never fully something the other. But we are the light loving the darkness, and we are the darkness loving the light. Yeah. Yeah, that's the bit that I find so deep, because also in the Egyptian cosmology, the night sky is the goddess, Nut, and mm -hmm. the masculine is the earth, god, Ged. So it's the earth. As I sit on my terrace here in France and look up at the night sky, you know, I'm trying to do Ged, loving the night sky, the universe, and she is loving us. Whereas we have this rather simplistic Manichaean stroke Zoroastrian cosmology where light and dark are always fighting yeah. mm -hmm. through supremacy and and therefore we're going to blow up the world because we can't work out how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. We have one that has to absolutely win over the other. And by the way, the Satanists are just as bad as the Yahwists. They're, they're fighting too, but for the opposing power. Um, so, so what I think we have here is the seeds of a peace theology whereby the light and the dark can sign a peace treaty, <laughs> you know, to, to, to co-maintain the universe. That's what's implied in this, really. Mm -hmm. There was something in your question about, I think, about the sex, sexuality being woven and brought to light. What in bringing eroticism into the equation, mm -hmm. the birth and, right, birth and death of both is mm -hmm. inherent. Between the masculine and feminine of the continuum, the sacredness of life and the masculine uh, currently with the female voice of God, right? with Mary Magdalene being given birth, and Adam and Jesus was born in the time of the immaculate conception. Immaculate conception. Mm -hmm. Presentation of that in the child, and now we can honor the entire life cycle, and that's still the way in the one gender is born in the other, the other one is created. So, so it's a continuum of being 
That's what I keep saying. We're all a product of sex. And if we make sex bad, then we make all of all life of bad. And so once we start to elevate sexuality and eroticism, we elevate life. Absolutely. And of course, that's what Augustine did by declaring all sex evil and it's the original sin. So we're all sinners. And, you know, you get that whole medieval um, sort of Christian racket, which is um, you're all sinners, so you need our sacraments. And, you know, it's a vicious circle. Whereas if we change the narrative and if, yes, sex is at the origin of it and it's sacred and, yes, it involves um, mutual love, mutual, you know, compassion between the genders and so on and so on. Um, then we no longer have to be terrified of embodiment mm -hmm. or being in matter. We don't have to do an origin and, and cut off our balls because we're ashamed of being in, embodied, which is what some forms of Christianity have done. They, they, they see all embodiment and all matter as evil, which was the Manichaean extreme right. view. Ascend out of it. <clears throat> and then they want to ascend out of it into their etheric bodies. Mm -hmm. And there are still some sort of misguided pseudo-gnostics that sort of are praying for the end of the world Putin to drop the bomb because then they can ascend the few and all the evil people will just go up in clouds of smoke. Whereas if we say no, eroticism is sacred, the body is sacred, woman is sacred, eros is sacred, then we, we can extend that to eco um, eroticism so that the plants, the trees, the animals, they're all part of this eros force, um, which is sacred and, and pro-life in the deeper sense of the word. So I think that's the, you know, that's the next. Anyway, somebody ought to, I'll do a theological critique of your piece. You I'd love to write an essay about it. I think um, too, something you just said made me think of, and what you were saying as well, is what is this energy of vitality, right? Because as, as someone who walks in queer spaces, as that masculine feminine comes up and as we start to talk about the perhaps the need for a baby to be the symbol of something i'm like well i have thoughts about that <laughs> so it's also about what is this sacred union within an individual how do we know, how do we see that we are light and dark and all and what is it that between. we're creating that isn't maybe a physical baby but is the creation of this divine union you know right. and is a vitality that we then get to bring to our ecosystem in all of the ways because we are living mm -hmm. from that place of untruncated vitality or unfiltered vitality. Yeah. Mm. That brings the tantra. Right. Erotic energy is not necessarily sex. Not necessarily just the union of a man and woman. Sounds to me like the orgone theory of life, that matter itself is infused with a sort of orgasmic energy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've been working on quantum theory, and I think if you look at um, physics, quantum physics, through this lens of uh, the re eroticization of physics, the, the, the energy inside the atom is, is created by the, the oscillation of the electrons around the, the kind of nucleus. Um, and it's that erotic attraction mm. that's going on, which is huge. So, and you talk about the both andness within us all. Well, that's within every atom, mm -hmm. yeah. that both andness. We are Shakti and Shiva simultaneously, you know, yeah. all of us. And um, the point is how to, I mean, you talk about the elevation of consciousness, that in my language, that's sort of the tendency towards enlightenment. Mm -hmm. If we can see that sex is, is a fantastic um, procedure to create that enlightened tension awareness between the polarities. So we are both and. We are the light and the dark, the Shiva and the Shakti. And so we don't need to then externalize the outer enemy to destroy them. It's the inner enemy within us. It's the Putin in me that I have to destroy. You know, um, or a love. Or a love. <laughs> love, love, love. Okay, thank you, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, in the Hegelian sense, to destroy is to subsume, to, to love. Yeah. yeah, I can translate that back. Um, but just loving Putin in, in, is a bit too far for me at the moment. But, um, mm, yeah, good questions. So any other comments from our audience? Sophie, do you want to, how, what did you think of that performance? 
Yeah, very moving. Very beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just so powerful, so strong. I just feel like it's it's a divinity that is so precious and so pure. And it's a, a place for all women, all, you know, it's just so tender and so, um, it's like a rose, okay? For me, it was like a really precious, beautiful rose. And she's, you know, in a beautiful garden, surrounded by everything she needs. She's blooming, she's beautiful, she's got early morning dew on her, but then she's also in a place where she's dying and she needs to be fed and nurtured and loved. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a constant dichotomy, is that the word, between the two and with everyone. Everyone's story has this, you know, this dance and it's up to us to kind of build and strengthen this unity that needs to come together for all of us, you know. Um, so yeah, it was really powerful, really beautiful. And I'm sure I've got loads more to say, but <laughs> <laughs> it will come through. Thank you. Yes, yes. Great. Well, I'd like to thank um, Jaya again. That was absolutely stunning. So thank, thank you. you so much. Um, and um, we have our next speaker hopefully turning up. We're going to be hearing um, in in the program. Could you pass me the white sheet of paper there? Thanks. So <clears throat> um, it's quite appropriate that we're going to talk about um, sacred ecology in our next session. Um, and we're going to hear, I hope, from Sophie Strand, who, who spoke last year, but she's come back to join us again. Um, and it's quite important that we talking about the erotic within all of nature and all of ecology. Um, so, <clears throat> is Sophie, is that you? Would you like to unmute? Well, whilst whilst we're waiting for her, um, let's let's just carry on the discussion a bit. Um, you live in, in in by purpose in in close to nature, right? Mm -hmm. How important is that to your inspiration? What 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 do you feel about the way that we're ravaging the planet? Is this you know? Um, does it follow that because we ravaged the female, because we denied and suppressed the, the goddess, mm -hmm. the mother, that that the culture that did that, you know, Christianity? went out and ravaged and plundered um, the ecology of the planet. Mm -hmm. Is there a connection there? I believe so. I believe, I also believe that there's a, a connection in terms of love and the ability to love oneself. And if you don't have it, you can't, you can't live life in it. And so we have a lot of people walking around in self-hate and not very conscious. And so we don't form relationship anymore. We've lost relationship with a source of our nurturance. I mean, you live in the States and the, um, from a European perspective, one of the tragic things is all these school shootings going on. Mm -hmm. And I find it in, incomprehensible that often it's adolescence is you know, people in their early 20s going and shooting kids. That shows a complete divorce from from source, as you put it. Mm -hmm. And and if, I mean, would the rediscovery of the sacred narrative that you put in your piece, would that help heal these people, do you think? I think that it really depends. I think that, that art and music can give a transmission. Someone used the word transmission earlier, and I really like that because I I feel less these days of teaching and more transmitting. And I actually had someone really challenge me and said, "You, you Jaya, you just can't teach these things." And I and I said, "Well, maybe we can transmit it." 
And so I think that music and art and storytelling can give us a transmission if it has a call to action. And I know it's something that Christian and I have talked about, you know, the story has the call to action to have the feminine rise and be put back into her rightful space as teacher and spiritual guide. And there, I think there's also a call to action for love in the show, um, that love is the law. And, and so that piece, but I think it's something we talk about a lot in art, can art really transform? Um, so you have a comment on that? Beyond the green, no. <laughs> no, I mean, I could riff on it just in terms of the call to action being essential. I think, you know, there's a lot of beautiful love stories, a lot of um, avoidant and anxious love stories that perhaps are not as beautiful in my opinion or that are perpetuating a narrative for what romance might mean. But I think that, I think the idea of art that is inviting us into question and inviting us into to growth is essential and that art that is encouraging us to stay numb or to anesthetize us to experience creates that that unawakeness you know you know we're suddenly shooting or bringing that weapon in there's there's a disconnect it's sort of a word that you were leaning toward i think there that disconnect and there's something about art and being in a room with others and the call to action and really having art that's that's based in communicating message and not just being a commercial break from life. <laughs> may, sure. may I suggest um, that uh, it's, it's part of the language too as well, because in the Hebrew, the Lord's Prayer from Dr. Klotz epitomizes your presentation because the first line is, O oh, birther, father, mother of the cosmos. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, further on a little bit, help us love beyond our ideals. So mm -hmm. that's the, the, the Lord's Prayer in the he ancient Hebrew that is so, you know, it, it, it epitomizes your presentation. And then the last line is uh, returning light and sound to the cosmos. Mm. So I, you might love to take a look-see at that because that was, yes, perfect. Mm. Thank you for sharing <laughs> that. Yeah, beautiful, I'll have to look that, look that up. And, the whole thing. and then the emerald tablets, which predate, of course, the any of the Bibles or other, saying our purpose, children of light, our purpose is to, transmute the darkness into light. Mm -hmm. Interesting concepts, my darling. <laughs> 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 thank you, thank you. It was it was lovely. Mm. Thank pleasure. You so much. Yeah. Yeah. Scott, anything you want to throw in? Just to get your voice in? Yeah, there's I've just been reflecting on the you know, I try to take these things in and try to relate to my own internal relationship of masculine and feminine. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's Can you just so they can hear you probably speak a little louder. Yeah. <clears throat> I can take I like to take these things in and, and and think about like how this relates to my own internal masculine and feminine um dynamic and relationship and as as someone who identifies as gay and uh, in the work that I do, I'm constantly looking at how, how are my clients showing up and how am I showing up in my divine masculine, my divine feminine, and then also my divine integrative. And that's something that I think queer people can have a, an entry point to really hold and be a bridge for folks. Um, so it's there, what's really arising for me is like some sadness, like what have I missed out growing up, having grown up in a really evangelical Christian um, home and church, you know, what was left out for me in that, in those teachings and in that mythology that 
may have changed who I am today. You know, that my relationship to the feminine has been through um, sort of pushing against all of those teachings. But, you know, what, what could have been there for me if, if that was included from the beginning? So um, that's what's arising in me. And it was beautiful to see um, the two of you working together and um, the way that this story unfolded uh, through some through, through a creative piece that was so um, intimately created, you know, through through your relationship. So that's very moving. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What else can we say? Thomas ran off. <laughs> no. I, I think also, and maybe you're hearing some of our story in this with Christian and I, but one of the things that was so hard for us is that Christian identified as gay, uh, identifies as gay. Um, and so for us to have a love affair out beyond identity, and I think that that's part of the message of it too. There's a lot in the show about beyond form, beyond form, loving beyond form. And that our relationship has really um, stood for uh, love beyond form. And it took us a long time to figure it out. It took us 15 years <laughs> to figure it out, you know, to be able to love beyond form without hurting each other because of the forms that we are in and um, to move beyond it. Yeah. And so we, we actually just wrote our story and uh, Christian's doing a book compilation of love stories that happened during COVID. And so uh, we'll be sharing that publicly in that coming soon. February, February 14th. That's the goal. <laughs> of next year. Wonderful. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. If I may interject. Uh, yes, please. These, these words from the original Lord's Prayer in the original Aramaic. It's so uh, uh, flitted across my spirit. Untangle the knots within us so that we can mend our hearts simple ties to each other mm. and and that's what you've done you've 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 mended your hearts don't let surface things delude us but free us from what holds us back from our true purpose out of you the astonishing fire returning light and sound to the cosmos and you darling little lights look at you and your darling little sounds and you're sharing your your spirits you you just shared your little light spirits you're light spirited and i love that uh that you have such joy and love and yeah you got this you <laughs> I'm just so happy to know you and to hear you <laughs> and to see you. Wow. The three of you, you know, just what a, a beautiful story of true love and entanglement and the peace that all of you should have. And hopefully that'll uh, <laughs> transmute. <laughs> because I, I recognize it, I recognize it. And you are truly, truly shining examples of shifting the darkness into light. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We often say to each other, like, thank, thank you for all the work you did. Thank you for all the work you did. <laughs> you know, like. It took work, that's for sure. Yes. It took, and it took us living into those words I wrote 20 years ago. It took us being able to live into those words. There yeah. you go. And the experiencing, uh, I'm 77. And so the interesting dynamic with me is finally I've understood I can read, I can listen, I can talk. And I really don't learn until I've experienced it. <laughs> right, Boy, does right. that get your attention? <laughs> Thomas, I think Sophie has arrived. Yeah, yeah she has. She got the time side. Hello.
I apologize. The email seemed to indicate it was 11. So I was just sitting here waiting. And I... Okay. So um, sorry, Sophie. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Please stop the recording so that we have a break in the second. No need. No, we'll keep going. Yeah. So look, um, thank you very much, Jaya and and Christian, for a fantastic first performance. That was epic, and those that missed it can watch it on um, Zoom and catch up. And thanks for the discussion afterwards. Um, so I'd like to welcome our second speaker, Sophie Strand, who spoke last year. <clears throat> She's a poet and a literary, I don't know, critic, philosopher, thinker, cosmic, cosmic magician. Yeah, she can introduce herself, but she, she studied uh, literature, uh, partly with Bruce Chilton, who was a Magdalene scholar, in fact, at Bard College, I think I'm right in saying that, Indeed. and um, lives, lives somewhere near New York in the upper country around there. And what I think Sophie's doing is extending the insights of the Magdalene narrative that we've explored in that first presentation into <clears throat> into our relationship with the entire earth into rethinking um you know what is our relationship to ecology <clears throat> and i've been reading one of her recent books the flowering wand which i strongly recommend to people um and this is about she calls it rewilding the sacred masculine <clears throat> and um it's like a piece of incandescent prose. She writes prose more like poetry, um, but mingled with reclaiming scientific vocabulary for poetry. You know, science comes out of poetry is what she's reminding us. And there's a fantastic chapter on Dionysus, a fantastic chapter on Orpheus, and um, <clears throat> and, and hanging over them all is, is the Magdalene Christ sort of narrative which she's also just finished a novel that's been published well, it's not even out. just finished it it's coming out in a week here it is oh wow the madonna secret Indeed. right well i so I'm, I'm really excited you're back with us sophie thank you so much um for being here and um over to you really do um you know if there's something of your introduction i missed off please correct me I will and, dive uh, in and let me just, so I have about an hour, 45 minutes to present and then open it up to conversation. Yeah, yeah. You've got an hour lecture time and then a Q&A after that. Absolutely. So I brought a little bit, so maybe I'll introduce myself and then go into a little bit of a short PowerPoint and start talking about what I call myco eco mytho, which is, you know, the root of the word ecology is oikos, Greek for household. And, you know, modern science is showing us that we're composed of more microbial and fungal cells than we are human cells. And we are cells in the dynamic, dynamic homeostasis of the, of the biosphere of Gaia. Um, and so we are, we are beings built of other beings, building other beings. And it is that understanding of nested life that really brings us back into a reciprocal nourishment with the more than human world and an understanding that even when we feel like atomized individuals, we are always part of households, households that are interspecies and that also extend back into our mythic lineages to other countries, to other genocides and elided histories. And so that's really where I always start is this understanding that if we're going to understand our mythic inheritances, we have to understand that they emerge from matter, that mother, the soil, the matrix that gives us all life, that grows our food, our trees, produces our oxygen. So I always want to reroute stories in their ecological context and the fact that they are produced by bodies, bodies built from other bodies. Um, I'm name is Sophie Strand. I'm a poet, I'm a lover. I mean, I could claim expertise, but I always wanna interrupt the kind of hegemony of expertise, this idea that some people know more than others. Mostly I'm a lover. I follow what I love, like the bee follows its desire into the flower and incidentally pollinates other beings. So I always encourage people to follow your love and just trust that it will help you become useful to your oikos, your ecology, your household. And so I love the Magdalene. I love the story of Yeshua Jesus. And I've always been 
interested in how a tragedy, what seems to be such a tragedy, is co-opted by empire and turned into a fetishized death cult that is used for extractive capitalism, for genocide, for racism. How does someone who seemed so devoted to the earth, to the outcast, to commensal meals, to healing, to hands-on storytelling, get co-opted by empire? What happens? What do we lose? And for me, the Magdalene has always been the portal to that. So I just wanted to situate myself in that um, conversation. So Thomas so lovingly and generously, you know, uh, showed you The Flowering Wand, which is my first book of essays, which is really about trying to compost narrative biome of what masculinity is. Like we think of masculinity as being patriarchy, but that's just a conflation. Masculinity used to be theriomorphs and, you know, bullheaded gods and gods that switched genders and interrupted empire. And I really wanted to resurrect those old gods with modern poetry and science and try and offer them to our impoverished narrative biome. Um, see if they could offer a probiotic, offer us something more nourishing. But the research for that book didn't happen for that book. It happened for this book, which is a novel. It comes out August 15th, and it is my retelling of the Magdalene story. And for me, I had always wanted to resurrect the sensual scaffolding, you know, the, all of the textures that had built the Song of Songs, that had informed the man who, who the epithet he used almost most of all was bridegroom, knowing that he would be summoning the Song of Songs, knowing that he would be summoning a kind of animistic environmental folk Judaism that of course gets lost as these things get translated into Greek and co-opted by empire. We lose all of that tactility, all of that sensual responsivity that, you know, the magnitude was responding to that she still holds in her folklore in a certain way because she's never accepted by the orthodox tradition she gets to hold on to that texture still that sensuality the plants the animals the anointing um, the actual embodied practices that get erased from the christian tradition as they become codified and enshrined and conflated with empire and patriarchy but they didn't start there so I, my research for the flowering one was actually about Yeshua and Miriam, and they are the, the beings that I have always been devoted to, in that I see them as beings like ecologies. They are beings that are whole forests of complexity, um, and that if you dive into them, they're like a portal to Second Temple period Palestine, to folk Judaism, to the animistic traditions that were still in that land, the responsivity to lunar cycles, to agricultural cycles that we lose. So that's where I always want to start, um, is just honoring that tradition honoring those forgotten histories and how I have tried ineptly with fiction, with poetry, with essays, with speaking, to at least try and honor how those stories have kept me alive through moments in my life that were incredibly barren. Um, and I think that a lot of us who come to the Magdalene come to her by way of some kind of initiation, be it medical, be it trauma, being a loss of faith, being an exiting faith, that she comes to us after we've been through some kind of bottleneck event where not a lot of the other things get through. Um, so I always honor that too, is that she she's waiting for us on the other side of the river sometimes um, when we're soaking wet and scared. Um, and we have sometimes we have to give up a lot um, to get to the other side, to get to her. Um, okay, so I think I'm going to start with a really brief introduction to the way in which I think about mythic systems. So when I was studying Jesus, I was really interested that he seemed like the last mushroom. So mushrooms are, um, well, I'll get to that, but he seemed like the last fruiting, the last efflorescence in a long rhizomatic, a long root system of vegetal gods in the Mediterranean basin. So that there have been thousands and thousands of years of these gods that were associated with resurrection, dying, with fermentation, with interrupting dominant hierarchies, with vegetal celebration, that he's, with storytelling that was ecologically responsive. He seemed to be in line with a lot of them and to actually kind of be the last one and the one that obscures and eclipses all of them 
And so I was really interested in starting to look at mythic systems as being rooted in place, ecologically contextual. And what did it mean if I began to look at the history of rhizomatic fermentation vegetal gods in the Mediterranean basin? What if I went back using Jesus as Yeshua as a door back into the soil matrix to see what had been lost, what had been you know, papered, concreted over as empire got control of the story? And so my understanding of myth and mycelium, so myth and ecology is really in, was, was catalyzed by this very specific initial question, which is how does Jesus come to us with all of these archetypal resonances? How does he immediately tap into the Dionysian cults? Why do they all immediately convert to, to the new Christianity? Why is that so easy for them? What's happening here? Um, and so I think I'll give a little bit of a slideshow with some conversation about my thinking in this. And of course, if you want to go deeper, The Flowering Wand, my book, is, is a deep, thorough exploration of what this might mean. And it has lots of footnotes of other reading you can do if you want. Um, is it possible to share a screen, Thomas? Yes, I think I've authorized that. You can do that. Yeah. I can do it? Yeah. Share a screen. PowerPoint. I believe it's going now and I need to actually, no. There we are, yeah. Um, and then I wanna add, it. there we go. So, um, we have been dialoguing with nature for over a hundred thousand years. The amount of time when the human brain has been relatively as large as it is now. Nine red lines etched on a flake of stone in the Blombos cave in South Africa have recently pushed back human art making to at least 73,000 years ago, 30,000 years earlier than the earliest known abstract drawings in Europe. Mythologist Sean King calls this dialogue with the earth, be it spoken or drawn or sculpted, myth telling. Um, we interact with our larger ecosystem, our larger household and shared body through this polytemporal multi-species dialogue. We ask questions and receive answers and ask again. The key to this experience is that it is not one-sided. It is curious and interrogative. It is relational. What we learn through this dialogue becomes a type of communication we call myth. Prehistory is a term used to explain the time that came before literacy, but almost all of human history is prehistory. Almost all of human myth predates literacy, stretching back 750,000 years to the time when hominids migrated out of Africa into Europe and Asia. So while the first voices and songs and tales have not reached the seashell curvature of our ears, we still have access to incredible material culture preserved in caves and statuettes and figurines. In these earliest images across continents, we can notice some important themes. First, beginning around 20,000 years ago, there is the veneration of a goddess figure in varying physical forms, but with consistent connection to animals and the moon from Lake Baikal in Siberia, all the way to the Pyrenees. These statuettes and figures made of ivory and stone and bone are often etched with abstract patterns that will become increasingly associated with partnership nature reverent cultures, goddess cultures, chevrons, spirals, leaves, nets, zigzags, and chevrons. But I don't seek to enshrine an anthropocentric, a human-centered divine we have to realize that the sacred is bigger than human dualisms. The most striking theme of all prehistoric art is not just goddesses. It is the absence of humans mostly, or straight body humans in general. In fact, when we do have images of humans, they are less human and more animal. They are something we call a therium. Theriomorph comes from the Greek therion for beast and metamorphon meaning to change shape. It is often used to describe deities that have the ability to shapeshift or who display human animal hybridity. And so I'm showing you right here one of my favorite theriomorphs, the lion man, who was found in the Stadel cave in Germany a few days before the breakout of 
second, the Second World War. His body is lustrously worn, bearing the mark of tender caresses. He has been touched to gleaming, a divine made for your hands, not for your head. Then, of course, there is my favorite, which is the Prophet Shaman, or as I call him, the Prophet Spirit Worker, the Theriomorph. You know, we, at first we gaze in awe. This is one of the earliest representations of imaginative thinking. He is the proof that his human makers could imagine and make something that did not exist in their ordinary environs. They could respond to the world creatively and then add back in something completely novel. But although this interpretation is neat and it seems to put a nice stake in the river of human evolution, designating a spot where we became creative, self-reflective beings, I'm not sure it totally does justice to what we're seeing. I want to offer that what we are seeing is actually a profound type of myth-making that is dialoguing, not with fantasy, but with deep time and biological truth. We are so enculturated with Eurocentric knowledge production, epistemologies, that we forget that for most of human history, we have been asking questions of our environments and getting back accurate data. That data wasn't quantitative with our Western tools of measurement. Our tools of measurement were our bodies, our intuitions, our dreams, and our relational webs that like spider webs could catch dewdrops, interesting beings, interesting ideas, fleeting insects. This information coming from the environment couldn't be put in a box or labeled but that didn't make it any less accurate. Modern medicine today is in many ways just backtracking and reappropriating the botanical knowledge indigenous people have been holding for millennia. Poet and translator Robert Bringhurst proposes that myth can be seen as an alternative science. Both science and myth seek to understand the natural world. While a scientist quantifies elements, the myth teller personifies them. So what if we look at these figures as being highly accurate representations, these theriomorphs, of our evolutionary paths as animals? And even deeper than that, we can see them as being representative of our chimerical origins of, as ancient bacteria. Our bodies today are the product of an ancient bacterial merger. 2.7 billion years ago, free-living early bacteria, prokaryotes, melted into one another to form the mitochondria and organelles of the cells that build our bodies today. And we can even see this anarchic cross-species collaboration in the lion man and the trough bear shaman. Um, we can see that in our belly button, our belly button that leads to our wombs, our wombs that are only possible because of a viral incursion 200 million years ago that taught our bodies how to to build the syntropoblast layer of the womb. Um, these wombs are only possible because our ancestors also learned how to symbiotically collaborate with the ocean and take the ocean into their own bodies. That they, had, they were used to gestating their, their children in ocean water. And so in order to be able to move on to dry land, they had to learn how to make portable oceans. So our wombs are portable oceans. They are collaborations with the ocean. Um, so I, I always want to ask, you know, is, are we looking at these pictures of, of these half human, half animal goddesses and gods as primitivism or as fancy, or are they highly profound, um, data about our evolutionary past as symbiotic species? Um, they represent for me an intimate dialogue with deep time with our evolutionary lineage of kin that starts in the human and ends way, way, way back in the oceans. Um, these theriomorphs, by virtue of their interspecies existence, have information on how to sustainably live within a web of relationships that doesn't just include the human. They ask us how to ask other beings how to best grow and eat food, how to tend the earth from which we came from how to honor our ancestors, human and more than human. They teach us how to develop an ability to flow between forms and between species. You know, Dionysus with his bull horns, his snakes and vegetation is a direct rhizomatic continuation 
of, of these original spirit workers, these original lion men and the and, um, Trafer shamans. And so for me, Jesus has his direct lineage in these beings, these beings that are always intimately responding to the kingdom, the kingdom that is the actual lived world of mustard seeds and lilies and foxes and growing food and eating it and sharing it with the people who live on that land and bury the bones of their ancestors in that land. It is, it is representative of the fact that we are always materially, metabolically, and mythically looping, relooping with the earth where we are rooted, where we live, that gives us life and then digests and reincarnates our bodies into other bodies. My favorite mythic metaphor and the one that guides all my mythic explorations comes from such a collaboration. Here we have the first underworld myth, well before Inanna descended into the underworld, well before Hades absconded with Persephone. Some 416 million years ago, plants made it onto dry land, but these plants were not the plants you and I know as sturdy trees and solid flowers. They didn't have roots. They were more like puddles of algae or tumbleweeds. Luckily enough, fungi, you know, those micro, those, those filamentous systems that produce mushrooms, had been living as root systems in the soil for millions of years before then. And they were also very generous. They reached up and they began to collaborate with these early plants. Plants learned how to have roots from these early fungi. They depended on the fungi to keep them plugged into nutrients, into relationship, into community and place for millions of years before the two de developed a converged symbiotic evolution. For me, that's the early Hieros Gamos. When we think of Miriam and Yeshua as representing, sometimes people like to summon them as being a holy counterparts, as representing the yin and the yang. For me, it's the ancient symbioses between fungi and plants that show up that it's not just about gender. It's about these moments when two different beings decide to burn the bridge to their old bodies and share a body, create new ecosystems. If you look outside today, every flower, every scent and perfume, every vegetable, every green thing was produced by this risky decision to leave their old bodies and to join together, to tie their roots together. For me, that's my favorite love story, is that love story. Even today, 90% of plants depend on mycorrhizal connections in the soil. They're still doing this. So the landscapes, the forests, the food you eat, is the product of this intra-bodily collaboration. Um, as forest ecology has developed, we see that it is a web of collaboration between fungi and vegetation and bacteria and dead matter that acts as the connective tissue between beings. Just like fungi taught plants how to root into the soil, so do our mythic and spiritual systems teach us how to root into relation with our ecological and social landscapes. They seek to express ultimate truths with personified elementals, with figures like Dionysus and Addis and Adonis and Osiris and Yeshua, who are perhaps real people or real beings, but who are infused with the land that comes up through them, comes up through their root systems and begins to use them as a mouthpiece for these larger deep time ecological stories and pieces of wisdom. It's these mythic systems that narrativize a deep understanding of our connection to more than human time scales. Robert Bringhurst points out that myth isn't antagonistic to science. It aims like science at perceiving and expressing these truths, but the hypotheses of myths are framed as stories, not equations. While a scientist quantifies reality, a myth teller gives it body. But we are living in a strange time when most of our myths are deracinated, uprooted. We think we have myths, but really these stories are like houseplants, cut off from the fungal mycorrhizal complexity of the soil and therefore unable to refruit as something freshly adapted to our current environmental conditions and social circumstances. So for me, you know, I really, I like to think about these mythic systems as being kind of like, see when you see someone like Jesus above ground, it's like a mushroom. 
So a mushroom looks like an individual in the forest soil. But if, if any of you have ever seen a mushroom um, ring, a fairy ring, those are all the product of one being. And that being is weaving together like lace, crochet below the soil. And when it needs to reproduce and spread to a place where there's more to eat, more to connect, it produces a mushroom above the soil that sends out spores that float on the winds. And those mushrooms look like they're heroes, like they're atomized individuals, but they're connected below ground to a much older, wiser, more interspecies community. And so for me, we're very stuck these days in this kind of neo-Darwinian pulse of optimization, linear time, hero on a journey, individuating. And while being an individual is a helpful technology, and I never want to demonize it, you know, sometimes we have to individuate from toxic situations. We have to figure out who we are. The mushroom is produced because it wants to reproduce. It wants to create a gradient of difference that allows for new things to come into shape. But I'm not sure that the individual is always the best story for a time when we have become so self-important that we don't understand that we are built by other beings. So we can sink back into the soil and realize that every hero, every individual character and species, every mythic figure is a fruiting body of an older group below ground. And so for me, there are great representations. You know, there's Orpheus, who we now know that the Orphic hymns and the Orphic tradition was more of a title than it was an individual figure, that you stepped into the role of Orpheus and began to create poetry and to create devotional um, uh, uh, phrases and, and mantras. And that Homer was also a rhapsodic tradition, that Homer is an ecosystem of Homers. And so I, we can begin to complicate this idea of the author or of the individual as owning an idea. We are all built from the place where we breathe in pheromone and microbiome. We are all infused with otherness that then uses us, hijacks us for a story that's bigger than our individual life. And so for me, I oftentimes think of Yeshua as being a mushroom in a fairy ring that includes Orpheus and Addis and Adonis and Osiris. Um, and you know, I, one of my favorite things, ways of visualizing this is they're the, one of the biggest beings in the entire world and one of the oldest beings is a 7,000 year old honey fungi in Oregon. And you don't see it, it's invisible, it's all below ground. It's like that invisible connected tissue weaving together forests, trees, bacteria, orchids, bromeliads, all of these different beings. And then sometimes it produces a mushroom that looks like an individual, but really it's this wild, older, reticulated web below ground. And so for me, I like to look at mythic systems as arriving from these older earthbound systems that are bigger than one culture, one city, one version of events. Um, so what's really important for me is that myths need to move. And I think the thing about fungal systems and fungal science that feels really helpful is that it doesn't stay still. The, the fungi are below ground, they rot, they break down, they show me that the tomb is also a womb, that the soil that is made of dead matter is also the place where life is gestated and built and nourished, but then they need to sport, come up above ground and send spores into the sky. There are 50 million tons of fungal spores in the sky. It's more biomatter than any other thing. And I like to think of sky gods as actually being spore gods. Spores, we actually know that fungal spores act like nuclei that create water droplets around them, and they sporulate storms. They create storm systems. So rainforests are actually kept humid and moist and create good conditions for healthy soil and mushrooms because these fungal spores are in the actual atmosphere creating the rainstorms that create these cycles of nourishment. Um, and so if we think of death and decay as opening up the space for resurrection and refruiting, we see that cycles are really important. You don't wanna stop the cycle in the sky or the soil. You want to tie them back together and let them keep cycling. And I loved the vegetal gods of the Mediterranean that precede Jesus because they're really good at showing us that, yeah, sometimes you come into the city and you offer wine, you offer stories and wisdom. Sometimes you're young and beautiful, 
but then you are torn apart and you die and you're mulched back into the land that you were you came from you feed the land um, and that part of the cycle is really really important to understand is that you can't stop at any one point along it you have to keep it going sky gods are also also soil gods they have to understand how to keep that that movement happening um so one of the ways that i look at myths are as they are like palimpsests so palimpsests are a um let me just find my notes on this um yeah so palimpsests are when in manuscripts you have an old manuscript and then someone writes over it because manuscripts were very hard to produce. Like you would oftentimes produce vellum or papyrus. It was expensive, difficult to produce. So oftentimes you would recycle ma manuscripts by writing over. But sometimes the writing from the older story would pop up. Or sometimes you would be writing over a manuscript because you wanted to co-opt a story. You wanted to change it. Um, and so palimpsests are a really great metaphor for looking at how myths get changed. An empire comes in and it knows that it can't get rid of the original myth. It's too deeply rooted in the land. The people are too attached to these ceremonies, these figures. It's the best way of getting control of these people and um, disempowering them is not to try and erase their myths, but to write over them, to co-opt them. And so that is one of the ways I look at stories that come to us, which is I say, is this the first version or is this a game of telephone and is this the 400th translation. And can I look back? Can I peer through the manuscript and see what's popping up? Are there things that I've lost? Are there, are there characters who are monsters now who used to be mothers? And that's one of the big things I actually say and quip is that mother myths are monster myths. And that a lot of the stories that come to us via the Roman Empire, via patriarchy, after the fall of the Bronze Age and the kind of fall of these earth reverent partnership cultures, when we see monsters in these stories, we're seeing a rewrite of older stories where the, mon where the monsters were mothers or they were earth beings. They were beings who represented a culture that the dominant culture is actively trying to justify killing and repressing by calling it monstrous. And so one of the ways I look at this is, you know, let's start with the basics. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. That's the sort of Genesis. It's a text scholars agree was probably compiled during the Babylonian exile and influenced by the surrounding Sumerian mythologies. In the Hebrew Bible deep, from the face of the deep is to harm. As scholar A.E. Wapham points out, for Babylonian captives writing, finally taking an oral culture, an organismic living culture and pinning it to the page, they were being very precise with using to harm. It would have had a very different resonance than just deep for them. To harm would have meant to harm of Tiamat, the mother sea goddess of Babylonian creation myths. So in her earliest incarnation, Tiamat was revered as a symbol of the primordial sea. You know, that sea that we take inside our bodies to create our own wounds, that primordial womb that gives rise to all creation. However, although Babylonian religion is on a rhizomatic continuity with Su Sumerian religion, the acts of translation between the cosmologies were not peaceful. They were palimpsestic. Tiamat came to be seen as a giant menacing snake or dragon. She serves as a painful example of a mother transformed into a monster, narratively justifying her murder. This of course also happens with Medusa, who represents these earlier Cretan cultures, you know, snake goddesses, snake monsters are usually snake goddesses. The snake is always associated with those beings who kinetically shiver against the earth. They are literally close to the earth. They are close to the goddess. So you, when you see a dragon or a serpent or a snake that's being killed, it's usually representative of an earlier earth goddess tradition that's being co-opted by, you know, the uh, is the Aryan hordes that come down into the Mediterranean base and all sorts of different, you know, moments of um, not so peaceful um, syncretism. Syncretism being when two religions fuse and change. Um, 
one of my favorite examples is that we think of the Minotaur as being the, you know, the monster of the story of Theseus. But the Minotaur is older than the story of Theseus. He predates the Olympic pantheon. And he is an old, he's part of that old tradition of the cattle cult cults and how cattle Hayek and Harappa, you know, one of the oldest cults we can see is the reverence of bull gods who with their crescent horns show us that we have to honor lunar time, cyclical, cyclical time not just solar time that moves straight forward and slices through for the time that like an Ouroboros, like a snake, eats its own tail, digests itself, goes back into the soil. So for me, I really was very interested in the lunar bull god as becoming the minotaur. Um, you know, when we look at Greek myths, chock full of monsters, rape and pillage, we have to remember that many of these myths are translations of older stories. Um, in the Greek rewrite of the older Bronze Age Minoan myths, we hear that King Minos of Crete disobeyed the gods by refusing to sacrifice a sacred bull, you know, and his wife becomes enamored of this bull and she copulates with it, producing this monstrous minotaur that is then sequestered away in a labyrinth. And then of course, young Theseus of Athens comes to the rec rescue, seducing the minotaur sister Ariadne and getting her to betray her brother and show him how to kill him. And then he absconds with Ariadne and rapes her and abandons her on Naxos where she is saved by Dionysus in some versions of the myth. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not the only version of, of events that the Minotaur actually had a much earlier name, which was Asterion, the starry one. And that he was probably associated with sacred mead making rites on Crete that predated the Greek rewrites of these older stories. And that he was probably seen as being part of these sacred bull dances we see inscribed in these beautiful Cretan frescoes that show, you know, one of my favorite things about Cretan culture where we replant the monster, the Minotaur, is that it is essentially kinetic and it doesn't display death, violence, not even that many human beings. The thing that's most important is nature reverence. You know, moments of epiphonic worship of mountains, maybe a bare-breasted goddess, lions, serpents, chevrons. It's movement itself rather than an individual. It's the connectivity itself, the dance. I oftentimes like to think that if we replant the Minotaur in his role as a star, a constellation that would rise. And if we think of the fact that no labyrinth was ever on earth on Crete, what if the labyrinth was a chain of human beings dancing? What if it was that bull dance, that actual moment where we join together and honor the rising of a star, the, the experience of the skies themselves as moving and cycling and keeping our own mythic ecologic, ecological and bodily systems with their lymph um, flush, not nothing getting stuck. You know, they, the Minotaur teaches us to dance again, to move again, mythically and ecologically. So yes, there, there are some of those beautiful images. Um, yeah, Rian Eisler, who's one of my favorite scholars on this subject and writes about it in The Chalice and the Blade says, one of the most striking things about Neolithic art is what it does not depict. For what a people do not depict in their art can tell us as much about them as what they do. Prior to the fall of Minoan culture, Crete had no fortified walls. And most importantly, there are no depictions of violence or war in its extensive offering of art. Of course, another one of these vegetal gods who has much to teach us is Osiris. And for me, Osiris and many scholars have shown this seems to be the closest analog to Jesus. Um, that of course, because there was so much actual cultural diffusion between Egypt and Palestine and Judea, there would have been, especially in a moment in the Roman empire, which was highly cosmopolitan. And you would have had all these Roman centers where you would have had people from Africa, from the Himalayas, from Egypt with their mythic systems. You know, Jesus would have been highly informed by, you know, a, the Romans version of Isis worship by Egyptian culture and would have been highly aware of the kind of mythic systems of Osiris. Oftentimes, and many other people have said this thing, it's interesting that we have Mary Magdalene as the tower, Migdal meaning towers, and we have Isis as being the watchtower, the tower of Alexandria, and associated with that light that brings the ship into shore. And so we have lots of interesting conflations and, and, and overlaps between Isis and Osiris myth and the Miriam and Yeshua um, folklore. 
And whether that's accidental, whether it's intentional, I'm a, I'm a fictional writer, I'm a poet, I'm not an expert, but I do think that it's highly beautiful and interesting to think about. In particular, if anyone here has not read the Poet HD's trilogy, it's an incredible poetic meditation on how all of these syncretisms happen. Um, I always, always recommend it for people who are interested in the Magdalene, interested in Isis and Osiris. So I want to start with Osiris and give a little background about him, and then I'm going to shift into the Magdalene. But Osiris for me is this wonderful, healthier version almost of Jesus um, that teaches us that, you know, yes, we are, we, we, we are the river itself. We're not just a human being that one of the earliest texts we have in the Old Kingdom Pyramid text that say the field laughs, the God's offering descends, which is a reference to Osiris. Um, he straddles the Paleolithic and the Neolithic, hunting and gathering, moving into sedentary agriculture and civilization. Um, you know, the, the Egyptians were skilled artisans with a pension for storytelling and monuments. So even if we don't have the earliest like texts of him, we have a lot of visual iconography. And they can, it can show us something really interesting, but he, he is always green. <laughs> um, he's wearing a feathered atep headdress that prefigures his hawk son Horus, another theriomorph, you know, half human, half animal. His legs are often bound with money, mummy wrapping, firmly attaching his lower half to the soil, the underworld, and the regenerative cycle of dirt and death. This fusion of legs echoes the older Paleolithic serpent gods and goddesses. His human form is emerging from the underworld and from the snake skin of an older, less human-centered order of divinity. He straddles elements and species. He holds the crook and flail. The crook represents his ability to work with animals and the flail to thresh wheat. He is responsible both to the world of plants and the worlds of animals, and it literally crosses his heart. Um, he is, he negotiates boundaries between water and dirt, life and death, because he is the Nile. But Osiris was very much seen as actually being the river Nile, as it would thin and then inundate the land and flood it and nourish the soil. And he was always cyclical. He was always riverine. He teaches us to think not like an individual, but like an ecosystem that nourishes and supports a whole kingdom. And for me, the most important teaching from Osiris is that to become a king, you have to become the kingdom. You have to put your body into it. So in the tradition, he is caught up into pieces and killed by his jealous brother Set. And then Isis plants him in all the different parts of Egypt. So his body literally goes back to the earth to become the king, the kingdom. And then we, we see this in many different traditions is that the king to really become the kingdom has to put his body into it. He has to become the matter of it. Um, and that mothering isn't something that's just belonging to women. It's something that a king can do by putting his body into the matter. He can mutter, mutter matter mother, um, an entire kingdom in this way. He was actually celebrated with these things called Osiris vegetans, where yearly priests would mulch soil, wheat, wine, spices, food, and plants for a month in the shape of a human body. And then it would sprout into all these grasses and grow. And then it would be thrown back into the, into the fields or into the Nile to nourish the land. So he really shows us how to keep cycling. And for me, Jesus, the, what happens to Jesus' story when it's co-opted by empire and by patriarchy is that it gets interrupted. Jesus' body literally disappears. That he was from a people who thought it was the most important thing to have your bones interred in the land that belonged to God, where you had been a tenant farmer of God's, taking care of his land. And the fact that Jesus' body is not fed back to the land from which he drew his teachings and his incredibly ecologically focused parables is odd. It interrupts a cycle. And if we actually look at the deep time history of the earth, these moments where cycles of rot and refruit are interrupted create really big issues. One of them is the Carboniferous period where there was a burst of woody plants and they overtook everything. They killed off a lot of their beings and then they would die. And there was no fungi yet that had developed to break down these plants. So they didn't decay or rot or become soil. They just swamped the earth. They created the first climatological climate change event. 
and it was caused by a species that was really directly. And it, it caused a global cooling event and killed off many, many, it, was, it created a mass extinction event. And it's that compacted, undigested matter, that interruption in the cycle that is the fossil fuels fueling global warming and climate change today. So really interesting, practical, scientific way of looking at what happens when we don't tie these cycles together and keep them moving. Um, and so for me, Osiris is this really wonderful way of looking at the real wisdom of Jesus, that Jesus is always teaching us to plant us back in the land and to honor it with stories and to feed the people who are around you, to heal them freely. You know, don't demand anything, give yourself away, give your food away, give your cloak away, knowing that you will be taken care of. And, and, and for me, it's not that he interrupts it, it's that the way his story is palimpsestically rewritten ignores the fact that he was bodily that he must have had an incredible bodily intelligence to be able to convince oppressed, traumatized, upset Galilean farmers to follow him. Like think about the kinetic, physical intelligence you would have to command to get people to listen to you in such a time period. We forget that. He must have had an incredible physical presence um, and he must have been so good at storytelling. And he was telling stories that encouraged an interrupted pedagogy. They were, they were designed to make people interrupt him. And we think of him as being highly, you know, whimsical now, but they were designed, my favorite being the mustard seed. So you have a Galilean peasantry who had their land stolen by bad loans. So, the, so Roman, the Roman empire would come in, take over a city, give bad loans, and then steal land. So you have people who believe land only belongs to God the land where they've buried the bones of their ancestors for thousands of years, and it's taken by the Roman Empire. Then you're expected to be a tenant farmer. And if your farm fails, you're not gonna be able to feed your family or pay your taxes, and you would risk death and starvation. And so a mustard seed, which grows the most pernicious weed in second temple period Palestine, has the ability to destroy your crop in like a day, saying the kingdom is here, this moment of injustice, where everything feels wrong is the kingdom. And it's the mustard seed that might make your family starve and die. That's a wild thing to say. He must have been an incredibly dynamic person to be able to say something that disruptive to a group of people and then hold the explosive debate that must have erupted. I always like to bring that into play, which is, gosh, this was really wild storytelling that we've, we've almost lost touch with how wild it must have been. Um, if, but by replanting it in its ecological and social context, we can begin to reclaim that it was anti-imperial. It was oftentimes even anti-agricultural. Um, very interesting to me. And that was really what I was trying to summon with my retelling of the Magdalene story was all of the, the moral, ecological texture of that time period. Um, and so if it's okay, I feel like instead of just lecturing, about the Magdalene, I'd rather give you guys a taste of the best way I have to talk about it, which is my book. Um, and to read you after the preface, there's a frame narrative is that Lucas goes up into France to find the Magdalene and get her story. And so the, the preface is that is that journey that Lucas takes, you know, for the gospel of Luke to go perhaps find the Magdalene and convince her. Um, but the first chapter is her beginning her story and interrupting what he was expecting to hear. And so I thought I might read you a part of the first chapter to introduce you to a version of the Magdalene as a child and what she must have felt inside of a culture that was, you know, oftentimes sexist, that there was biodiversity of Jewish practices and they were still incredibly animistic and environmentally responsive, but they were hard for women. And they were also, she was inside of a culture that was really had been through exile and many, many cascades of empires coming in and killing off all of her people and oppressing them. So what was that like bodily, somatically? What it, in, in a PTSD framework, what is that like? And so I think I'll read the start of the first section. The start of the first section is called The Tower. Um, and I will, I will read a little bit and then I'll open it up to conversation. I am too close to see him. Instead, I smell him, 
cedar wood and sea salt, grapes burst underfoot, musk, the sharp tang of a lightning strike. I grip his muscled arms, press my face into his neck. He sighs into my hair, I feel his breath, hot and insistent, shiver against my scalp. I lick the sweat from his shoulder and his hands curl around my waist. Miriam. I try to pull back in order to look up into his face and find I cannot. My arms betray me, tightening their clutch, knowing that to release him is to lose him. And he too presses me into his broad chest, our lungs paired like twin butterflies, buoyed by wind, flown through with a common spirit. I see, you are confused. You do not understand what I am telling you. I see in your eyes a desire I have come to distrust. You want the teachings. You want to understand how to do extraordinary things, impossible things, miracles. Do you think I will teach you how to transform water into wine, wine into blood? Do you think I will teach you how to raise the dead? Do you think I will teach you the secret of eternal life? Here is the first teaching. The teachings do not matter to me anymore. The only thing I care about is whether or not I can tell the story with enough honesty that he returns to me. Maybe then I will see him again as he was. Maybe if I approach carefully and do not leave anything out, I will again be able to see the face of my beloved. I can still see Bethany so clearly, my home, perched high atop a grassy slope. Behind every white house is a garden. The children are running along the narrow winding streets, calling to each other, playing a game. Smoke wafts away from the courtyards as women prepare for the evening meal. A group of young women are traveling to the baths together, their long cloaks a swirl of green and yellow in the springtime breeze. I knew everyone in Bethany when I was a child, but now I remember so few of their names, yet a stare I will never forget. A stare is burned into my mind forever. Huddled in the dirt, down at the bottom of the cliff, her shawl splattered with blood, she was wailing, producing sounds so ragged I was surprised the air didn't rip apart around them. Her hands scraped the dry earth. She screamed with the agony of someone who knew she was about to die. What are they going to do to her? I asked my sister Marta. Already frightened, I clutched at her shawl. Be quiet, Miriam, she scolded. Her mouth twitched as her eyes stared up at the rocky ledge above Esther. Old stone steps led down from the town gate, cracked by the roots of olive trees. After its descent down the slope, the path wound through the fields towards Yerushalayim. To the right was a steep ledge overlooking a barren, rocky patch of earth. It was steep enough that whenever my family went into the city, my mother pulled me tightly to her side, as if worried I might accidentally slip out of her grasp and fall to my death. Esther was sprawled on the unforgiving stones below that ledge, her knees bloodied, her hands torn apart. Had she tripped? Looking down on her was a crowd of men. Had they pushed her over the ledge, down into the gravel below? I could not believe they would do such a thing. These were not strangers to me. These were my father's friends, the men I saw every day in the marketplace. Friendly men, good men. There was a Khan, the silver bearded rabbi who read scripture in a reedy voice every Sabbath in the town synagogue. Caleb, a scholar who argued endlessly, endlessly about the law with my father over a cup of wine and a loaf of my mother's seediest bread. Caleb, who greeted me with a grin when he stopped by revealing his missing front teeth. Shalama, Miriam, he would say, you are already more beautiful than your mother. Ephraim, my friend Johanna's father, spat down on the woman's head. Yes, they were familiar, but their faces were transformed by rage. Huddled in the dust, the woman wept and shook. Oh God, what has she done? My sister whispered. It's a stare, my little brother Lazarus cried. The cloth doll he had brought for our games hung limply in his hands, 
His face was flushed with emotion. And that's her husband, Gad, whispered Marta, almost too softly for me to hear. She pointed at a handsome man with a short beard, the angriest of them all. A vein in his forehead bulged with the force of his wrath. Why is Gad so angry at his wife? I whispered back, but Marta ignored me. I remembered Gad from Esther's wedding the previous spring. He had worn an embroidered vest, his hair oiled back so that his high, broad forehead was more visible. He was beautiful to me. Gad screamed at his wretched wife, and her fear reached into my own body. Something tight and stone-like dropped into my stomach. It was early spring outside of Yerushalayim. The fields turned muddy by a long, cold, rainy season were firming up under the steady sunlight. Cyclamen purpled the roadside, and the hillsides reddened with anemones. I'd overheard my mother and her friend Bethiah whispering about the relief that the bad weather was finished, and the children could finally be sent outside somewhere where they wouldn't be underfoot. We'd always run straight for the fields to play. We liked to have enough space to run, sliding through the tall grasses as we chased each other. We were turned striped with green stains. How do you get so dirty? My mother would chastise us as she inspected the damage. She had woven the clothes we wore and despaired that we undid her handiwork so quickly. I looked down at, on a stair, then turned to my older sister for a sign of what to do. Marta always had a plan, but her lower lip quivered with uncertainty, as if a word was trapped there. Marta understood what was happening. She grasped my brother and me firmly by the hand. Come, she said finally. We should not be here for this. Esther, Lazarus called out, squirming away from Marta. Esther, what is wrong? Lazarus, no. Marta shrieked, lunging forward and grabbing him around his waist. He was five, only a year younger than me, but he was spindly and small. The path that led to the ledge was lined with gnarled sycamore figs and wild roses. I hid behind a bush, swallowing a cry when a thorn pierced my thigh. My eyes were on a stare, she moaned. I resisted clamping my hands over my ears, shutting my eyes tight. Something in me knew I had to witness this. I had to listen to her pain. Esther was 16, and I saw her every time my family went to the synagogue. She would stand with us, pressed against the walls with the other women. I loved to watch her, to imitate her graceful gestures, moving my hands gently when I walked, bending my elbows just so, making sure that my fingers did not brush my hips. At synagogue, I blinked up at her, smiling openly, watching her long eyelashes flutter as she tried to resist a yawn, pressing her hand to her lips. All of Bethany had exploded in celebration this past spring when she'd wed the handsome Gad. Our mother let us bring flowers to a stair in her home as her relatives dressed her in deep green cloth and placed cold metal necklaces over her bosom. We offered baskets heavy with fresh violets, lilies, and irises bruised by the weight of their own lips. Here, girls, she had said, kneeling and pressing a feathery kiss to our cheeks showing us her hands that were hennaed with curling vines. I inhaled deeply. She smelled like cinnamon and musk. One day you will have wedding flowers too. She is lucky to have a young and handsome husband, Marta had confided in me when our mother pulled us from the room. We went to wait on the path that led to Gad's home. A girl as beautiful as Esther would have been prized by a wealthy man, an old man. I nodded, agreeing. How lucky Esther was, how beautiful they both were when they kissed under the chuppah. It felt like starlight to watch them. I wished I could drink their love, save it and taste it. When the cold winds of winter arrived, God must be happy to see such young people come together. Esther's own father had clapped Marta and me on the shoulders, bending down with a wry smile, his breath already laced with drink. I've spent enough on this wedding to shame your father into spending even more when your time comes. Five lambs slaughtered and I bought out the market's entire supply of wine. What lovely brides you both will be. We'd blushed, lowering our eyes like our mother had taught us. Esther was a queen out of scripture when she came to meet Gad. Dark coal made her almond-shaped eyes even bigger and gold bracelets blazed at her fragile wrists. The midday sun glinted on her lips, which were red, wet and red, as if she had just licked them with her own tongue. She is so lovely, 
my friend Johanna gasped, clutching my hand tight. One day we will look just as beautiful, I declared, echoing the words of Esther's father. But Esther did not look beautiful now. Oh, no, no, she screamed. Her eyes were glassy and unfocused. Shame on you, whore, snarled Caleb. I flinched, remembering his fatherly touch. You have brought disgrace to your father, your mother, your husband. I could see red welts rising where her nails had broken the skin of her throat. I glanced over my shoulder. Marta clutched Lazarus to her side as she scanned the shrubs near the path, looking for me. I hid in the wet shade of the fig tree, watching the scene unfold. This is the way of an adulteress, shouted Gad. The word hung in the air, an open wound. Adulteress? What did it mean? I clutched my chest again. I would be sick. I would explode. Something was wrong with these men. Gad's face contorted with rage. His fists shook at his side. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done no wrong. We can show no mercy. Her impurity will corrupt our daughters and our wives, Ephraim pointed a short, swollen finger at a stare. He no longer looked like the father who gave Johanna and me a coin to spend at the market. He was a bloated monstrosity, his face spidered with red capillaries. Esther's screams pierced the dull, hot air. And where is your lover? Gad howled at her. Shall I kill him in front of you? I can't. He doesn't even care about you enough to save you. I did not understand. What lover? Didn't Gad and Esther love each other? Hadn't their wedding been beautiful? A dusky streak of cloud fissured the blue of the sky in half. The heavens would fall in on us. I held onto the fig tree. Esther's father joined Gad. Shame to think I reared a whore like this. Father, she wailed. Father, you are no daughter of mine, he declared. Her screaming opened up like a flower then blooming bigger, louder, higher, until I thought my ears would bleed. Where was my father? I scanned the mob, but could not see his face. My body was shaking, my heart beating in my eyes. There was blood at the edge of my vision. Esther's moans were shaking something loose inside of me. An animal curled into position under my skin. Behind my knuckles, claws clicked invisibly. I would hunt these men down and rip the skin from their backs with my teeth. I would eat them and spit out their bones. I would turn them back into dirt. Whore. Gad kicked a cloud of dirt down on Esther's face and she lost her balance, falling backwards. The law of Moshe says we must stone her, the old rabbi proclaimed, holding his hands upward towards heaven. A cheer resounded through the group. How many times had I walked past this ledge with our servant woman, Kamat, accompanying her into the fields to bring her husband, Meshkin, at his lunch? As Gad flung a first rock at a stair, I trembled, past words, past thinking. Blood dripped down her arm. Now I saw the piles of stones next to the men. They were stones like the ones I'd often gathered in my skirts, collecting them for their pretty colors. Stones Lazarus dipped in water to make bright and shiny. What a strange child I was, often filled with an overwhelming emotion for the trees, the beetles, and the flies, the mangy camels tied up outside of town, flicking their long tongues in my direction. I was suddenly filled with a rage that these stones could be so misused. Baked with sunshine, dusty with the summer wind, they were not meant for cruelty, but I was wrong. These stones had been wielded before. Women had died here, there just beyond a stair. I saw a vision of the piled limp bodies of women who had been stoned here, skipping past them down the path to play in the fields. I had not known this. Even as a little girl, I had heard from my father about men with the ability to see angels or fiery chariots. These were men who could look across the desert and see the rain coming before it ever crested above the horizon. I wanted to be like these men. But no one had prepared me for the visions of women in which we see each other. We see what has been done to us. We see our dead. In every town, in every land I have ever traveled to, the women have been waiting for me, clustered in front of the city gates, always the color of winter, even in lands where no winter ever comes. They are the dead women, the women who have been murdered by their fathers, by their brothers, by their husbands the harlots trying to staunch their slit necks. They're the girls with black eyes, blood dried down their legs, their hands outstretched and pleading. 
I asked to be seen. No, I struggled to speak. My voice was too thick with disbelief to leave my throat. There was more ceremony in the slaughter of animals. At least their blood was spilled with sacred purpose. If Sarah's blood would seep deep into the sand where nothing would grow. Did my God want this? I could not imagine he did, but what did I know? I was but a child and a girl. All I knew then was that my sight was splintering. I could see the wild flowers, the soft, almost liquid beauty of spring rolling forward, carrying pink almond blossoms over Bethany towards Yerushalayim. And I could also see the spectral heap of dead women, their heads caved in by jagged rocks. I could see the kind men that I knew fondly as my elders, my protectors, my father's friends. And I could also see a crowd of monsters capable of incomprehensible things. Miriam hissed Marta. She had spotted me hiding near the fig tree, but she was too late. I had already leapt from the bushes, throwing up clouds of red dust as my feet pounded the dirt. I was a tiny girl, blurred by speed and howling with a fury that rose from my lungs. Down the embankment I slid, skinning my knees as I hurled myself before a stair. I felt her arms grasp me close, her hair hanging over my back. No, she cried, no, Miriam. What is this? There was a moment of confusion. Then Gad kicked the ledge, sending a rain of gravel down upon us. Kill them both, he bellowed. But it was not to be. Stop, shouted a voice. It was Gilead, the rabbi. That is Nicodemus's daughter, Miriam. This is no girl, Esther's father hissed. Nicodemus has raised a wild animal. I pulled myself to my knees, gazing up at them through the glare. The sun behind the men made them appear as shadows silhouetted by an unearthly glow. How do I explain what happened next? Later, no one could be sure. Someone came into me, except that someone was me, and I was no longer a girl. I was dark, old. I was terror. I was horror. I was the face of the deep, the blackness that came before God shaped the world. Shame upon you. Shame. My body vibrated with something beyond anger. It was the rage of trees, of roots, of dirt. Radiating up from the ground, it filled me with a woody strength that forced words from my mouth. Who gives you the right? Miriam, Esther begged, you must go home. From the edge of the path, Marta pleaded, Miriam, what are you doing? She was holding Lazarus in her arms, but I was beyond their concern. The anger thrummed through me and back into the ground, a second passed, and the earth responded with its own pulse. The rage that grew before me was like a bruise, a great shadow that spread across the ground. Then something darker and stranger than the opacity of shadow eclipsed the void above us, filling the air. And there was a noise, too like clouds scraping over a mountaintop or a thousand blades being sharpened against a stone. Vultures swooped down on the men, so many of them that they blocked out the sun. They beat huge wings against the men's faces, knifing sharp beaks into their heads. Demons, screeched Shastair's father, raising his hands to defend himself. She has summoned demons. Someone stop her, Ephraim yelled, blood filling his eyes as the birds scratched at him with their talons. Stop me? Not yet. This was the earth's answer to their violence. Ten vultures, twenty, and still more fell out of the sky, rasping and hissing. A great shadow covered the rabbi, then lifted up the hat from his head. Shame, I screamed at them. Shame! Get out of here, Gad yelled to the other men. Leave her, Achan screeched. Let the birds pick her bones clean. They will eat you, all of you, I yelled at the men as they fled. But the hoarse cries of the vultures drowned out my words. My voice was small again, the voice of a girl. In the midst of the chaos, Marta had run through the great flapping bodies of the birds, impervious to their wings. She scrambled down to us now, pulling a stair to her feet, and whispered something into her ear. The last men fled, the birds chasing them back to the village and their homes. There would be no stoning. A stair would live. You foolish girl. Marta slapped me hard across my cheek. What will I tell father? What? She trailed off helplessly, gazing about her in awe as the birds settled blackly along the ledge, fixing us with their inky eyes. They shifted their feathers impatiently. One of them made a groaning sound like that of a wheel spinning against a rock. 
I gasped, tears springing out of my eyes as I touched my face. Marta swung her arms. Get, get you foul creatures. One of the birds beat his wings heavily as if to say, who are you to command us? Marta pulled Lazarus away, back up the stone steps towards Bethany. I followed behind her, but not before looking back. Thank you, I whispered, my hands still vibrating with dangerous heat. A stare was gone. The vultures bowed their naked heads, touching their beaks to the ground. They blinked at me with their dark eyes before lifting like smoke from a fire into the high, thin blue of the summer sky. The first chapter. Thank you. And I think now if we have time, I can open to any kind of commentary or question or conversation. Sure. Thank you, Sophie, very much for your sharing with us. Um, can you hold the book up again and tell us when it's published, where it's available, that kind of stuff? The Madonna it Secret. Is, it's the Madonna Secret. And it is, I will bring up a link. It is available, you know, via the terrible Amazon, via bookseller, any any bookshop that you have. I think it's available in, in England in September, but it's available August 15th in the States and um, in other places. Um, I also think if you, this is a secret that I'll share. My publisher, Intertritions, has been sending it out early. So if you order it directly from them, you might get it immediately. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, there it is right, right there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, so questions, um, um, anyone want to go, maybe put your hand up in electronic format is a good idea. Um, I loved your talk, Sophie, again. Thank you so much. Uh, it's always so rich. Um, I'll go first then because, um, ah, Ginger's got her hand up. Go for it, Ginger. Well, all I can say is I just am humbled by your light spirit, your love, your knowledge, and your effectiveness in sharing. Thank you. Thank and I got you. your book. I just bought your book. I got it now. And I am so looking forward to the rest of the story. God bless you, little oh darling. Thank you so much. I, 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 I read the audiobook myself, so it'll be very goofy, but if anyone has visual impairments or issues, there's an audiobook. So thank you everyone so much. Great. Okay, Alex, go for it. <clears throat> Sophie, thank you. It, in my world, I'm in a Druidic community um, and very shamanic. And what you were explaining was a druidic path, a druidic understanding of nature and the whole process, the micro macro, the, um, what's the word I had it a minute ago, um, where it's in every dimension and cascades and mirrors back. Um, I think that we would definitely um, say that you are druidic or have that within you, that understanding within you. That's the tradition I'm most drawn to, to be perfectly honest. I, I, I'm not an expert in it at all, but gosh, I've read quite a bit. And You're knowing just yeah. by, okay. And also I'd go back to saying that when you say you love your, your topic, you are passionate about your topic and you have a hungry love. You're incredibly <laughs> hungry. It is hungry. Um, and, and, and I would say that everything that you've consumed, you've, you know, you've chewed well. And I think that, um, and how you express it and articulate it through your, again, a druidic process of bardic um, druidry, um, you know, in poetry and being a, a wordsmith, you can articulate the understanding within the shamanistic and the druidic paths. Um, and and it, in essence, it is about um, the micro, micro, the earth, life herself, itself, as opposed to any particular species having any priority. Um, so I heard you loud and clear. 
Um, secondly, with your book, um, I've already, I've, I've got in mind several people I want to send it to um, <laughs> who would love it. And I've already found it on Amazon. Um, what came to mind is that um, I see another micro macro. It doesn't necessarily have to be masculine, feminine. It can be any, it's not about gender. It's made to be about gender, but it's about people and how they perceive things. And if you can gravitate to a justification, whether you're male or female, and it serves a purpose, they'll do it. Um, we had the witch hunt trials. A lot of women did that to women. I know. So I think that, um, I don't know if you've ever come across the Stanford experiment where they had to stop that quite early. So if you're coming to the great birth of life um, and, and by going by the Stanford experiment, you're a male, you're a female, you're a male, you're a female, you're a male, you're a female, but in essence, we're the same. So I think that um, it's quite easy to, to put a blame on the men. That's a ma masculine thing. That's a feminine thing. Women do that as opposed to that's a, a human thing. So we, in essence, actually create more of a divide by pinpointing to a specific agenda or gender. Um, so I, I heard your story of, and how Miriam felt in those. And, and I was thinking how many women today go through that. And, you know, just because a lot of men don't come to the forefront, it happens to men, too. They are, you know, um, having to go through rites of passage and they're having to do these things because they are male. Um, and it's also almost like a dominance thing. Yeah. So um, I thoroughly enjoyed your talk, um, Sophie. And um, thank you so much. It's been a privilege, it really has. <clears throat> thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so let me ask a question and make a comment first sophie so thank you there's so many layers i've got about six questions but i just want to take you back in my own spiritual journey when i was researching all this stuff and juggling in my head in london in 1982 becoming a member of the fellowship of isis the pagan tradition going to ireland falling in love with the goddess mysteries reading the paradise papers of Merlin Stone and also Ryan Eisler of course Chalice and the Blade and then also wanting to become an Anglican Franciscan monk and then falling in love with a, a particular woman you know all this was jumbled in my head and I was trying to work it out scientifically right and I decided because I was trained as a historian to try and retrace the ecological history of Christianity kind of what you're doing Sophie so I was in those days, there's no internet, there's no, you know, computers even. It was all done on charts by hand. So I I drew a chart in which I mapped the the invention of wine and its spread ecologically over each five hundred year time period. So sort of it was somewhere in the Caucasian mountains, and then very soon it spreads down into uh, Palestine region, Anatolia, and then it spreads further on. From about 7,000 BC, they now think it's even 10,000 BC. <clears throat> so I mapped that, and then I mapped the invention of bread, the invention of the Neolithic, you know, um, taking of, of the grain, turning it into flour and making bread, which was a miraculous invention <clears throat> and was an ecological breakthrough that enabled civilizations to, to come into being. And if you map the, the spread of wine and the spread of bread, the kind of center is around Palestine. <clears throat> um, and I had this kind of enlightenment moment because I was um, very interested in ecology. I was active in the Green Party back in the 80s and eco-spirituality. And I thought, so that's what Christ was doing with his bread and wine mysteries. He was saying here in this eco-region, I am the bread and I am the wine. You know, we are, he meant. So I think what he was doing in his, exactly like you're saying, 
in his extended spirituality, he was including the ecosystem as part of that. And so he was saying his message of peace and nonviolence was, let's not damage this because we are all one body. We are the bread, we are the wine, we are each other. I am in you, you're in me. Um, so that's what I think is so important. What you're now doing coming along, you know, uh, what is it, 30 years later, is going into all the details um, scientifically. And I, I really appreciate that. Um, so, so, but I think the, the insight is, is, is really important. Um, my question, I suppose, is, <clears throat> are you, are you the, the, the first or the only person to be saying this? I mean, who else is doing eco uh, reconstruction of the Jesus Magdalene mysteries that you know of? Um, you mentioned a poet, Robert, somebody rather, uh, Robert um, Brinkus or something. I didn't get his full name. Tell us more about, like, who are your peers? Who else is saying this? Or are you absolutely... I... I mean, I would say my flavor is very my own, but I, as you said, as you have done, I'm a compost heap of thinkers who did the on the ground, going to the library stacks research that I'm benefiting from now. So I'm, I'm standing on the backs of you and other people. I mean, the people who I've been very inspired by in terms of their just their engagement with the primary documents the ecological information and like the text of the time period is very inspired by John Dominic Crossan's work yeah, um, yeah. reconstructing the parables and how they would have actually resonated. I studied with Bruce Chilton. I've been very inspired by his work at just reconstructing the anthropological and social texture of that time period. Um, they're not doing what I'm doing in a kind of eco-spiritual way, but they're very, their historical like work has been so important to me. I mean, in a more spiritual, ecologically aligned vision of things, I love Dominic Plotz's work, um, Douglas Plotz's work with Aramaic, and looking at that in a, in a really kind of plush, interesting way. Um, I like Marcus Borg, um, Cynthia Borjo, uh, I think that's how you say her name, Margaret Starbird's work has been really influential. I am very, I will always note this, there is a strain of green Christianity in England right now that actually has a lot of anti-Semitic undertones and um, draws on a lot of language that for me is just lifted from bulkish language of the Nazis. It's really hyper-focused on localism and a white Christianity. It kind of elides and erases the fact that it was a, as you said, Palestinian tradition informed by Canaanite religions, by years of Judaism. And I'm very suspicious of that right now. I know it's been very trendy. So I always say that whatever I'm doing is not that. Um, that I'm always want to be really careful about looking at the rich inheritance that informed that person. Um, but yeah, really, John Dominic Crossan's work, I think, has been the most influential just practically. I mean, it, it's so dry. He has this big tome called The Life of the Mediterranean Peasant, but so rich and interesting. In a more kind of fun romp, romp Brian Murescu's book, The Immortality Key, is a great look at the history of beer and wine in the Mediterranean basin and how Dionysus and Jesus are related. And I thought that was really fun. <clears throat> yeah, I was going to ask about um, Brian's work and the overlap with you, because it's in the <clears throat> it's in the bibliography. Yeah, I was I, I, mean, I, I disagree with some some aspects of what he's doing, but I also think that his his passion for the subject means that he's compiled a lot of information together in an interesting way that's that's good to engage with. Sure. Sure. I mean, just on the point of the the kind of green, the green movements, slightly yeah. anti-Semitic sort of, you know, folkish tradition, that's important um, to, to be cognizant of that. And it, I've obviously it really been under, You have to look yeah. very closely. It's not, it's oftentimes very good speakers, rhetorically powerful people, You and you have to slow down and listen a little bit. Um, so, and I, I was definitely... Oh, taken by a bunch of these people immediately so so can i just comment on that because that's an important issue um it seems to me the only antidote to anti-semitism is is philo-semitism i'm a philo-semite i love however i love all the semitic traditions i love the jewish the samaritan the kabbalistic 
the Islamic, the Sufi, the Babylonian, the Akkadian. I'm a devotee of Nabo, the god of learning. You know, I love the Phoenicians. Pythagoras was half Phoenician, which is a Semitic people. And Europa was a, a, a Semitic princess captured, brought by Zeus, her, her lover. Um, so what I've been trying to do, and I think Robert Graves was trying to do the same in his Hebrew myths and his Greek myths, is recognize that at the underbelly of European mythology um, is actually a lot of Semitic mythology. Yeah. And what I've been trying to do since the 80s um, is marry them up. So, for instance, in the Prometheus story, um, the naughty, you know, deity that dares to challenge the, the Zeus and bring fire to mankind and actually creates mankind with Athena blowing the uh, life into us. No. I think Prometheus is very much like Satan or Lucifer in the Semitic telling of this story. Um, the God who dares challenge Yahweh and wants to give us knowledge, you know, the, the, and the mythic eating of the apple. Um, so there's all kinds of congruences. So to be pure, to be anti-Semitic is ridiculous. It's like being anti-water. We're all partly Semitic, you know. And, 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 and I, I, the one thing is I always, um, I've been lately trying to interrupt people who say Judeo-Christian because I'm like, no, there's the Christian tradition and then there's the, the Semitic traditions and one co-ops and digests and genocidally kills the other. And maybe we shouldn't conflate them. <laughs> um, so that's one thing I've also been trying to honor is just that, you know, when, when oppression and empire come in, you can't just pretend like they were best friends. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. Um, yes, uh, that reminds me of the British and the Irish. Um, that's a long story. Yeah. Um, the, 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 no more. No. Go, yeah. Go. Go. Um, anyone else want to come in? James, do you want to comment on her? I think I heard Sophie making Miriam or Mary Magdalene, the daughter of Nicodemus. So I will say I, I took a lot of liberty. Liberty. Yeah. So well, she's she's by my research, Mary is actually the daughter, granddaughter in law of Nicodemus. Fascinating. Okay. Um, yeah. So James, we're going to be hearing from him shortly with a sort of historical. He's been doing amazing research on the family tree of Mary Macklin and I would love, love to spend and, time with him. Yeah, we're going to be hearing from him shortly. But is there anything, Sophie, you'd like to say about your, I mean, do you stand by your historicizing of the story? Or is it purely fiction and you've just well, invented it or what? I, like that, <clears throat> um, I, I was actually very troubled by a lot of Magdalene work that seems to not take into account the historical texture, all the primary documents, the biodiversity of Jewish practices. So in terms of like plants, animal, rituals, people, what people were wearing, I tried to be very historically textured. In terms of what happens, I decided that, you know, because there's so many different competing narratives, so many gospel, gospels, which means news, which means translation, which means biased account, because there's a kaleidoscope of them, I decided that maybe I'd write my own kaleidoscopic version, knowing that it's not authoritative. It's, it's my love of, of an experience. I did want to make scaffolding, the sensual world, as concrete as possible and honor all of the primary documents. Like, hey, I read all of Josephus, you know, trying to really read enough of the texture to give it a lived historicity. That being said, you know, as, as you know, James I, and James Auden, I'm just meeting you for the first time right now, may come in, there's probably the way we're interpreting primary documents is accelerating our understanding of what might have actually happened and so that's where you should look for what might have actually happened this is a story it's a story that tries to honor the tradition of storytelling that jesus was part of which were targums which were oral variations on a theme so it's definitely part of an oral variation on a theme. It doesn't claim to be an authoritative interpretation. However, it tries to historically honor all of the different nuances of the food, the dress, the traditions of the time period. Right, fantastic. Um, can I ask you about psychedelics? Um, sure. Because of course, Brian Murarescu thinks that that was at the core of the Christian communion cup as it was under the Lucis. What, what's your view on that? Do you think Christ was encouraging psychedelic use or is that 
is that a 20th century guy looking back on it and inventing something? I have two, I have three different views. One is my sense is that there was a psych, there were psychotropic plants in the Mediterranean basin that were part of a fermentation rites. Dionysus, I think. Do I think the people of Dionysus were taking psychedelics? Definitely. Do I think the followers of Dionysus saw, knowing that Dionysus had been outlawed by the Roman government and that all of the followers of that of Pukula Anya had been killed off, knowing that it was dangerous to worship Dionysus, saw that they could take their psychedelic fermented processes and graft them on Christianity? Yeah. Do I think that Jesus himself was using psychedelics? I don't think so. Although my one question is, I have had a lot of interest about the parable of the tares. And the parable of the tares, I think is interesting because it doesn't actually seem to be about what we think it is, which is, that it says like, don't worry, you can separate them at the end. The truth is that the tares would have grown ergot, which would have produced a kind of LSD-like effect. And there was no way to separate them at the end. That if they'd grown together, they would have contaminated the wheat with this highly psychedelic, often poisonous substance. So to tell this kind of tricky, not parable saying like, maybe don't separate them. Maybe it's not so much about some giant spiritual metaphor, but it's more a wink at a kind of process of making psychedelics. I've never been sure. I do think it's an interesting layered parable. So that's my, my one like argument against myself is perhaps the parable of the tares. Well, I, ho I mean, if um, I heard a rumor that Brian Murarescu is writing a book on, on Mary Magdalene, so maybe we'll have him on this platform next year when he's published his book. And he exactly. might have found the hidden cup marked with writing in Greek saying Mary Magdalene's cup, and then it'll have psychedelic stuff in it. So then we'll, I think he's going down to that level of archeological detail. I, I love his, his, what is it, his pharmaco archeology. span I, I, It's fascinating stuff. And I think that, I really do think it was part of the Mediterranean basin tradition. I think there was a, I think the, the rites of Eleusis, I do think maybe the Essenes, yeah. I'm not, I'm not positive about Jesus himself as being part of a Northern Jewish tradition. Um, like, I'm not sure, I don't know, I'm not an expert. Well, it's good not to know that that's the very beginning of wisdom, as Socrates yeah. said. So, um, you did I hear you write and you said you'd read the entire works of Josephus? I tried to. I, I, I spent a lot of time with Josephus. And right, also, right. I, think I was really interested in how he writes two different accounts and he argues with himself. I mean, it's like it's it, in the places where there's dissonance between Josephus that's that a truth can emerge, you know? Yeah, I mean, he, he's, he's an imponderable thicket. And I yeah. thought we should have a round of applause if you've read the whole of his works. But I was going to ask about the Essene connection, because we've had authors on this platform before yeah. who've said, yes, Yeshua was connected with the Essene community, or and or that John the Baptist was. Um, and there's, you know, there's some lots of speculation in the literature about that. And or and or that they were connected with the Therapeutii of Egypt, who seem to be like the Essenes, but living in Egypt. Um, and that was the implication of our play we started with by Jaya, that there was an Egyptian connection. What, do, in your novel, do you make anything of the Essene or Egyptian connection or oh, therapeutic? I've been very interested that I actually think that the Essenes, the Essenes I, binaristic way of organizing some kind of spiritual practices seems antithetical to a lot of what Jesus is doing. Do I think Jesus studied with the Essenes? Probably. He seems like a person, is a cosmopolitan small country with a lot of different spiritual practices. Is it likely he spent time with the Essenes? Probably, he's a spiritually adventurous person. Um, so is he connected with the Essenes? I think so. My understanding through, via Bruce Chilton is that it's his brother, James, who becomes much more connected with those practices. And then it's a kind of back forming from James. And that James has like, takes the Jesus tradition in an Essene direction, which is interesting that a lot of our Christianity comes to us translated. But that being said, I don't know. I think it's fascinating. I do wonder, the Essenes were very interested in purity and Jesus seems to be very, very against purity. So I would have to think that it, they might've been connected through argumentation and debate. Um, because they, they disagree about some core things, as far as I can tell. 
Um, but I don't know. Um, as I said, I'm a lover. I'm a person who's felt into this rather than trying to find the truth. Brilliant. Yeah, well, that's, um, that's, those are great um, confessions to make. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, no, we've got to find a couple of minutes for final points. Um, anyone else want to come in? Um, I, I, I'd like to say something on going on with the, Jesus as a, a heretic from the Essenes. This is a nice idea. Jesus was a heretic from every possible angle. He was a heretic from the Orthodox Jewish tradition, but he was even a heretic from the Essenes. And from Possibly. John. I mean, I, I think that he also breaks with John. I mean, that for me is one of the big parts of my book is that he obviously learns from John and then breaks with him, which is interesting. John the baptizer we're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay, so that's a big, that's another big thing. So he was a, um, you know, a polymorphous, polyamorous heretic, if you want. Um, I wonder, one of the things that has always worried me about Christianity and its different formulations is this very dualistic streak, um, which the Essenes seem to have, the war between yeah. absolute light and absolute darkness, and they're on the side of the light, you know, and this is a worrying streak. This kind of Gnostic, pseudo-Gnostic dualism comes up in different religions. It's a temptation. Marnie had a big dose of it. Um, but it's there in, in suicide bombers who think they're working for Allah and they want to blow the other guys up. Um, I don't, I get the sense that wouldn't have been Jesus's narrative. Oh, it, he would have so. been trying to save the world rather than separate the good from the evil and blow the evil up. Yeah. I've had Jehovah's Witnesses come to me in France saying, Thomas, what you're doing is ridiculous. Why Why do you want to save the world? It's all up to God, and he's already condemned most of it. And you can't save it because God's judgment is over us all. And I find that very disabling, that kind of Gnostic, pseudo-Gnostic dualistic theology. Yeah. What, what's your reading of that? Where did that come from? In what rhizome was that? I, write about, this, I write about this a lot in The Flowering Wand, but... I'm really interested in looking at cultures like bodies and using a kind of trauma model that we use in looking at bodies and looking at cultures. And so I'm really interested in how a kind of a split between mind and matter that is born in Platonism, honestly, comes right after the Bronze Age collapse. And the Bronze Age collapse is, you know, all we know is that there were was massive climate change. There were there was, you know, empires fell, there was genocide, people were there were exiles, people had massive exodus. So people, you have cultures that are traumatized and trying to digest trauma on like, a, that would it get lodged in a body on a cultural body scale. And what happens when we are traumatized is we often dissociate head from body. If the body can die because of starvation, because of exile, because of, because of volcanic eruptions, it's maybe not safe to be in the body. So one of my poetic ways of looking back on this is that you see this, this this binaristic split between mind matter, spirit and matter, you know, the 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 ideals and the platonic forms and then the real world. And then of course, you know, the world of matter and then, you know, the, the higher realms of Gnosticism, you see that culturally arrive post-traumatic events. I oftentimes think a kind of the kind of binaristic eschatology of a certain strain of Judaism, a very small strain of Judaism at the time of Jesus is also reacting to multiple exiles, multiple genocides, multiple empires. Like I have great empathy for being like, maybe this place where we're getting killed all the time is not the good place. Maybe it's up there and maybe there's a division. So I have like, I don't have a lot of criticism. I just have empathy about how this happens. The problem with, with trauma responses is when they become habituated over time and they lose their usefulness. That's true in human bodies and cultural bodies. So for me, I'm interested in how the, this binaristic, this associative cultural mechanism loses its usefulness and becomes actually a problem over time. But that's, of course, this, that's not a truth. That's like a way of, I've looked back at these giant, hard to understand cultural systems and how they shift. Yeah, yeah, thank you for explaining that. Um, right, Alex, go for it. Um, with what you're saying, um, going back to um, Jesus basically 
being shunned by every act, every religious understanding at the time. Um, and with, with, our, with what you're saying as well, where has it come to where the unfolding, the myth, layer upon layer upon layer? Now, in my understanding of Jesus, um, the prophecy of Jesus was foretold 10,000 years before. It's only Christianity that's actually decided he's here. He arrived, um, the Europeans. So in essence, were they wrong? Were they right? Because in really looking at the, the various different groups out there today that are trying to find a community or walk a path, the light worker community has an understanding of the Christed consciousness. The light worker community are really, really active in trying to shift their, um, their speech. They're active in, in trying to, to shift their, their, their mind patterns. Um, and understanding that the way is them, which was a concept from my understanding of, of Jesus, he was very different, stood out, a man before his time. Maybe the story had arrived, maybe the Europeans were right, and maybe it was the, the story's journey, the myth's journey, for it to unfold now, the understanding of what was behind the concept of Jesus and the power of self-healing, the power of, of forgiveness, the pa power of all these traits. So maybe his story hadn't finished. Maybe it's still ongoing into a new awareness and it wasn't necessarily a physical, tangible person, but a whole evolution of consciousness. I love the yeah. idea of, of it being less about an individual and more like a morphic field. I love the idea of morphic resonance and that it's like a field and the more people who are part of the field, the stronger it gets. I have no definitive way of responding to you because I, I don't know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what comes next, but I do love the idea that the story isn't finished. And I think that's maybe where I'd like to end is, yeah, the story definitely doesn't feel finished. <laughs> right. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, so lots of food for thought, I would say, lots of, you know, avenues for further discussion. And I would hope, what are you working on next, Sophie? My last question, what are you, are you gonna take a sabbatical or do another book? Yeah. I, well, I'm finishing a book that's already sold about disability and ecology. So I have an incurable genetic illness. So it's just about composting our uh. ideas of what healing is. And so I'm finishing that. And then I'm working on my science fiction retelling of Tristan and Isolde. <laughs> so oh, that's, wow. <laughs> that's very weird and will probably take years to finish. So <laughs> who knows? Oh, that's really exciting. So we were playing Tristan and Isolde the other day um, on my, in my living room here with the music system uh, because this person had never heard Wagner before and didn't know it. And it's a very moving piece. And I've always wanted to be the guy that writes the, takes druidry into science fiction. So, you know, um, there's there's a whole load of unwritten scripts about we'll see if I can do it. it. It'll probably, it'll be my unfinished work that will be unearthed someday, but who knows? Oh, no, 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 that's that's your work it. for the next couple of years, Sophie. Finish and then after it. that, will be able to other stuff. But anyway, fantastic. Kate? I just wanted to honor you, Sophie. It's such a powerful, wonderful piece of writing. And I really, can hear what deep research you've done and um, just how you've really embodied all that knowledge and um, just gone on a very, very deep journey. And, and I was right with you and, and it was such a revelation to, I could really picture everything, you know, where, where you were and um, the culture. So I really want to honor all that research you did into the material culture so far as we can understand it but you made it so vivid and um it's just an astonishing piece of work to be taken into that place and it was very very moving very very powerful piece of writing and I'm going to get the book and read it I've read the flowering wand which is wonderful but yeah, just great work. It's it's amazing what you're doing. Um, and thank you for this, what you're contributing actually to 
the evolution of the new human. It's really important work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Yeah. I have to run because my, the place where I'm sitting is now 100 degrees. That's the climate change. <laughs> um, but please stay in touch. My email is open. I love to remain in conversation with people. And thank you for holding me so generously today. Thank you. Yeah. No, bless you, Sophie. And can I just say, as you go, we heard you say you have an incurable genetic illness. And I'm, I mean, I don't know quite what that means. If that means you're not going to be with us forever, I'm very mortified. No. I, I, mean, I, as of right now, there's, there's a diagnosis. I'm very, one of the reasons why I was interested in Jesus is I'm interested in healing and how it's bigger than we think it is within our material reductionist frame. So I'm interested in side doors, in spontaneous remissions, in things happening that we have no explanation for, that there's a diagnosis. And sometimes I, I'm trying to live in the opposite direction, that I can go and look at it, and then I can live in an opposite direction. So I fully plan on being here for a long time. OK, good. Well, I'm going to I'm going to suggest we. we I, pardon yeah. me. May I just add something? Uh, sure. They gave me the death knell of ovarian cancer in 2003. And so the tiller, the physicist calls it the unified focus conscious field of intent. And that was the power of prayer. I called in all my chums. So three weeks later when I could walk, because the surgeon gave me the death knell of ovarian cancer, um, I called in my, my chums, the power of prayer. We declared it. Three weeks later when I walked in the oncologist's office, I said, give it to me straight because I'm going to handle it my way, own way. He said, ma'am, there is nothing there. I said, thank you very much. I got up and left. So that is <laughs> my testimony of the power well, of unified, focused, conscious intent. That feel we I create, agree. we manifest. You got it, girl. Thank Woo! you, everyone. <laughs> Okay, I let's finish. Sophie, um, just wait, stick around for one minute before we He's gonna blow up, Thomas. He's hand over to James. No, no, no. Let's spend one minute silence sending Sophie our love and healing energy. Okay. Perfect. Then... Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Right, thanks everyone for that. And bless you, Sophie. And if you're part of a healing circle, send Sophie your love in that process. You're a beautiful, shiny being, Sophie. You, all of you too, this has been very special. Thank you, everyone. Right, God bless. Right, now we have our next speaker who is, um, who's done more work as far as I can figure on the, the real genealogy of uh, Mary Magdalene and Yeshua than anyone I have come across. He was a pastor, he's been a writer, a teacher, and he is the male equivalent of Sophie in terms of his passionate commitment to all this stuff. Um, so we're very honored to have James with us, joining us from Panama, I believe. Um, you're not too far from Ginger, who's joining us from Ecuador, so you're-, you're Oh, kind of... sa saludos Ecuador, <laughs> de sus vecinos al norte. <laughs> She doesn't speak Spanish, I don't think, but she's oh, living yeah. there. Yeah. 
Escucho sí. siempre sí. la sí. oportunidad sí. de hablar en español. Un poquito, para oh, eso. Muy bueno, Ginger, sí. muy Gracias. bueno. <laughs> chao, chao. So, so anyway, um, yes, we're honored to have James with us, who's in the middle of a whole stream of research, and I've come across it, um, and it's very interesting what he's found out. Um, and he's uh, the title of his talk today is The Historical Mary Magdalene, as described in overlooked early manuscripts, especially in Aramaic. And, um, you know, this is important stuff. Um, he's, he's working at the coalface, so to say. So thank you um, for joining us. And he has warned me that the electricity is not always, you know, um, obedient to the will. So if he vanishes for a bit, we'll hold the space and he can rejoin. But I hope that it works, James, and the current lets you share your talk with us today. Yes, the so, current issue, I think. Great. Okay, so welcome. Over to you, and uh, the floor is yours, sir. All right. Oh, well, thank you. I'll have to sweep it and mop it, I'm sure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thomas, for the invitation and your interest. Uh, I should say as a sidelight, I'm also a novelist. That's actually how, I, how I'm better known in the world. And I'll say in defense of novelists, including Sophie, that often we can get more real truth into fiction than we can into nonfiction because people suspend their disbelief when they read fiction. So that's <clears throat> part of what got me into this. Uh, I hope by this discourse to summarize extremely briefly the findings that I've been reaching for the next edition of the book. It's the third and final edition. Don't tell the publisher I said this, but the current edition, which is in two volumes, is the second edition. This uh, next edition, which the publisher wants you to get rather, rather than the two, will be in approximately nine volumes, more than 5,000 pages. It's up to them how many volumes, I can't tell you exactly. Uh, the uh, I'm working literally more than 12 hours a day, seven days a week to try to get this in the final edits for publication. I'm only two and a half years behind the, the drop dead date for the publisher, so no problem. Now, um, there's obviously a great deal of ground to cover. I only have an hour to do it in. So I estimate that if I cover about 90 pages a minute, I should be pretty close to an hour. And I realize also that some of my conclusions will be surprising, possibly even shocking, but I assure you that while I have to leave it out in a brief hours discourse, uh, they are all extremely well supported in the book as well as one can manage to do 2,000 years after the fact, and given the fragmentary condition of much of the manuscripts that I work with, also the rarity of the languages. Uh, one language I specialize in, as Thomas mentioned, is Galilean Aramaic. Now, this is the dialect of Aramaic that Jesus actually spoke. And there are exactly, other than me, zero people in the world who have come to grips with the Galilean dialect of, Ara of Aramaic. Those few people who know Aramaic at all in the scholarly field are familiar with Syriac, which came into being and became popularized only about three or four centuries after Jesus. And the, di the, the vocabulary is different, the grammar is different, everything about it is different. And I've had uh, friendly arguments with Syriac scholars who think that my readings of these texts are in error. And I have to keep pointing out to them, these are different dialects. This is like, uh, for example, my North American English as opposed to your British English, Thomas, or the Spanish that I speak, the Spanish here in Panama as opposed to that in Spain, or the Portuguese of, of Portugal as compared to that in Brazil. It's vastly different, and we have to keep that in mind. To uh, introduce myself very briefly, when I retired from university teaching, I first went to live in the south of France in Occitania, between Le Fousseré and Cazère in the Haute Pyrénées. I've also briefly resided in England and Wales, but for more than 12 years now, I have lived in Paso Ancho in the exquisitely beautiful mountains in the west of Panama. And I'll say that only eight degrees north of the equator, it's rather chilly here. <laughs> we're, we're where all your, your cold has gone. Uh, 
I have been involved now for more than half a century in a study of the origins of the scriptures, Jewish scripture, Christian scripture, Muslim scripture as well, which appertains very much to the story. I work every day with texts in Greek, Latin, Aramaic, Hebrew, Coptic, Georgian, Tamazight, Occitan, Old Irish, Old Welsh, and others. My goal is to establish a reasonable hypothesis of the intended Ur text, original text of the Gospel of John, as its author evidently never was able to complete. The text that is emerging is, to put it mildly, astonishingly different from the familiar Greek text, the Textus Receptus, that is the basis of all of your modern translations that you are familiar with. The, uh, as I, my process is to remove, as it were, surgically interpolations, exc restore excisions, and also restore the original interpretations of passages that were deliberately battered out of shape by later ecclesiastical dogma. The work, as I mentioned, began about half a century ago. I was in a university library. I happened to be reading Jacques-Étienne Ménard's pioneering translation of the Gospel of Philip, L'Évangile de Philippe, uh, with his insightful commentaries. And I got to the passage that suggested that Jesus and Mary were a couple. And to quote him in French, l'embrassé souvent sur la bouche, that he kissed her often on the mouth, and in that moment of shocked realization about a relationship between Jesus and Mary, I confess that I shouted out in a university library, I shouted out loud, they are lying to us. And that moment put me on the track that I am still pursuing today. So that's a little bit of background. Mary's name, uh, it, her first name, her personal name is traditionally explained as originating in the name Miriam that Naomi in the book of Ruth, chapter one, verse 13, uh, took meaning bitter. Uh, Naomi's name itself means safe, sweet or pleasant. So it's a switch of flavors, you could say. Uh, Naomi was weeping bitter tears, tears like the drops of myrrh from the tree for the death of her sons and her husband. But its actual origin lies elsewhere, namely in Egypt. Miriam is actually a corruption into Hebrew of Mary Amin, beloved Amin in the ancient Egyptian language. And let me pause here because I need a grandchild to do electronic things. And so I'm not too swift about it. Let's see here. I need to uh, find it here. Where did I put it? Ah, here we are. There we go. Okay. Let me okay. get down. And so uh, now I need to move my screen so I can see my notes. There we go. Can, can you all see that there? Yeah, we can see. All right. Is it, do I need to blow it up or anything? Or is it is it okay like this? That's best. Yeah, we can. No, the other way was better. We could see the whole list. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. That's so, it. Go for yeah, it. Okay. Yeah, just trying to figure out how I can uh, share a screen so I can see the notes on my comments here. Can I can I move it over a little bit just so I can see? Let me. Uh, I didn't realize you can see the you see my whole screen. I guess. I really need. Yeah. A brand. All right, and let me move that up a little bit. And then there is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. There we go. All right. So there we go. Now where was I in my notes? So I. Uh, you now the the name Miriam in Hebrew comes from Mary Amen, as I says as I suggested to you. But the name Mary uh, Maria in her native Aramaic is not related. It's just homophonous with the name Miriam. And so there's been a lot of confusion thereafter. In the gospel texts in the Galilean Aramaic, Jesus's mother is consistently called Miriam, which is that Hebrew name coming from the Egyptian, Mary Amen, beloved Amen. Uh, in an Aramaic, uh, uh, Mary was called Mary or Maria. You can see that there the, uh, in the Aramaic, M-R-Y-A are the letters reading right to left, of course. And this, this is related to Mari in Egypt, and you see the hieroglyphic for that. But it actually comes from Kushite, which was a language of southeastern Africa, more or less where Ethiopia is today. And you see... The written in the Kushit letters, and it's Meroe. 
That is her name. And I'll be getting to this a little later, but it's from her paternal ancestry, which was from the country, which is probably best known as Sheba. And uh, th this is what's interesting. While the, it was a name in Northeastern Africa, it was in the Very Middle strange. East and Europe, not known as a name until Mary Magdalene became famous and people were named for Mary. Tal Ilan, a wonderful Jewish scholar, she's put together an exhaustive multi-volume lexicon of, Jew of Jewish names. She studies all sorts of documents and she catalogs not a single incident of a woman named Maria in that region of the world until the early second century in the, in the common era. And that obviously results from a popularization of Mary Magdalene. And uh, Francois Beauvon, the French scholar, he reaches the same conclusion. So I have to emphasize that the name we know in English is Mary and French is Marie and Italian is Maria, uh, apparently did not exist before Mary Magdalene. It's said to be the most popular woman's name today or close to that. And it all comes from Mary the Magdalene. And uh, I must emphasize that it is not the same name as Jesus' mother has, and the meaning is different. Now, if you'll pardon me if I, so again, struggle with the electronics to go back a little bit. Well, maybe I'll leave that on the screen because I want to talk about Magdalene too. The, the name Magdalene is essentially a synoptic name. That is to say, it essentially appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It appears thrice in the Gospel of John and in all three of those by the Galilean Aramaic texts, the appearance of the name cognomen Magdalene is doubtful. The English Magdalene and the French Madeleine is based on a garble into Greek of her name in Aramaic. And I think you can see that, can you Thomas, that down below here, the uh, derivation of Magdalene, is that showing? Yeah, it's showing that, yeah. Okay, okay, wonderful. Mintilata. Okay, you can see Magdalete in the Greek, with a with Magdalene, excuse me, in the Greek with an N as the penultimate letter, nu in Greek. But if you look just below, you see the Aramaic reading right to left again, and you see MGDLYT, that thing that looks like a, a wheelchair second to the left, that's a T or tau in Aramaic, and it's in the place of N in Greek. But if you look a little below, you see the Tamazik way of writing Mary's name. Tamazik is the language which is best known today in uh, across the band of North Africa, north of the Sahara and into the Sahara, the Berber, the, the uh, Tuareg, uh, the Siwi people in, in Northwestern Egypt speak the Tamazik language. They are all of the Amazigh heritage. And that name is Tamagdalt. And that's, that's the origin of her name coming from her father's family. I'll be saying more about that later. Okay, let me close uh, my screen. I like here. those alphabet shapes. Yeah. I, I, I'm as people can gather. I'm, I'm uh, something of a linguist, so I, you have to put up with this kind of linguistic background. Now, how do I find my way back to? Oh heavens, with Betsy, I really need a grandchild. Print screen button on your computer. Uh, is it here? No, oh, I guess. If I do that, huh, I, I'm stupefied. Are you trying to move on to the next slide, so to speak? No, I, no, I was trying to go back to me for a moment. That's just like put on your screen the, the thing you want to be sharing. You just want to say well, stop I, sharing where it yeah. says screen share, stop yeah, sharing. But I, yeah, I'm trying to find that. I, that. Yeah, I know that's what I'm supposed to do, but I can't seem to find it. I think it's underneath your screen at the bottom. Uh, yeah, I know, but it's not. <laughs> Let me see if I move this up a little bit. I apologize, people, for my... I, I live in the first century. I'm not part of this yeah. century whatsoever. If you move your cursor around on the on the screen, yeah, no, yeah, it'll no, turn no. up the stop. Yeah, I hope so, but it's not so far. Okay. It may be at the top. Stop oh, yes. sharing. Oh, there we go. Stop sharing. Yes, it's at the top. I was looking at the bottom. Okay. All right. You're stuck with my face once again. <laughs> All right. Okay. Now, uh, where in the world was it? Okay. I wanted that uh, from talking about her name 
Mary as coming from northeastern Africa, and the cognomen Magdalene as coming from northeast Africa. That brings me into a further discussion of her ancestry. I, uh, I wanted to say a little bit about the cognomen Magdalene. The common scholarly assumption is that it means she's from Magdala. There, archaeologically, there is virtually no evidence that there was any village where Magdala is located today at the time of Mary's life. And if it existed, it was called Tarikea. It was not called Magdala. It was later in time that it was called Magdala. So that is very unlikely to be the derivation of the name Magdalene. There is even less, exactly nothing, in the early Christian texts to associate the woman with that village. It's simply a guess they make because these people don't know the Northeastern African languages. Why scholars of European ancestry don't know Northeastern African languages is simply beyond my comprehension. Am I suggesting implicit racism of scholarly community? Yes, I am. Moving along, uh, they, it's also suggested uh, that it refers to tower, but there's nothing to follow up on that. So for me, the most likely possibility of the derivation of Magdalita with the T is as follows. I follow the great 10th century lexicographer Hassan Barbalul. This, this guy was a scientist to beat the dilates out of anybody else. A brilliant, brilliant man, Barbalul. And he pointed out that Magdalita in Aramaic means the braided or plated one. And, it, and with a declension, it means a woman who has braided or plated hair. Now, that is a big clue because that is the significant characteristic of someone who has taken the vows of the Nutzrim, or usually in English, the Nazarites. For those of you who, who want to look up detail on this, go to the Book of Numbers in the, in the Torah, chapter 6, and you can read about the Nutzrim. They never cut their hair, but what they did is as their hair grew long, they braided it or plaited it and then wound it around their heads in the form of a crown. And the word for crown in Galilean Aramaic is Nazar. And this that she was that her hair braided that she was a megdalita is a sign that she like jesus had taken the vows of the Nazarene, the nazarites now rabbi burton l vazatsky suggests also a, an interesting derivation which i think may also be possible as a double entendre he suggests that it comes from megadla nishaya which means raised up above all other women uh, which fits with another epithet that she's also called in early Christian texts. And finally, the uh, many times in ancient literature that Mary Magdalene is compared to a pearl, and it's very, what's interesting here is, while we, in English, we call it a pearl, and you know, Thomas, I'm sure you speak French, it's Madeleine in French, and Madeleine comes from the Greek Madeleine, and Madeleine in Greek was taken from the Aramaic Madeleine. And so, so they have here a possibility that the word Magdalene is derived from the Greek and Aramaic word for pearl. Why do I mention this? Uh, because I'm sure some of you are familiar with the anonymous hymn of the pearl that was copied into the Acts of Thomas, probably written in the late first century. Ephraim the Syrian, one of the greatest poets and greatest theologians of history, his famous hymns on the pearl, which are part of his hymns on faith. The the lengthy poem Pearl, which is by the same individual who wrote the famous poem Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. All of these works of exquisite beauty and profundity unabashedly depict Mary Magdalene as a pearl, as a Magdalene, and as wedded to Jesus. And that is why Magdalena, I think, could be another possibility of the origin of her cognomen. But the one that I personally think is best is if she was indeed half of Amazigh ancestry. In the Amazigh, Tamazigh language of North Africa, Ag Amagdelet, which you saw on your screen, means she who protects. And there is nobody who did more than Mary in the years after the resurrection to protect and publish the teachings of Jesus. So that brings me to discussing her ancestry. If, as I assume, the Mary who anoints Jesus is the Mary who lived at Beit Enya, or in English, Bethany, 
Then she is the sister of Judah, or Judah in Hebrew, son of Shimon Iscariot. And Iscariot does not mean man of man from Cariath, as the as the Euro American scholars suggest. That's a village far to the south of Judah, but rather it's Ish Sharat, which means a man with leprosy. And this fellow happens to be mentioned rather often in the Talmud. That his name is Shimon ben Natanael, Simon of Simon, son of Nathaniel, also called Simon the leper, which is Ish Sharat who studied with the noted Yohanan ben Zakai, who is a temple priest. And, a, and he's mentioned a handful of times as a resource, as a scholar in the Talmud. The Tosefta of Oda Zara at 310 tells us about the marriage of Simon to the mother of Mary Magdalene, uh, it, which is very interesting because what it tells us is their marriage was not a happy one. The name of the mother of Mary Magdalene does not survive in the text so, so far as I have been able to find, but by process of elimination, I believe that she was Shalomit, or in English, Salome. That, of course, is related to the word Shalom, meaning peace. The Gospel of Mark, for example, mentions the women at the cross in 1540 and at the tomb in 1601 in this order. First, and, and order is important, I should add, the most important person is mentioned first. And Mary Magdalene is mentioned first, then his mother Mary, and then with no stated relationship, Shalomit, Salome. But if no identifier was deemed necessary by John Mark, the author of the Gospel of Mark, then he assumed that the reader of the Gospel would know immediately who she was without any explanation added. So this suggests that Salome is on an order of importance with Mary the Magdalene and Mary the mother. If this is so, then Mary is a then uh, Mary, daughter of Shelomit, daughter of Simon the leper, is from an extremely important family identified in the Talmud. She is on her maternal side the great granddaughter of no less than Gamaliel the first, who you may remember was mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles, defending the earliest followers of Jesus's teachings. And she would then be the great, great, great granddaughter of Hillel. For those of you not familiar with Jewish history, Gamaliel and Hillel are generally acknowledged as the greatest, most important rabbis, teachers of the Jewish faith ever, period. This family was descended from the Davidic royal line, which makes Mary part of that royal heritage. Her father, on the other hand, Simon the leper, was apparently brother of Joseph Caiaphas. Chia the name Caiaphas signifies, uh, it signifies someone who was from Sheba. They were of the Amazigh heritage, most immediately coming from Cyprus, but with roots in the country now known in English as Sheba. The uh, famous queen of Sheba, for those of you who want to refresh their memory, uh, her name is actually given to us in the Kebra Nagast, the great epic poem of Ethiopia as, as uh, um, Makeda. And so, so her father, Simon the leper, uh, was evidently descended from the Sheban royal line, which includes not only Queen Makeda, but her husband, Solomon. So that is on her father's side also, and uh, a heritage that goes back to two royal lines, that of Israel, as well as that of Sheba. Now, um, Caiaphas' name, as I mentioned, Kaifa in Galilean Aramaic, is another name for the country we call Sheba today. Uh, Joseph Caiaphas was also known as Joseph Bar Shabbos. And Shabbos, you can hear that Sheba speaks for itself. I hardly need to say any more. So you have Mary coming from two royal lines, <clears throat> descendant of a highly respected Judean family. And in a day when women were not taught, she was extremely well educated in several languages and in Torah studies by her great grandfather Gamaliel. The Gospel of John frequently or quotes or paraphrases the Song of Songs, the, sh the sh Shirim Hashirim, the Song of Songs in which the lovers are modeled on King Solomon and Queen Megiddo of Sheba. And the latter is described in verse 
0.15 as black and beautiful. And I'm going to have to note, we have another problem here with your American scholars who translate this all the time as black, but beautiful. I'm here to tell you that the Hebrew prefixed conjunction, wa, does not mean but. It means and. And if somebody translates this text as I am black, but beautiful, they are guilty of racism. I'm being blunt about this because it disgusts me. The Hebrew clearly means I am black and beautiful. So once again, we have to be very careful with our sources. I cannot emphasize this enough. The amount of times I have found sloppy translations as the standard translation quoted in scholarly works is going beyond the pale. I am just simply offended. This is why I have to translate everything by myself for myself because I don't trust these translated uh, published translations. Mary is also one of the few people in the gospels for whom we have a physical description. She was depicted especially as favoring her Sheban ancestors. And the description is a typical description of someone of Amazigh ancestry, Berber or, or uh, Tuareg, as having very dark skin with red hair and blue eyes. This unusual combination of characteristics is associated with the north and northeast of Africa. So she evidently favored physically her, her uh, paternal ancestors. Yet on the Judean side also, David and Solomon, if you read the Hebrew with care, were also of this kind of complexion and eye color. Zipporah, the wife of Moses, and Ruth, amongst others, are pictured in the same way. We also have today a skull preserved in Maximin de la Sainte Baume in France, southeastern France, which is venerated as Mary's, and we it may possibly be just that. I know two of the uh, the two archaeogeneticists who are working on the haplography of this skull and hair, uh, and I communicate bo with both of them rather regularly. One of them, Gérard Lucotte, concludes, and I'm going to quote Gérard, that the skull belongs to the K1A1B1 subclad of K, which he says is a genetic signature of Jewry. So the result we obtain sustains her Jewish ancestry on her mother's side. But if any of you are familiar with, with uh, genetics, you know that micro mitochondrial DNA only reflects the genetic heritage of the mother. It does not reflect that of the father. So the skull in Maximana de saint Bom is definitely on the maternal side, a Jewish person, a Jewish woman. But as to the father's side, we know nothing from Lucas studies. The other scholar, I can't name him yet at his request because he wants to hold off until he publishes, uh, is working on the father's ancestry. And he tells me that it does look that this skull suggests a North African heritage. Lucotte also concludes that the subject, the skull, was born in about the year three, which coheres perfectly with the textual evidence uh, by which we can estimate the year of Mary Magdalene's birth. The skull's Sub, the skull's hair is reddish gray. And here's the interesting. Let me see if I can manage the electronics once again. Hold, hold on, folks. Uh, to get to her hair. There we go. If you, if you can see there, uh, what's lettered with the letter H in an ochre circle, that's her hair. And you will notice that it's plated and it's wound around the skull. This is looking down from above on the top of the skull in Maximin de la saint -Bome. We can't see it as yet. Um, can oh, you share I'm... the screen, James? Yeah, let me, let me try it again. I, 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 I really should have found a grandchild for this. <laughs> uh, let's see, it's time to go here and do that. Share screen, share. There we are, that's happening. Okay, share, okay. I feel like singing when I say share. <laughs> Okay, so uh, do you see my uh, my 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 pointer? We do, yes. Okay, this this circle I'm circling around with the letter H in the ochre circle. That's the hair of the skull in Saint Bom, and as you can see, it's plated, it's braided. This is a braid that has been braided around the skull. This, once again, it is what I'm emphasizing is something that tells us that Mary was 
someone who had taken the vows of the Nazarene, the Nazarites, and that this is the Nazar, as it's called in Hebrew, in Galilean Aramaic, the uh, crown in, in that language that signifies someone who has taken this vow. Several of the early church fathers, including Pseudo Hippolytus, who was probably Melito, Oregon, and Ephraim the Syrian, describe her as a black Ethiopian. So to Hippolytus, for example, in his commentary, The Song of Songs, a lovely passage here, uh, has this quotation, a black woman am I, and a beautiful one, notice the and, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not look at me, for I am black, not because the sun looked at me, I am black and beautiful, not because I am a sinner, but because the Messiah loved and kissed me. Oregon, in his own commentary in the Song of Songs, uh, has Mary say the following, I am that Ethiopian. I am indeed black as a result of the, of the ignobility of my ancestry, but I am beautiful through the penitence and faith. <clears throat> For I have taken to myself the Son of God. I have received the word made flesh. I have come to him who is the image of God, the firstborn of every creature, and who is the splendor and glory and the form of the substance of God, and thus I have been made fair. Ephraim the Syrian, in those aforementioned hymns on the pearl, says this about the Magdalene. The Cushite woman, the black woman, she was the pearl who came to him, to the sun, when he ascended to his father, the radiant diadem from Cush. Moving on to Mary's marriage. There is some scant evidence that suggests that Mary and Jesus knew each other in childhood, especially since both evidently studied, as I mentioned with Rabbi Gamaliel. But evidently as they approached adulthood, <clears throat> they drifted apart and it was through the auspices of John the Immerser, I prefer to say Immerser than Baptist. The word Baptist means nothing in English. So I translate the word, John the Immerser. So under the auspices of John the Immerser acting as a moil, a betrothal was arranged between Jesus and Mary. I like to refer to them as one of the world's first power couples, if ever there was one. Uh, Jesus, his father was Samaritan. Samaritan heritage is, is inherited through the father. And Jesus's mother was Judean. And Judean heritage, Jewish heritage, is inherited through the mother. So Jesus was legitimately a Samaritan and a Judean, accepted fully in both communities as such. <clears throat> He also was from Galilee, which brings in the Galilean tradition. Mary, as I've already suggested to you, on her mother's side, a Judean, on her father's side, Amazigh, Sheban, and she also was a priestess in the Melchizedekian order in Samaria. And so she brings together all of these heritage into one person. So when those two people combine, you have what I call a power couple. Ephraim the Syrian confirms this as regards the immersion. Of necessity, Jesus sent word that Mary might recognize him, Jesus, at his arrival, that is, at his arrival for the immersion, that I must prepare the way for her to come and to betroth the bride until he should come, that she might be ready to be given to him in the water. This arranged betrothal was confirmed by the couple themselves at the time they were immersed by John the Immerser in the Wadi Karith, which is close to the Jordan River itself, and now in, today in the country of, of Jordan, and a fascinating place to visit. It's a beautiful place. This event also invested the, the couple into the Order of Melchizedek, succeeding John the Immerser. The Order of Melchizedek, just quickly, is associated with Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 6, if memory serves, but it actually traditionally began with Adam. It is the oldest priesthood according to this Israelite heritage, beginning with Adam, and it continued unbroken to the time of John the Immerser, and from John the Immerser, it was bequeathed to Jesus and Mary. Now, the, in the third step in their marriage, uh, beginning the, long, the year in which they were married, uh, was the celebration thereof. So, uh, I'm sorry, the second step, I left out the second step, shame on me. The second step was the uh, was the uh, consummation of their marriage in sexual terms. This took place in Samaria, and you can read about it in John chapter four, Jesus and the woman, quote unquote, the woman at the well. Actually, the word means spring. 
and the spring has been located. Again, a very interesting place to visit. And that spring happens to be exactly on the grounds of the palace temple of Melchizedek mentioned in Genesis 6. And uh, Jesus and Mary at this scene consummated their marriage. The Aramaic makes this abundantly clear, but it's sanitized in the Greek. And then the third step that I, I accidentally jumped to, the third step is the public celebration of the marriage held in Cana of Galilee, John chapter 2. Now, reading the Gospel of John in the Galilean Aramaic reveals first that the so-called beloved disciple, who is said to be the eyewitness to much of the Gospel, is Mary Magdalene by the feminine declensions. The tradition is to say it is John, the young son of Zebedee, brother of James, son of Zebedee, but that's baloney. The feminine declensions in this earliest text that we have of the Gospel of John in Galilean Aramaic has the word disciple as Talmidia. If you are a male disciple, you're called Talmida. But if you're of the female persuasion, you are called Talmidia. And the difference is obvious. That tells us that the beloved disciple is a woman and the only woman who is called a disciple in the gospel. So by logic alone, Mary has to be the eyewitness source for the scenes in the gospel of John where there's no one else present. For instance, the spring in Samaria in chapter four of John, and also the morning of the resurrection. Nobody else present, just Jesus and Mary. <coughs> and and, and uh, she appears prominently in many more gospel scenes in the Galilean Aramaic than the familiar Greek text suggests, but these were evidently edited out by the same organized religion that would eventually demote her to the status of a penitent prostitute. I have found in my study of these early manuscripts uh, what amounts to an entire chapter cut out of the Gospel of John at the end of chapter 9, most likely deliberately. And it, it describes how Mary Magdalene was heroic in saving the life of an ad adolescent boy from being forcibly detained by the temple guard under the command of Annas. This was a woman of chutzpah, you could say. She's also shown in the Galilean Aramaic entering Jesus, entering Jerusalem side by side with Jesus on Palm Sunday, except it actually was a Saturday. Also in the Galilean Aramaic at the Last Supper, Jesus pr promises to the male disciples that when he's dead, she will be the paraclete, the paraclete in Greek, who will serve after him as their teacher and guide, reminding them of everything that he taught them. And when Jesus is arrested, she again shows bravery, barely avoiding arrest herself as she follows the arrest party, bringing Jesus to be examined by the high priests and Pontius Pilate. She is equally prominent as Jesus in these final chapters of the gospel, but her role is significantly diminished in the Greek version. She is part of the examination before Pilate, the Greek Gospels say uh, two thieves were tortured on either side of Jesus, but their existence results only from a translating error from Aramaic into Greek. And the original Gospel drafts of in Aramaic by John the Presbyter indicate that uh, those who were tied to posts on either side of Jesus crucified were the two Marys, mother and wife, forced, to, by, forced by the Romans to watch every moment of the horrible torture that was being uh, executed against uh, son and husband of the two Marys. Beside, uh, let me just move my screen. If, I, if you managed to deal without the lower half of my face, I can see my screen better. Uh, uh, where am I here? Mary took, uh, you, you were mentioning Sophie uh, and Thomas about uh, drugs. Mary and Jesus both took a coma-inducing entheogen which was uh, used uh, both for hallucinogenic effects and also to put people into comas. Uh, this was part of the mitigation of the crucifixion as it was planned. May, uh, Jesus, however, was lanced by one of the soldiers as a mercy killing, but that renders him dead, completely dead, DOA on arrival, clinically dead, he's gone. So his body is put into the tomb next to Jesus, next to Mary, who's in a coma from the entheogen. And in those days, to be in a coma was effectively to be considered dead. Uh, here I have found another passage, which amounts to just about a chapter of text that was lost. 
which describes what occurred within the tomb during the three days and nights that Mary and Jesus are in there together. And it describes Mary in the pitch darkness inside the tomb in the company of the two angels beside the dead body of her husband. In the morning of resurrection, apparently, miraculously, Jesus briefly regains consciousness. And this is important. He breathes his breath or spirit into Mary Magdalene before he expires this time permanently. Some of you may know the word in Greek for the word in Greek noima, which means both breath and spirit. In Hebrew and Aramaic, it has the same connotation, double connotation, ruach. Ruach or ruachaka in Aramaic means both breath and spirit. Jesus breathes into Mary his breath, his spirit, and then expires. His body is deposited through the dung gate at the south end of the, of the uh, Temple Mount into the Valley of Genom. And the Valley of Genom is where the bodies of the poor and indigent were thrown. Bear, Jesus, in this way, identifies with the least of these among us. And here again, another page of the original manuscript has mysteriously disappeared. This one I wasn't able to find in one piece. I've had to put it, patch it together from a number of early sources. By the way, any of these passages that I'm talking about, if later in the comments period, people want to hear them read, I'll, I'll read some of these to you if you like. Uh, this page that I pieced together, uh, Mary puts on the traditional white vestments of the Melchizedekian high priest, uh, which were put on Jesus before he was brought out to show to the people outside by Pilate. Uh, is the, the same vestments that the soldiers were gambling for, the same vestments that were put on the shelf in the first uh, cubicle of the tomb. And it's these vestments that Mary puts on such that when the women come to the tomb to anoint Jesus's body, they find uh, what's called a, a neoniscos, a, a youth sitting there dressed in these glorious white vestments and speaking to them about, tell the male disciples that that the Messiah will meet with them in Galilee. The women are scared, witless, they run away. And so, because obviously she's lost that method of communication, Mary comes the same evening of the resurrection in the same priestly vestments to meet with the male disciples herself, presenting herself as the Messiah, Jesus and Mary, united in the image and likeness of Elohim. And here I have to do a little bit of theology. Some of you may be familiar with Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. In Genesis 1, the name of God is Elohim. This is the northern kingdom of, of Israel's name for God, the name that was used traditionally in Samaria and Galilee. And Elohim is itself an interesting name. It, the singular is Eloah, which is a feminine noun. And the suffix im is a male suffix, masculine suffix. So you have a feminine noun with a masculine suffix. I'm sure uh, folks can realize that that's not something that's usually done in languages. You don't usually mix up your, your genders like that. But this tells us that Elohim is masculine and feminine as one. So in Genesis 1, 26, 27, when Elohim says to itself, let us, to male and female, let us make the human in our own image, which is a masculine noun, and likeness, which is a feminine noun. And then it proceeds to do so, it creates the first human being as androgynous, as both male and female as one. And my understanding from reading these texts is that Jesus's plan was that Jesus and Mary would be not only a married couple, but that they would actually become one again in the image and likeness of Elohim to show all of us how to do the same, how through love, through uniting with our spouses at the very least, but with those around us, other people, other living beings, we can become one in the image and likeness of God. And by that means, we recover not everlasting life, but eternal life in the paradise that was prepared for us. So, in pausing the story of Mary's life at the point that the gospel tells us no more about it, but there is more to tell. Uh, the standard formulation of the Trinity is one of the greatest blocks to healthy interfaith dialogue 
between, for example, Christianity and Judaism or Islam. There is no greater block than this dogma of the Trinity and the closely related dogmas of incarnation and penal substitutionary atonement. I've got countless pages in the book following the history of how these dogmas were hammered together over several generations, debates, battles back and forth, only reaching the form in which we know them today, centuries after the life of Jesus, and then superimposed by fiat on the gospel texts, but they're not really there. I must perforce leave out the detail and say that anyone who claims to see mention of the Trinity in the Bible is either reading a very late Greek text or fooling her himself. The only one of real interest is Matthew 28, 19, at the very end of the Gospel of Matthew, uh, in which uh, Jesus supposedly sends people out to baptize everyone in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the Galilean Aramaic, and also in the, the Hebrew early Hebrew text of Matthew, the Shem Tob text, uh, this text is very different. Cyril of Jerusalem also has something quite different at, when he quotes Matthew 28, 19. So all of this tells us that Matthew 28, 19, with this apparent reference to the, to the Trinity, is a late interpolation into the Gospel of Matthew. So uh, uh, what I find instead, and I'm going to have to do the grandchild thing once again. Where did I put Zoom? Hold on here. Uh, where, oh, am I here? Okay, so I can close that. Now I need to. All right. Am I? Yes, I am. Okay. And now share skein once again. Sorry to share the top of my head, which is not arranged in the Nazar of the Nuts Ream. Uh, share screen. And I want to go to. Hold on here. I apologize for my inabilities. There we go. Can you see that there? Uh, no, not yet. Nobody's saying they can see it. Let me uh, go back here. Share. All right. So you can see that there? Yes? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes, thank you. you. Can see it. Okay. Okay. That this is the origin behind what we now call the Trinity, not the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, but the Father Elohim, who is, because in Aramaic, like many other languages, uh, male is the default. The masculine is the default gender. So father me really means just as much mother. So in the name of God, who is male and female is one, that's comprised in number one, you see there, in this. But and then the second part is in the name of uh, the child of the father, who is uh, who is androgynous, and the holy breath spirit within that child, which is the mixed breath of Jesus and Mary. So if you Follow that. I can go back. Uh, let me. Uh, oh, I'm so bad at these things. I'm really visiting you from another century here. Let me. If I can get back there. Oh, it's oh, it's up here. I forgot where I put it. Okay. You got this. Oh, I did it. good. Okay. You got Boy, I'll, it. <laughs> I'll be a pro one of these days. Uh, shoot me before I suffer. Okay. So now the the origin of the Trinity that you see there is in that concept that I'm trying to relate with you. So the obvious sense is that one God comprising masculine and feminine is equivalent to two, which is Jesus and Mary. Uh, so, so that G God, Elohim is male and female is one, and then two, Jesus and Mary as one. And since two, Jesus and Mary is ultimately a reflection of the, of the uh, likeness uh, of number one, what we ultimately have is a oneness. So as John the Presbyter, who's the author of the Gospel of John, taught us in his first canonical letter, chapters four and five, God is love. Not that God loves as a verb, but is love as a noun. Therefore, when we love, we invoke God. We become one not only with each other, but also with God. And so the presbyter says in explanation, anyone who says he or she loves God, but hates his or her neighbor doesn't know God. We, if to the first, the two commandments that Jesus cites, love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, love your, your beloved one to translate literally as yourself is basically saying everything I'm saying to love God is the same as loving your, your spouse, your husband or wife, your neighbor, your friend, your coworker as yourself, not 
the same way you love yourself, but to love them as yourself because you're one, because through the power of love, you have become one. When we love, therefore, we invoke God. We become one not only with each other, but also with God. But the organized Christian religion is founded far more on the teachings of Paul of Tarsus than on those of Jesus. Paul of Tarsus never clapped eyes on Jesus once. And Paul pretty clearly treated women as secondary to men. And he also clearly had a personal odium for Mary Magdalene. If you read the genuine letters, especially Colossians is the worst. Uh, he's, con he's constantly criticizing Mary Magdalene. Uh, he's accusing her of all sorts of horrible things. In 2 Corinthians, Paul even accuses her of being a necrophiliac, that while she was in the tomb, she was supposedly lusting for the dead body of Jesus lying next to her. It's just disgusting. And that's the fellow on which we have founded the Christian religion. Uh, Paul felt he was the proper successor to Jesus's mantle, and he was the only one who really understood Jesus. And so he took every opportunity he could to throw Mary to the wayside. So in the Pauline religion, that for all practical purposes is dominant in nearly all of organized Christianity, we have that trinity. We have that penal substitutionary atonement. We have that incarnation, Father, Son, and a masculine Holy Spirit. This is a fascinating little point. I mentioned that the word in Aramaic for spirit or breath, rucha, and it was and still is a feminine noun. But here's what gets interesting. By fiat, in the texts of the early Western Christian religion, it was ordered changed to a masculine noun. Why? To get the stench of femininity out of the trinity that they were developing. But it survived in some places, especially beyond the, the big cities and the reach of dogmatic, dogmatic bishops and inquisitioners. The standard Latin formula for, the, for baptism, as some of you, if you're from a Roman Catholic background, you may know, baptizo te in nomine patris et filii et spiritus santus. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But this original configuration that I'm trying to uh, share with you is quite different. We find, for example, in the year 748, Pope Zacharias got an emergency letter from Boniface, the Archbishop of Mentz, in, which is now in Germany, uh, asking bon uh, Zacharias, the Pope, how to manage a local parish priest in Bavaria who was baptizing everybody with this formula. Hold on to your hats for this, folks. Baptizo te in nomina patria et filia et spiritu santa. Patria, or pat, of course, patris in the normal uh, formulation of the baptismal formula is a masculine noun, the father. But here's patria, which means father, but it's conjugated as a feminine noun. Ooh, that's interesting, especially since Elohim is both. Patria et filia. Filia means one thing and one thing only in, in, in Latin. I bet, I bet you most of you have guessed it correctly. It means daughter. And spiritu sancta. In spiritu sanctus in the standard formula, but this is spiritu sancta. Holy spirit, but conjugated in the feminine. Nor was this priest alone, as I've seen some dogmatic scholars trying to suggest, that he was just some country priest who didn't know much about Latin. Oh, he knew his Latin very well, I assure you. Because I've, I've dug through a number of ancient records, and I found mention of other baptisms performed, and tombstones engraved, and, and also uh, paintings on the wall of, of ancient churches with this or very similar formulations of what we now call the Trinity but I suggest it is this earlier evocation. So uh, I'm not watching the clock. So Thomas, uh, clock me over the head if, if I uh, go over my time, because there's just so much to cover in this, in this material. I'd like now to start sharing something of how these early traditions of Jesus and Mary managed to survive to the present day. Uh, what I'm getting at is that there's much in literature, in poetry, in theater, uh, in uh, liturgical texts to suggest, to support that everything I'm saying about the relationship between Jesus and Mary 
and how they were the image and sought to be the image and likeness of, of Elohim survived to the present time, uh, despite all efforts of the organized religion to, to crush it out of existence. Now, if I can get my little screen. Oh, it's, this is what I want to do. Okay. So the first one I want to share with you is, where did that, oh, down here. See, sometimes it's above and sometimes it's below. It's trying to confuse me. There we go. Can you see that? Is it there? Somebody yes, nod? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Thank yes, you. Not. Okay. Thank you. I'm a dummy, so you really have to help me here. Okay. No, you're not. Oh, you, you <laughs> ask my wife. That's why I keep her around. She keeps me humble. Okay. Don't fall in love with a penny mania. You have to learn to speak Spanish after all, or an Ecuadorian in your case. Okay. <laughs> all right. Now, what we have here are some of the earliest depictions we have of Mary. To the upper left here, you see the woman in the orat pose like this, arms up, elbows bent. That's the pose of someone who is teaching, preaching, or praying aloud for a group. But what I want you to note is that she is wearing the Jewish priestly garments. She has the talus. Can you see there, this, this white with stripes there, that is called the talus. It's the prayer shawl. You'll still see Jews wearing it today, especially in synagogue. Down below, you see once again, a woman in an orat pose. This is very probably Mary once again. Uh, both of these are from catacombs in Rome, the catacombs of D Domitilla and of Priscilla. Here we have the, the serving of, of the Last Supper. We have uh, Jesus as the central figure right here. We have Mary to his left. We have Ju Judah or Judas in English to his right. And so then to Mary's left, would be uh, uh, Simon the Rock. I prefer to translate Peter. It means rock, Simon the Rock. So we have here the Last Supper, and you'll notice the proximity of Jesus and Mary. Here we have a reenactment of the Last Supper. And wowzers, folks, we have right here, smack dab in the middle, a woman whose hair is in that Nazar hairstyle of the Nutzrim. And we have around her men as she shares with them the elements of the Eucharist. Now, I, I don't know that it's Mary because they didn't put little handy captions on these catacomb illustrations, but it's a very good chance. Here we have a female figure with a halo holding a book, presumably the gospel, and she's flanked by two men, and generally it's assumed that they're Peter and Paul. They're just gesturing toward her saying, this is she. This one is the most interesting to me. It doesn't come out very well in the photograph that I took. Sorry about that, but you have to deal with it. They, they shuffle you through these catacombs so fast. Above, we have the Last Supper. Below, we have the unfinished portrait of a woman sketched in white lines. Yeah, evidently, the plan was to paint her later. And it's, she's under the Cairo. You, if you don't know your Greek letters, what looks like an X there is the Greek letter Chai, which is the first letter in Christos or Christ in English. And the thing sticking up with a round on it, it kind of looks like a tall P, is actually Rho, it's equivalent to our letter R, C-H-R, Christos. And whenever you see that, you have the embodiment of Christ, but it's a woman. So if it's a woman who is the embodiment of Jesus the Christ, this must be the Magdalene. So, okay, let me let me run back to my... Notes here. There we go. All right. Oh boy. Oh, fun and prepare yourself. This uh, I I'm friends with Mark Stoff Brendel, the great art historian at the University in Liechtenstein in Vaduz, and uh, he and I did a did an internet presentation together not long ago, and I believe it's available on YouTube if anybody's interested. Uh, and we looked at a number of these artworks together and just had a blast. But one that is especially of importance, and, and again, I have to stop talking so I can find my way to it. Here we go. Okay, now I want to go back to the Zoom and click screen share if I can find it. Oh, I'm so stupid. Here we go. Uh, share screen, there we go. Okay, now, uh, there. Uh, is that coming through? Not yet. Okay. Try okay. again. 
Yeah, uh, oh, it's not sharing. Okay, try again. Okay, thank you, Thomas. I appreciate it. Share screen. All right, and uh, share this up here. Oh, here we go. Uh, that, and then I want to do share. Okay, all right. Yep, all good. Okay, with all the yeah. share, all the share, I'm looking for Sonny and I don't see him. Okay, but speaking of Sonny and share, when you are given a tour of this church of all places in the city of Rome, this church is called Santa Maria di Trastevere. My Spanish speaking wife always laughs when I speak Italian because she, she thinks it sounds so funny. Uh, you see here a couple. There's as the, the term for this is synthronos. They are seated on the same throne. You can see here very clearly the, from the blue background, they are seated on the same throne. When you're given a tour here, the tour guide will tell you this is Jesus and his mother. Okay, let's consider this. First of all, he's got his arm around her. They are touching, their bodies are touching full length. And uh, they're both young. Another fascinating thing is she is wearing the headdress and the clothing of a Byzantine bride. This is the equivalent of wearing white and a white white gown and a white veil today. You're dressed like that. Back at the time this was done, everybody said, whoa, she's a bride getting married. Now, so far, I think the evidence is that if this is Jesus and his mother, it looks uh, pretty uh, ethically questionable, shall we say. So now you'll see here, she's holding a scroll. He's holding a scroll. And I have I have to stop because it's a little hard to see with the uh, with the small uh, text here in the Zoom. So I'm going to tell you what those scrolls say. His scroll says uh, it's coming from the Psalms, "Vene electa mea et ponam in te thronum meum." And I'm going to translate the whole verse from Psalms that this that this quotes: "Come, bride of Christ, receive the crown which the Lord has prepared for you for all eternity." For whose love you have shed your blood. Come, my chosen one, and I will place my throne in you, for the king has desired your beauty. With your allure and your beauty displayed, proceed prosperously and reign. He's saying this about his mother. I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to put it bluntly. Give me a break. Her skull, hold on to your hats. Her skull is. Uh, quotes the entire verse from the Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 6. In Latin, Leva eos sub capite meo, et extera ilios aplexabitur me, which means, his left hand is under my head, and his right arm shall embrace me. Ah, uh huh. So if you believe this is mommy, we need to talk after class. <laughs> what is amazing to me what guests my flabber is that Santa Maria de, de Trastevere is in the city of Rome. It's in the lion's den. It's not in some little country church. I have found all sorts of other images quite like this one, but they're way out in the countryside in northern Italy or southern France or somewhere like that. Uh, when I was living in, in uh, north of Caser, uh, there, there was a, a village south of uh, Caser, and I can't think of the name of it at the moment. With an old church, I walked in, and there were frescoes on the wall that show Jesus and Mary as a married couple. Uh, they're just everywhere. But this is one in the, in the city of Rome, in the, in the very pit of iniquity. Remember, amor in Latin means love, and amor backwards is Roma. And boy, the ancients made a lot out of that, that Rome was the absolute opposite of love. If you remember in the book of Revelation, uh, the, the, the whore who's, who's uh, dolled up and running around, she's the, she's the city of Rome incarnate. This is the lion's den. This is where the, all the holy inquisitors are. The story is too long to tell, but the reason this exists in the city of Rome is because there was a newly elected poet, pope who had some rather unusual ideas in mind when he ordered his home church in Rome, the church he grew up in, to be completely redecorated. It happened to be in a Jewish neighborhood. So this new Pope was very familiar with Jewish tradition. He knew Hebrew backwards and upside down. And this is how he interpreted the story of Jesus and Mary. Uh, I, I, uh, there's so many things I want to talk about. Uh, let's, let's see if I can do you quickly. Um, I have to go to the Zoom. Tranquila, right. dear heart. Tranquila. 
Ah, bueno. oh, estás hablando en español, mi esposa estará muy, muy feliz de escuchar cómo bueno tu español, mi amor. Okay. We can, when you're ready, James, we can move yes. on to Q&A. Um, oh, am I running out of time? Well, we've got 25 minutes left, and if you want, you can carry on talking, or it might be good to have some questions. Uh, um, you want to pause can... questions and then I'll continue? I'm, I'm well, kind of in the, art, the artwork part of it. You can... Okay, well, you carry on for another five or ten minutes, and then we'll have Q&A. Oh, okay, okay. okay. I, Leave a okay. bit of time. Trust me, then. I, I was going to talk about Botticelli, who shows who shows again uh, the the marital marital relationship. I was going to show the Gent altar piece. This is one of the most famous works of art. Let me let me just pop it on the screen really fast. I could talk about this in half a second, uh, and then share screen. Am I getting there? Okay, and uh, let me see what. Uh, Ah, get, get all the piece and then share. All right. Yes, all okay. done. Okay, okay. This is a triptych, Mary Magdalene, and repainted by a later artist. This was Jesus. And this in the middle is an androgyne. The beard was added later. But right here at the bottom, you can see there's an inscription around the, the base of this androgynous figure between Mary and Jesus. It happens to mean king of kings and queen of queens. Okay, so that I, I was going to talk about that in greater detail, but in the interest of time, I'll have to forego that. Uh, right to my notes. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. What's the Botticelli painting? Can you show us that? Oh, sure. Okay. By popular request, mainly one person. Okay. Uh, Botticelli. Okay, I got that there. Is it showing or do I have to do the thing again? No, you have to do the thing. The thing. Okay. That thing, the thing you do with your. Okay. Uh, share screen. Okay, and Botticelli. Okay, here we go. Okay, right here in the center. Obviously, that's Mother Mary, okay? Uh, what we have here is everybody who's holding the body, you'll notice is holding it with their their hands touching this, this veil that's all the way around. But notice, one and one person only is touching the body directly skin to skin, and that's this woman who is kissing the face of Jesus. She's got the veil around her too. The only person who has the veil around her too. She's the only one touching his skin directly. She's kissing him. She's wearing the red that always signifies Mary Magdalene. So I think this is an extremely important time. This was painted, you may know, Thomas, in the time of Savonarola, the who is just after everybody uh, trying to establish what he believed was the proper do doctrine. And Botticelli got into some serious hot water for painting this painting. And to save his neck, he had to repaint it. I don't happen to have it ready to show you folks, but he, he repainted it. And Mary is much more discreet in the in the latter version of this painting. But you, you see here, I think a clear depiction of the love between Mary and Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm going probably Thank faster you, than, than I should, but uh, and you'll have to apologize. I, when I timed my 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 talk for you, it came out to an hour exactly, but you know how things happen. Um, okay, I have to run back to my notes, or I should stop the share screening, the screen sharing, or whatever it's called. Am I am I screen sharing or am I not? No, I'm, no, you've stopped. That's fine. Okay, 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 good. You. Okay, okay. So, I I wanted to skip through time. I I was going to talk if there was time about. The Leonardo Last Supper is going to talk about Chimbabue. Jacques Stella, who is an overlooked uh, artist of incredible talent. And uh, I was going to talk also about the the uh, the, the uh, stained glass windows in Église Saint-Germain, uh, which is a very interesting example. But I'm going to run through time to William Blake. Why William Blake? Well, hold on to your hats, because this is William Blake. If you aren't familiar with William Blake's work, get familiar with William Blake. There is, he is not only one of the world's greatest artists, not only one of the world's greatest poets, not only, and this is overlooked, not only one of the world's greatest analysts of the Bible, he taught himself Greek and Hebrew and he became brilliant at analyzing the Bible, uh, but he is also probably the world's last visionary prophet and he uh, 
he uh, his a uh, friend of his thomas butts records how jesus would walk through the streets of london side by side with jesus and they would have all sorts of animated conversations together uh okay you seeing that picture there yeah we can see that yeah, yeah. okay let me see if i can blow it up here I, there we go all right this is william blake's painting of the last supper okay jesus that's mary magdalene and you'll notice that Jesus has his hands raised in that orant position I named earlier. Mary has her uh, forearms clasped over her breasts, and she's looking at him with rapture and listening. This is, of course, like the scene in Luke chapter 10, where Mary sits at his feet and listens raptly while Martha does all the housework. But, and you'll notice the disciples. But notice, we have directly opposite them a man with a modern haircut, a European, a woman next to him. They are both at least semi-nude. And you'll notice that the woman is wearing the same color more or less as Jesus. And the man is wearing the same color more or less as Mary. And the woman has her hands up teaching, discoursing to the man who is listening with rapt attention, just as Mary listens to, to Jesus. What's going on here? We have Jesus and Mary united in the image and likeness, and William and Catherine, his wife, Catherine, which of course is the name associated with the Cathars, her middle name was Sophia, wisdom, I hardly need to go on about that. Catherine, William Blake said all the time was his muse. The last thing he did, the last work he did before he died in his last hours of, of life was to paint a portrait of Mary saying, you've always been an angel to me. This is saying he learns from her just as she learned from him. And it's also saying that we, like William and Catherine, need to, to do the same as Jesus and Mary, come together in the unity of love to reestablish the, the image and likeness of Elohim. So, okay, now I need to, uh, screen sharing is stopped. Okay, so now, um, so that, I wanted to treat that a little bit. Can I just do the, uh, on the question of the Trinity, this this I have I absolutely have to do, and then we can have a little break before I go on. Uh, okay. Shaman. Here we go. Okay, I got that on my screen. Move it over a little bit, and I got to the Zoom thing. Oh, I'm getting I'm getting good. I'm getting good. All right, uh, there's hope for even old fogies like me. Okay, here is a painting, uh, a fresco, I should say, from the Church of Urschaling in Upper Bavaria of what apparently is the trinity but here's what's the, the the one that'll gas your flabbers the old man with the white beard that's got to be god the father this fellow here on the left's got to be jesus what's going on here in the middle we know it's the trinity because notice each has a red section here parts of the cross is the cruciform halo that signifies either the christ or the trinity so father son and who's that in the middle well, I do think she's of the female persuasion. You can notice there's more pigment here, darker pigment here than on the left and right, which is to highlight her breasts. It's to say, this is a woman. What's she doing the Trinity? So that was part of what I wanted to say about the original formulation that became the Trinity in later time. Uh, did you wanna take a, a short break mm -hmm. now for questions? Uh, I think so, that's a good idea. We, we've got 15 minutes left. Oh no! And I've got so much. Before our next speaker me. comes on, no, no, oh, we've yeah. we've we'll have to have you back next year, James. Yeah, because I, I, I mean, no offense That's, intended, but I, but yeah. my my start was half an hour after after the previous, and so I I lost a lot of time right there, and it wasn't my fault. Ah, no, it's it's uh, it's tragic because you've got so much. But let's yeah. have some questions now for James because he's done. A great work, uh, Alex. Keep, you've had your hand up for ages. Yeah, keep keep the short, please, because I, like? I, I'd like to squeeze out a little time for more stuff. Okay. okay, I've got quite a few questions. You've posed so much. Firstly, the plat, um, the vow. What is what is the vow? What vow are you talking about? The Nazarites. The, the Nazarite, Nazarite vow. She did. If, you stated that she'd taken a vow. What was yes, that vow? Yes. Okay, uh, as I said, you can go to Numbers chapter 6 and read all about it in the original. But Numbers basically, the, yeah, the vow of the Nazarites, the notes read, was to stay away from <clears throat> all great products such as wine, uh, 
Okay. Uh, yes. It was yeah. not to cut their hair. And Second question. Yeah. And so it, was, it was an act of devotion to talks. God. Mm -hmm. um the second thing is a uh, hallucinogenics so what form of hallucinogenics do you think um culminated into creating the co the coma uh, you, state you know exa exactly what what uh what what uh entheogen they were taking yes yeah. do you do you know okay yeah uh well i don't know i my time machine is in the shop and they say it'll be ready for me last tuesday oh well can i go with you no <laughs> Uh, if you hang on, I, I didn't have that in my notes here. So let me, uh, the, the mixture was a mixture of Posca, which is a, a cheap wine that was served to uh, uh, Romans at the time. And uh, if I can find the, the, the uh, entheogen itself, I've got it. I just have to do a quick search here. Just bear with me. Uh, it was put on a what was called in that time a soporific sponge, and it was used to put people suffering from pain into uh, into uh, unconsciousness. But it was also used as a spiritual hallucinogenic. No, it's not there. Well, don't worry about that. We can you can email each other. I'll share the codes for each other. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, I, I I have yeah. what it is, but it's just not it's not in probably henbane or something. Um. Ginger, did you have a question for our speaker? Uh, uh, first of all, I I um, I would ask you, Thomas, to facilitate another Zoom circle here, uh, perhaps next week, whatever, because I have much to learn mm -hmm. yeah. from Distant Eagle. I am grandmother seeker of the Eastern Alabama Cherokee. Oh, we'll see you. See, see. And speaking of that, I don't speak uh, much Cherokee, uh, oh, but I speak. I, a I, speaking of that, uh, Sequoia, you know, the oh, yeah, 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 sure. yeah. Well, guess what? He's got a wrapping around his head, like the six use to wrap around. If uh -huh. I can share the screen, yeah, you can. Okay. Hold on, let me show you that photo of Sequoia. Oh gosh, where is it? Uh, Sequoia was a famous Cherokee Indian sage. He invented the language. He the invented Cherokee the alphabet. Language. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, the alphabet. The alphabet. Yeah, the Cherokee well, alphabet. Right. I, I had it here. Let, let me go back up. And by the way, the Cherokee alphabet can, has similarities uh, to Coptic. Yeah, Sequoia. Okay, so here's the, let me go back. Thank you. So I can share the screen. Uh, so that flitted across my spirit because not only that, oh, here we go. Okay, share the screen. Come on. Share hey, if screen. I did it, you can do it. <laughs> oh, I, I'm hitting the down button. It's down and up. I don't know why it's not going up. Here. While you're looking for that, Ginger, can I just quickly ask a question and I'll, I'll put it right back Go to for you. it, Alex. Yeah. Okay. I have a theory. We don't, we didn't come out of Africa. I actually feel looking at all the genealogy and the genetics of people, they're very Asian looking, you know, China, Malaysia, all the way to um, Australia, Mongolia and up. And if you look at the sand people, they're more almond eyed looking as opposed to, so predominantly we're more Asian looking across the nation now i can't i'm so i'm not quite sure where we probably originated but i've tapped on theories that it could have come from north america now you've just posed a question that in my head that the copt the cherokee is very similar to the coptic the, the alphabet yes yes i'm with you ginger yes and also the quichua here in ecuador the yeah quichua. the quichua yeah and guess yeah. what in eastern the Kichwa, yeah. in yeah, eastern I, Alabama, they found yeah. coins from Israel, the ancient coins from Israel. And so, uh, see, we That's have nice so word. much to bounce off Boomer. But another sure. thing, yeah, just one last thing. Okay, because I want to move on now, if that's okay, yeah. What's that, okay. Ginger? It's God's secrets only Hebrew can reveal. I've studied with Dr. Ben Gigi. And uh, William Henry has all these ancient, uh, these uh, paintings, they all have light 
the, the, like the halos above them, which is energy, which is light. And he says in the beginning, um, it's not in the Bible. The correct translation is not be, it's not <clears throat> let there be light. It's be light. Yeah, yeah, that's, well. that's correct. That's correct. <laughs> Sure. Okay, thank you, Ginger. That was fascinating. And thank you, Alex. Our next speakers here, John Constable, thank you so much for being with us, beaming oh, in from London. We've got about another 10 minutes for finishing off with James. Um, I've got a quite important question for you, James. Um, yes, so yes, step down to constantly you. during your talk, you kept referring to the original Aramaic version mm -hmm. of the Gospel of John. <laughs> um, and you kept saying it's not in the Greek, it's in the Aramaic. Um, Bruce Chilton, who spoke at one of our former meetings, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is an Aramaic scholar. So you and say when you said there was only zero yeah, people, no, no, no I no, don't no. know. He's a Syrian can... Aramaic scholar. Yes, I'm, okay. I'm a scholar so of he... Galilean Aramaic. Right, there's a big difference. Okay, well, I'd love to get you two to come back next year and debate that. Um, I think he edits the. The Journal of Aramaic Studies, and I don't know if you've published yeah. in that. Be fun. Yeah, but I, but I my question debate. to you. I, I, just, just a footnote, I don't debate. I never debate. I respect other okay. people's views. My, my question to you then is, is what are these Aramaic manuscripts of John, early manuscripts that you've been right. able to find? In which library? And, and you know, are they published or what? What are you working with? Quite so. Okay. We, okay. Uh, I wasn't going to get into all that because the subject is Mary Magdalene, not the origination of the Gospel of John, but briefly is as follows. Uh, at that council that I mentioned in uh, uh, the year 42, John the Presbyter was asked, he was he was originally the number two man in the temple, the Sagan in the temple underneath Caiaphas, his friend. Uh, he was asked at that council to write a text that brought together the eyewitness memories of the beloved disciple, Mary, and his own eyewitness memories into a narrative text. And he proceeded to do that by taking notes from Mary of, of her eyewitness memories, uh, which then he developed into drafts, each pericope, each uh, story, you might say, that eventually became the gospel on a separate piece of papyrus. Uh, this we know from Papias of Herapolis. He's the, he's the uh, author who tells us about the origination, most about the origination of the four canonical gospels that we know. These were written in Aramaic <clears throat> when John was arrested in 68. Uh, these drafts were sent for safekeeping to Sinope and in uh, Pontus, uh, far to the east. And uh, but a year later, they were sent for safekeeping there. A year later, however, John was released from Patmos by a new emperor, and he considered those texts to be lost. Uh, so he wrote another book called The Songs of the Perfect One that was a new way of telling the story that Mary had shared with him. But some 25 more or less years later, Marcion of Sinope appeared at the door with those manuscripts, said, here they are. John was by this time in his 90s, so he was, and he'd had a massive stroke. He was unable to do any more work on the gospel, so it fell to Papias of Herapolis to collate these manuscripts, which uh, the pages have been disordered, uh, to translate them into Greek and to organize them into a coherent manuscript. That, uh, by a lot of twists and turns, which I'm leaving out, eventually became the Greek textus receptus that we have today. The, the graphs, however, in Aramaic survived for three or so centuries, four centuries, more or less, in Ephesus and were put on display in the church in Ephesus, which I visited. It's now in ruins. Uh, it is the church was built over the tomb of, of John the Presbyter. So scholars could consult these original Aramaic drafts. So what we do have today, Thomas, is a number of texts which I consider to be a separate text type, uh, like a Alexandrian and Byzantine and so on, a separate text type, the Galilean text type of the Gospels, uh, because of the extreme difference of their texts from the uh, others that we know in Greek. These texts include, most importantly, the Palestinian lectionaries, 
that were discovered by a fascinating uh, tw set of twin sisters around the end of the 19th century, transcribed, published, and within about 20 years, just about completely forgotten. No scholar in recent decades has given them a serious look. Uh, there is also some earlier texts, such as the, uh, the Sinaiticus Rescriptus, the, the uh, uh, Tlemachi Rescriptus, and others, also in Galilean Aramaic, which also give us something of, of a sense of these original drafts of John. And these are what I'm translating. Uh, nobody's shown any interest, but I'm beginning to get some interest from fellow scholars, especially <clears throat> continental. I've had a number of French scholars, German, uh, Netherlandish, and uh, Spanish scholars interested in the work I'm doing. So far, very little interest from the English-speaking community, and I think mm -hmm. there's reasons for that, which, which I won't get into now. Sure. So thank you very much. These, yeah, we do have these manuscripts. We don't have the original. Okay. We don't have the original of anything. In, and this in is all going to be in your book when it's published. Yes, yeah, nine volumes, yeah so. I'm translating word for word. And always, Thomas, I put the original text as well. And that's for a reason. Right. So anybody who doubts my word can look it up in the dictionary and figure it out for themselves and okay. see if I'm right or wrong. Okay, I stand, well, by, I stand by my translations, shocking though they may be. Well, no, I mean, it's fascinating stuff. I've got one last question for you. Um, we've sure, got sure. a few minutes. Um, <laughs> So a couple of years ago, we had a speaker on here, um, Anne Baring and David Lorimer. They're absolutely convinced about the gospel of the beloved companion that circulates in the Cathar yeah. community yeah, in France. I'm, I'm familiar with it. They the, believe the, that the, is the, the neo Cathar. Neo Cathar. Yeah. So what what do you think? What's your take? Does that gospel of the beloved companion sound authentic to you, or do you think that's a neo? Uh, fabrication by an enthusiast um, with all respect i think the latter it's beautiful don't get me wrong it's a lovely text and i and i admire it and they got some things right in it but i do not consider it genuine because some of the some of the very basic factual elements that that i find in these early texts simply are not present and they take the the later greek recension as if it's factual so it's it's clearly in my view it's clearly a fabrication but i could i consider it a pious a loving and warm-hearted fabrication i don't i don't criticize it therefore yeah I, yeah I i love the thing it's a beautiful sure. no it's but it's sort of um um it's uh it's a composite of many sources put yeah, together yeah, basically yeah it's, yeah, it's a, yeah. And, and and i please <clears throat> i don't want anybody to take me the wrong way i am not criticizing it I just wish that the that the author put it out as what it is. It's like yeah. if you're, if you're familiar, Thomas, with the poetry of Ossian, it's a fabrication. James McPherson it fabricated, it. but it's sure. a beautiful, wonderful fabrication. But it tells a sort of truth. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So I I don't have anything against it. I just don't want to confuse it with these early Galilean Aramaic texts, etc., Coptic, and so on that I'm working with. And my last question in the last couple of minutes is. I mean, I'm listening to what you're saying very carefully, and you're saying that, yes, Jesus revived briefly at the tomb, but then he died again. So the resurrection that normal Christians in churches are worshipping around the world, you know, you've Christian. just shot it to pieces. Um, so uh, I'm imagining the Orthodox Christian community, whether Anglican or Catholic or whatever, I mean, according to you, Jesus dies fully and is buried, but then Mary escapes to France. Is that is that what you're going to find in your writings? Well, a number of years later, she uh, after after the events of the crucifixion and resurrection, uh, she continued to live in Jerusalem for a period of time. She uh, then moved in uh, 36, I believe, to to Anatolia together hmm. with John the Presbyter and Mary, the mother of Jesus, because if you remember at the at the crucifixion, she agrees to take upon herself responsibility for Jesus's mother because she's the beloved disciple so Jesus hands to her as his wife the responsibility of caring for his mother so she takes mom along with herself and John the presbyter to Anatolia in the year 42 as I mentioned she's not escaping or anything she's simply uh she was a peripatetic teacher about Jesus she was tireless in what she did for this tradition so in 42 she went first to Rome she spent a number of years in Rome and then when the time came, she went from Rome to Gaul, 
Uh, there's a text that is purportedly by Pontius Pilate that a uh, French scholar, Max Guy, turned me on to, and he he thought I was going to say it was a forgery, but I'm leaning toward thinking it's a genuine Pontius Pilate text that supports uh, the assertion that you find in a number of earlier writers, such as Clement of, of Alexandria, that Mary visited her friends, Pontius Pilate and Cl uh, Claudia Procola in Vienne, not Vienna, Austria, but Vienne. Uh, in the in the uh, central east of France today, and then she went by the Loire and other ri other rivers and Roman roads up to Normandy. She took ship across, as I said, to the southwest peninsula and then up the Severn River Valley. So this this wasn't escaping her. This was peripatetic Teacher. to teach yeah. outlying groups. Why? <coughs> because the Pauline community was establishing itself throughout the Roman Empire. And where the apostolic tradition that she represented, which had, as I'm sure you can gather from what, from what I've been saying, had a very different understanding of Jesus and his teaching, she wasn't going to succeed very well where Paul had dug in his, uh, his roots pretty well. So she was going outside the emperor empire. And so Gaul and Britain at the time were such outlying regions where she could teach and get away with it. Hmm. Well, those are very interesting perspectives. I think we'll have to invite you back next year to tell the second episode of what she did afterwards. Um, can, I, can I leave with yeah. just one quotation from a, an actual written document by Mary Magdalene? Please, it's go for okay. it. Yeah, This is lovely. It's just to give you a flavor of the actual human being, uh, not the penitent prostitute, but the beautiful mm -hmm. and highly educated woman from an illustrious family who dearly loved her husband and, and dedicated her life to his teachings. In about the years uh, 61, I believe, I'm going on memory, a young man named Avodius who wrote what we would call today a fan letter. And Avodius wrote, this is the, the, the core of the letter, but what a miracle to be wholly possessed by Jesus as your very own, and I am stupefied upon hearing of this. By you, however, Mary, I wholeheartedly desire to be made more certain of what I heard by you who are always intimate with him, Jesus, and forever conjoined with him, Jesus, and who are aware of his inward thoughts. Here's how she wrote in reply. What things you have heard and learned from John the Presbyter about Jesus are true. Believe them, cling to them, and stay firm in the Christianity that you have accepted by vow, and conform your conduct and manner of life there too. Indeed, I will come with John to visit you and those who are with you. Stand fast in faith and administer manfully and be not moved by even by severe persecution, but be strong and let your spirit rejoice in God your safety. Right. Well, that's very profound. Thank you um, for finishing with that, James. Yeah, and um, you've given us a lot of food for thought, and thank you very much. My pleasure. Uh, we'll, thank we'll, you for inviting me. And we'll have to have the second part another time. And please get that book published so we can look at the details. Scholars like you. us, we want to know the footnotes, James. I didn't know you were friends with my publisher. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, <laughs> now look, thank you all. I'd like to move on to our next guest who's come from London. Uh, John Crow or John Constable, he has two names and um, he has a very interesting story to tell. He can do his own introduction shortly, but let me just say that our paths have crossed several times indirectly. Um, an earlier speaker at this forum was a man called Jeff Merrifield, who's a tremendous um, thespian, musician, actor, and Cathar expert, and Jeff Merrifield came here to our center in France, gave a brilliant talk about, um, well, what I wanted him to talk about was, what did the Cathars think about Mary Magdalene? Is there anything in their manuscripts that, you know, was about that? And, um, and then we went down to uh, the Pyrenees mountains together, <clears throat> and we had a second part of the conference. And Jeff lives up in um, Shetland. So anyway, it turns out John Constable and him are, are best buddies. I didn't know that at the time. Um, and I've also 
been for many years a friend of uh, an amazing woman in Britain called Rainbow Lizzie, or Elizabeth Dallas, who told me about the Southwark Mysteries. <coughs> and um, John, of course, is the author of these. And they're very, you know, they're very important. And they're connected with Mary Magdalene. So I'm hoping he's going to explain all this to us. John, over to you. <coughs> Thank you, Thomas. Can you, you can hear me? Good. Uh, so welcome everyone uh, to on this uh, feast day of St. Mary Magdalene and indeed of my birthday, which I'm celebrating. Uh, having been born on the 22nd of July, uh, I was clearly fated to be in her band. <laughs> yes, thank you. Happy birthday. Happy <laughs> thank you, Ginger. <laughs> <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> so I was clearly fated to be in her uh, band, her company, her motley crew. And her inspiration and, and influence are... Uh, present in a great deal of my work, especially over the last 30 years, and very particularly in the Southwark Mysteries, which is probably my best known piece of writing and which I'll be exploring uh, later in this talk. Uh, the Southwark Mysteries was very connected with uh, the emergence of a kind of shamanic uh, persona, John Crow, which as uh, Thomas mentioned is my other name. and. Uh, Tom Crow, uh, John Crow I had employed as a character and a playwright, and, and he'd appeared in various plays in minor roles. But one night, uh, the 23rd of November, 1996, he met the Goose, uh, and uh, they both took on autonomous lives. And that is really the story I'm going to tell you uh, and how it involves Mary Magdalene very specifically. Um, it inspired a 23-year magical work at the Crossbones Graveyard in South London. This was an outcast burial ground, particularly a final resting place for sex workers who were licensed by the church in medieval times, but denied uh, Christian burial. So a, a very powerful place. And as you'll see, I hope in my talk, uh, these things are all uh, intimately connected. Now, I'm just going to attempt, because I'm very... Um, I am very Stone Age uh, in technology, but I'm going to try sharing my screen here. Um, hopefully, uh, yes, hopefully you can see this. So my talk is the Goose, the Magdalene, and the Southwark Mysteries. And these are all characters in, in my book, The Southwark Mysteries, uh, which you'll see is published uh, under my name, John Constable, although in the uh, introduction, I also credit the Goose and John Crow as its true authors. So I'm going to stop share. Could, could somebody give me a thumbs up if you saw my image? Oh, good. That's great. Thank you. OK, we're cooking with gas. Um, I'm going to give you a very brief um, um, biography. Thomas asked me to introduce myself a bit. I, I describe myself as a, a poet, a, a performer. I used to call myself an urban shaman, but three years ago I moved to Glastonbury, which has got far too many shaman already. Uh, I, so I prefer now perhaps magical practitioner. And I've always followed my own path, um, guided by the goose, my, my, my spirit for the last 25 years. Uh, I was born um, on the Welsh Shropshire border um, from a, a working class family that pulled themselves up by the bootstraps, I suppose, and I was the first a uh, member of my family to go to university to Cambridge, where I read English and particularly medieval literature inspired me. But I, this was the late 60s and my um, academic career was probably derailed by my interest in psychedelics and magic. And this led me to a period after I left university of traveling the world in search of, um, of teachings of significance. Years, I would say, of spiritual pilgrimage, although often um, very blind. Uh, but they included a year in Japan and uh, time in Bali and Southeast Asia and time in India uh, until I came um, back to Europe. And very soon I found myself um, joining uh, theatre companies. Um, let me, hang on, I'm still working out the tech here. Yeah, we're back. Uh, share screen. Hopefully this is going to work. Um, here we go. I hope this is working. 
Okay, so this is, if you can see this, this is me playing Hamlet uh, with a, a group called Sheer Madness in a, a show called Shakespeare's Greatest Hits. It's um, not okay. come up yet. Okay, no, thank you. Do the share thing. I'll try the share again. Let me, what was... There it is. It's coming now. You've got it now? Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Okay, we might get the odd um, glitch with this, but I'll press on if, with your permission. Sure. So, uh, yes, here, here I am as Hamlet. Um, having just slain Laertes and uh, learned that uh, uh, the sword was poisoned, so I'm doomed to die. And uh, in fact, uh, it was a, a show called Shakespeare's Greatest Hits, in which we performed four Shakespearean tragedies in an hour, uh, playing them for comic effect, but obviously ending in a, a welter of um, blood capsules and, and mass death. Uh, so it was very dark comedy, but great fun to play. And I, I came up with the answer to Hamlet's uh, famous soliloquy uh, question, to be or not to be. And of course, not to be, that is the answer. And when I was a young man, I didn't really expect to live to be uh, more than 30. So today is my 71st birthday, which comes as a great surprise to me. I'm going to go straight to this. <laughs> Thank you, Ginger. I'm going straight to this, which is, um, I came back to England in 1984 and I had various plays uh, performed. Uh, my first play was Black Mass in the collection shamanic plays in the top left corner now uh, which was a play inspired by uh, going to Trinidad for carnival in fact spending all my money and staying there and even ending up knocking down a theatre that had been firebombed during um, a rather turbulent election uh, it was quite a strange time but uh, the owner of the theatre <laughs> Lennox Raphael who wrote a notorious play called Shea encouraged me to write plays and that's how I came to write Black Mass and this led to a period of relative success as a playwright. Probably my most successful was the adaptation of Mervyn Peake's Gothic trilogy, Gormenghast, uh, which has toured the world several times and also Britain. And that gave me the only time I ever really earned royalties as a writer, which gave me the freedom to actually write exactly what I wanted, which turned out to be the Southwark Mysteries, uh, which I, we'll be coming to. And this is a key work. And then later, um, I published Spark in the Dark, that's a collection of my poetry, including Wenifer's Wake, which was a, a, a reimagining of the Isis Osiris story. And Isis is another aspect of the divine feminine, another goddess who is strongly channeled through the goose spirit, uh, which we'll be coming to. And um, <clears throat> some of the talk I'm going to give will draw on my latest book, Grail, which I wrote about my first year and a half in Glastonbury. And this relates uh, very strongly to, um, to Mary Magdalene. And so some of my ideas I've um, developed from, from a chapter in that book, but combine them with thoughts on the Southwark Mysteries. So now, um, having discussed, having introduced myself, I'd like to begin by um, looking briefly at Mary Magdalene. And, and please indulge me a little here because you may have heard some of this, some of you will know this, and uh, maybe some of the speakers today, like James, will have dealt with it in far more scholarly and in-depth ways. But I'll, I'll seek to give it my own spin and show how it's important to the development <coughs> of the goose. So um, let's start by looking at her identity in the Bible um, and even in the canonical Gospels. Um, we get Mary Magdalene, of course, introduced and acknowledged as the apostle of the apostles in the gospel of john she's the woman who meets and speaks with the risen christ in the garden she brings the news of his resurrection to the male apostles who refuse to believe her and even when they go all they know is that the grave is empty so to them christ is an absence to mary he's a presence a presence so tangible that he has to ask her not to touch him because I am not yet ascended. I think this is one of the most intimate and moving moments in the entire uh, canonical gospels. And uh, particularly when he then speaks to her tenderly, Jesus said to her, Mary. You remember this is Mary supposing him to be the gardener. It's an extraordinarily beautiful exchange. And then, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to him, Mary, to her, Mary. 
And she replies, Rabboni, meaning master. Um, but we, so we have this image. Uh, let's stop, share a minute. You can see me again. Yeah. Uh, so we have this uh, very clear image of Mary Magdalene as, as this very particular disciple, even in the, the, the basis of Orthodox Christianity. And yet by the um, end of the sixth century, of course, we have the church begins to reinvent her as the penitent prostitute, the sinner. And the revised image is conflating several women in the canonical gospels. We know Mary is named, Mary Magdalene, named as the woman from whom Jesus drives out seven devils. And um, of course the medieval church very quickly seized on these devils as representing the seven deadly sins. And if we look at it from a, mo a modern perspective with more perhaps empathetic, psychologically astute eyes, we can see Jesus laying on hands, perhaps to calm an epileptic fit or even a, a psychotic episode, uh, or perhaps it's an act of initiation. But this is the woman who will become his chosen disciple. And then we have Mary of Bethany um, coming up. Ah, I know what I have to do. I have to start the slideshow. There we go. No. Oh, <laughs> hang on. I warned you about me and tech. Uh, we're going back to Zoom. It keeps it interesting. <laughs> and now share I'm going to share screen and hope you see it. Yeah. You see that, I hope. No, not yet. Keep not yet. Try sharing screen again. There it is. It's coming. Yeah, back. lovely. We're learning. We're learning on the job. Here. There it is. Uh, yeah, we've got a <laughs> lovely picture. Right. So here we've got Mary of Bethany, who, um, who, who washes Jesus' feet and listens to his teachings while Sister Martha is complaining about having to do all the cooking. And clearly, this starts to establish Mary as um, a character with a with a very high intellect, but perhaps more than an intellect, a receptivity to the teachings of, of Jesus. And of course, this will become very important in the Gnostic, Gnostic Gospels. Um, and uh, the brother of Mary and Martha is Lazarus. And of course, this is the root of uh, the folk religion, the folk myth that um, the three of them, and others have uh, preached in the south of France, which uh, Thomas and many of you will be very familiar with. So I won't overdo this. But um, then we have a, the woman who's taken in adultery in the very act. And she's brought before Jesus by the scribes and Pharisees. And it's partly to test this upstart teacher of the new law, because of course the law of Moses commands that such should be stoned. And this allows Jesus to intervene to save her. He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. Uh, and then we get the unknown sinner in the house of Simon the Pharisee who anoints him and dries his feet with her hair. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. So we have all these women, some of whom were almost certainly the same woman, some of whom almost certainly weren't. But in 591 AD, Pope Gregory I decrees that they're all one and the same. And this is around the time, of course, the church is beginning to really emphasize the immaculate virginity of Mary, the mother of God, as a kind of desexualized uh, vision of the queen of heaven uh, as a goddess. And at the same time, this other Mary, the Magdalene, seems to become the repository for the patriarchal church's conflicted desire and disgust uh, when faced with female sexuality. And I'm going to take us back again, and it's worth the risk of this, I think, all, all round because of getting to these kind of images. Um, yep. Oh. <laughs> right. Share screen. Share screen, we're, we're getting there. I uh, share screen. Yeah. Yeah. There it is. Got it. Got Thank it. You. Lovely. Oh, well, I wanted you to have this because this one a lot of you won't have seen. This is a relatively recent mural uh, in St. Patrick's Chapel in Glastonbury, where I now live. And although it was only painted about in the last 20 or 30 years, 
It revives the medieval image of Mary Magdalene as this emblematic sinner possessed by seven devils or deadly sins. <clears throat> and you can see the sins here depicted in little cartoons of gluttony, lust, and so on. And they're being spat out by dragons. And the dragons seem to be bound to her body or perhaps even erupting from it, uh, prefiguring that scene in Alien. And the seventh devil is still within her, which is the sin of pride. So this is, uh, this is our, the image of Mary Magdalene that had been adopted already in, in medieval times. And the first time I sat in the chapel and looked at it, I was very disturbed by the way it objectified her and how it completely obscured the qualities of love, self-healing and awakened consciousness that Jesus so clearly recognized in her. And so deliberately or unconsciously, it was reiterating those old patriarchal projections. And it seemed to me almost like an evil spell to bind the Magdalene and her agency. And so one morning in the chapel, I found myself casting a spell to reclaim our Magdalene, uh, to free her from the judgment of men. Now in Glastonbury, there are many of us uh, casting spells and sometimes the spells just cancel each other out. Um, I think a good rule of thumb is always, if your spell is true, it will ring true and it will manifest itself. So uh, I try not to waste too much psychic energy trying to impose my spells on others. But this spell is encoded in a poem, which I'm gonna share with you now. And it's intended, as I say, to release the Magdalene from this image. The mural in St. Patrick's Chapel, Glastonbury Abbey, Baraga. Incontinent priests, Pope Gregory sealed their self-disgust to snag the painter's eye, reduce her to an emblem, a caution, the rosy, plump embodiment of pride. Mary Magdalene, with six of her seven devils extruded, six dragons spew forth pictographic sins, the glutton with fat pig, the lustful couple of fuck. I light a candle to cleanse and to redeem our Mary, priestess, strip away their composite whore come crazy girl to conceive six friendly dragons to flap and frolic in the lime washed space. Her soul at one with her Jesus and the Christ in him. Where's the seventh? That splotch on her shoulder or still lodged deep within she whose sin is forgiven for she loved much. That's um, a poem from Grail. My, um, is here, this is my book I wrote last year in Glastonbury. And, um, a lot of what I'm talking about, my, I wrote about uh, Mary Magdalene in, in the Southwark Mysteries, and we'll soon be coming to that, but um, it's taken on another life in Glastonbury where she's all over the town, really. Uh, in medieval times, or from medieval times onwards, Glastonbury Abbey's West Wall was bounded, appropriately enough, by Magdalene Street. And in fact, across the road, directly from the Abbey, we have Cock Lane, which ran down to St. Benina's Church into Grobe Cunt Lane. Now, that name, of course, was used in many English cities as a no-nonsense description of what went on in what we'd now more discreetly call red light districts. Uh, London's Lane is explicitly referred to in the Southwark Mysteries, and our Glastonbury Lane is a short hop from the Abbey. It's easy to imagine the monks uh, being led astray there. And it was important to us because when we left London three years ago, we sort of asked the goose to lead us where she would. So when we were finding, uh, uh, when we found out that our new home was on the corner of Cock Lane and Grove Cunt Lane, uh, we really felt the goose had been doing her work to make sure we knew what, that the game was afoot. Now, I've talked about this fabricated Mary Magdalene, the church's vision of her, and obviously how distorted that is. And yet even that image seems to have had the power to inspire and comfort and to heal and change lives, especially of those living on the edge. So in medieval times, the cult of the Magdalene establishes itself in strongly in cult uh, folk religion, both in France and England. And it helps to temper 
the harsh laws of patriarchy. Uh, for that reason, perhaps, it particularly attracted women because it allowed them a, a place, a space to express their own agency and their own yearning for divine consummation. And devotees would fa fast and pray, enter ecstatic trances or weep for days and nights, lamenting the physical suffering of Jesus and consciously, consciously channeling Mary Magdalene and her intimate relations with Jesus himself. The word maudlin uh, is a medieval variant of Magdalene or Maudeline, and it came to mean tearful. It's often associated with sentimental drunks. It would have originally been applied to women like uh, Marjorie Kemp, uh, a famous weeping devotee uh, of Jesus and the Magdalene. And by then, uh, uh, nowadays, of course, one can say that sentimental drunks would be included in those that the Magdalene wraps her mantle around. Alcoholics, drug addicts, and many others would be at home in her Church of the Outcast. And this Church of the Outcast, of course, develops not only from little clues, even in the Orthodox canonical Gospels, but particularly after 1945, we have the discovery of the uh, Nag Hammadi scrolls and the other lost Gnostic manuscripts. And these radically uh, expand our understanding of early Christianity, uh, the esoteric teachings of these mystery schools and desert communities from the second and third centuries AD. Of course, the Gnostics are practicing a discipline which is designed to liberate the spark of divinity trapped in matter. So far from being the son of the creator God, uh, the Christ comes to set us free from the ignorance in which we objectify and then unthinkingly worship the creator. One of their most idiosyncratic texts, the Pistis Sophia, was rediscovered in 1773, and it charts the fall of Sophia, the 13th eon, into the material universe, and then her ultimate penance and then restoration to her true place. And this text is represented as the resurrected Jesus teaching his disciples, initiating them into his esoteric teachings. And it's Mary Magdalene who takes the lead role in questioning him and helping him to elucidate the mystery. Coming up, I hope, is a lovely image of Mary Magdalene. Yep. Hopefully you can all see that. So Mary Magdalene, uh, this, this image is one of my favorites of her because it expresses that extraordinary sense of transcendence that she is actually in some sense channeling the same Holy Spirit that Christ embodies in their relationship. Um, it, in the dialogue of the Savior, one of the Nag Hammadi texts, Christ recognizes her special part in the unfolding. Okay. We can see it, yeah. You can see it, good. He, he tells her, you make clear the abundance of the revealer. In the Gospel of Philip, she's the consort of the Saviour, and Christ promises that she'll be united with him in the bridal chamber. And Philip also tells us that Christ loved her more than the other disciples and would kiss her on the mouth. They said to him, why do you love her more than us? In her own Gospel of Mary, the Magdalene reveals to the disciples the secret teachings that Christ transmitted to her personally. And in this, as in several other texts, Peter is troubled by her special relationship with the Savior. Did he really speak with a woman without our knowledge and not openly? Are we to turn about and all listen to her? Did he prefer her to us? So we have the heretical notion that Jesus and uh, Mary Magdalene married and had children. And this, of course, has been in circulation for centuries, despite the best efforts of the church to suppress it. Uh, I think the story probably in my lifetime revived, particularly in the 1970s. I remember the rock band Jefferson Airplane spelling it out in their song, The Son of Jesus. Jesus had a son by Mary Magdalene. And in 1982, of course, we get the publication of Holy Blood, Holy Grail, introducing the whole legend and the interpretation of the grail as Mary Magdalene's <laughs> womb and the royal bloodline descending from her and Jesus. Uh, the, the hidden meaning of Sang Graal, Holy Grail, revealed to be Sang Real, blood royal, 
and excuse my French uh, pronunciation. So um, evidence for uh, the child of Jesus and Mary is perhaps even more elusive uh, than the Joseph of Arimathea visit to Glastonbury. But indeed, Glastonbury has devised, devised its own version of the legend, probably only dating to the last 20 years or so, in which Jesus, Mary Magdalene and their child uh, visit my hometown. As a poetic truth, it's powerful and evocative. And I, I'm a great believer. I think I'd describe myself as a Blakeian if I had to define myself. And I'm a great believer in, in uh, the, the importance of poetic truth and, and not confusing it with literal truth. But that is not to say that it's in some way lesser than literal truth, but it is different. So, which brings us really to the Southwark Mysteries, which is what I want to talk to you about now. Uh, as I said, the book is published in my name, but in the preface, I credit its true authors saying, the Southwark Mysteries were revealed by the goose to John Crow at Crossbones on the night of the 23rd November, 1996. My shamanic double had somehow raised the spirit of a medieval whore, licensed by a bishop, yet allegedly denied Christian burial. So on that night, 23rd November, 1996, I had a vision uh, that changed my life and in a small way, the history of my part of London. It was a vision and I've also sometimes call it a visitation, although it wasn't a conventional haunting. I didn't literally see a ghost or hear a voice, but there was an undeniable presence and a, a palpable sense that a spirit had entered my attic room where I live and was putting words in my mind. Complex verse fragments, which were charged with esoteric meanings, riddles, enigmas, multiple histories, and shadowy hinterlands. As a play, playwright, I've spent years um, trying to uh, cultivate a state of mind that allows characters to speak for themselves. Nobody wants the author's message but I'd never come across anyone or anything really like the goose. I was impressed by the prophetic assurance of her voice and the depth and the detail of her backstory. It's as if she would just wafted in fully formed uh, to reveal her secret history. And in these verses, she reveals herself as a medieval sex worker, a Winchester goose, licensed by the Bishop of Winchester, yet she claims buried in the unconsecrated crossbones graveyard. Her origins are apparently in the 12th century. Certainly she refers a lot to the 12th century um, uh, liberty of the clink, but she seems to have the facility to move fluidly through time as if she's shifting her shape through different female incarnations. And she can manifest clearly as the profane whore, the most despised, brutalized, abused image of womanhood. But by the end of the journey, on each of the journeys I made with her, it's as if she's transfigured into a kind of an avatar, a mediatrix, or most accurately, I'd say a channel for agencies of the divine feminine. And I mentioned Isis, but the other critical character that comes through the goose is Mary Magdalene. The goose led John Crow, my alter ego, on, as it was, a journey in space and time through the back streets of Borough and Bankside. That's the part of Southwark, just south of London Bridge. And it, it's the oldest part of London with a history going back to the Romans, so 2,000 years. And the verses that came through that night seemed to cast a kind of enchantment, conjuring up vivid images leading my mind to places it wasn't sure it wanted to go and then ambushing it with vivid scenes from past lives, the goose and her outcasts. In the middle of the night, she announced that we're gonna walk it. And she proceeded to lead us physically through the deserted South London back streets. We did a strange loop um, to the yard of the long gone Tabard Inn where Chaucer and the pilgrims set out for Canterbury. Uh, to Mary Overy Dock, where a legendary miserly ferryman had tried to trick death and play, paid the ultimate price. And then down to the Thames mudflats by the site of the Plink prison, 
the bear pits, the sites of the great Elizabethan playhouses like the Globe and the Rose. And finally, looping back through, um, through the back streets to the gates of a desolate wasteland. It looked like an, a, an abandoned industrial site. And it was adjoining Red Cross Way, a back street. It was boarded up and there was a rusty iron gate through which I could see what looked like an abandoned work site. There were tin cans rattling and scraps of paper blowing around in the wind. But the goose was unequivocal. This was her sacred ground, the key to her mysteries. And this was where she caused my alter ego to break into song and prophesy in John Crow's riddle. For tonight in hell, they are tolling the bell for the whore that lay at the tabard. And well we know how the carrion crow does feast in our crossbones graveyard. So when I sang and then wrote down those words that night, I thought that the goose had sort of, that this was a sort of poetic truth, Crossbones Graveyard, of the place that she would have been buried. But when I started researching the history behind what I'd written, I discovered that Crossbones had been an actual historical place. It had been described, uh, well, by John Stowe in 1598 as the single women's churchyard. Single women were a euphemism, of course, for sex workers. And for the same reason, although it was also called St. Saviour's Burying Ground after the local church, which is now Southwark Cathedral, it was also known as the Magdalene Churchyard. Again, Magdalene, of course, by medieval times, used as an expression uh, to describe sex workers. But I discovered not only that I'd been led to this site that I didn't know anything about uh, and that my poem totally reflected, but I also found out it had been recently dug up and um, bones removed uh, during work on the Jubilee line extension. So I'm going to just see if I can share that with you now. Um, yeah, so uh, here's the Southwark Mistress. Uh, this was the work that grew out of this, um, that the goose uh, revealed to me on this night. And she revealed it all around this area of London. You can see there the river in, at the top of this picture. And um, on the top right, St. Saviour, that is now Southwark Cathedral. And you can see below it, perhaps the churchyard. That's where the good people were buried. But the area that's marked here in purple, this is Crossbones. And this was where sex workers and outcasts of all kinds were buried. And I'd known nothing about it, but somehow I'd written a very long intricate poem about it and then discovered uh, that it had just been dug up and here you can see work going on to move some of the bones some of which were really treated very badly as if they were spoiled and so really this discovery made me realize that I hadn't either just come up with an idea and far less had I just gone mad and tuned into something it was as if I tuned into something so real that was happening in my backyard that I felt compelled to enter into a, a what I, well, first a literary work to write about it. And as I progressed, it became very clear that this was also uh, in a sense, a magical work that I had to um, do. And so I, I began performing that poem. And then over the next three years, seven vision books, the book of the goose, the book of the crow and so on, uh, each emerged on a separate night and each emerged from an encounter between the goose and John Crow uh, which the writer, John Constable, wrote down to the best of his ability. And um, at the same time, these verses, which sort of had value to me in their own right, seemed to contain instructions for the nature of the magical works that we were about to engage in. And uh, above all, the goose made it clear that they wanted to be remembered in the simple sense of memorialized, but also perhaps in the Isis Osiris sense of a broken body being put back together and made whole. And so we held the first of the Halloween of Crossbones. And here, hopefully you can see um, a ceremony we conducted. So it began with a ceremony and a performance of these uh, channeled poems that were transmitted by the Goose Spirit and received by John Crow and written down by John Constable. Uh, the Goose here, this is actually an illustration from the book when it was published. Uh, and as you can see here is the Goose Conceived 
and it's based on a 16th century woodcut, which was originally titled A Common Whore. So uh, this, is, this is, if you like, the goose's profane side, but of course the, Magda the Magdalene embodies the sacred in the profane, and this became very much the theme of, all, of the Southwark Mysteries. As it was developing, the Halloween of Crossbones, as I say, included its poems as they evolved, and it, it always ended with this procession to the gates, and we began writing the names of some of the crossbones dead on ribbons and tying them to the gates, symbolically binding and loosing them, remembering them, but also setting them free. And this became very important. And it led us, it led naturally to the creation of a shrine on these gates, which were just rusty industrial gates. Uh, but gradually we took them over and turned them into a shrine uh, to the outcast. And meanwhile, we continued to do our magical works on crossbones on the graveyard. Uh, this, at this stage, we were not even officially allowed on site, um, but it, did, uh, it didn't stop us, let us say. So let's stop share, and I'll give you a few fragments here. Of, in the first vision book, the Book of the Goose, uh, Mary Magdalene is only referred to obliquely as, say, the Magwitch or St. Mary Overy but you can hear her voice in many of the lines. And when I hear those hypocrites decrying and denying me, who make of me the vessel of all known vice and depravity, the way they talk, I swear, you'd think I was the whore of Babylon, as they make of me an altar, they see fit to rape my children on. And then in the Book of the Crow, the second of, of the seven vision books, and indeed in most of the other vision books, the Magdalene is explicitly identified. Uh, in the church pews and stews, they whisper the news, the ghost of an old goose's heresy, that the Magdalene whore, a love child bore to the dancing Lord of the Liberty. And I was in that Magdalene whore who walked the streets of Bermondsey, I traded hard in every yard to keep the child at liberty. Come trickster, shaman, prophet and fool, speaking in tongues of the mystery. Let all men contend, but God defend the lineaments of my liberty. Come snake and whistle and rattle and drum. Come open me cavern in jubilee. Come open me tomb to crackle and boom and let the bells ring in the liberty. Come Christian and Jew, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, let each to his own true divinity. Let even the blind material mind walk their own hallowed path at liberty and seek not to bind the visions you find in naming the parts of the mystery. In naming the part, don't miss the heart, the heart of my holy liberty, though you trick me up as virgin or whore and make me to base right bestially. I am the dancing child, the door that opens into eternity. That's an extract from the Book of the Crow. And you can see the goose self-identifies, the goose Magdalene, with sex workers and with many kinds of outcasts. And she expressing, I think, a spiritual work that's practiced not in church, but at street shrines and in unconsecrated graveyards. Now, what happened? We were performing the Halloween of Crossbones every year for a magical cycle of 13 years, beginning in 1998. But already by 1999, and this was through a process of Chinese whispers, uh, the late Dean of Southwark Cathedral, the very Reverend Colin Slee, heard that I was writing a Southwark mystery play. Now, he assumed that was in the tradition of the English mystery plays, when in fact, at the time, the Southwark mysteries only existed in the form of verses received from a medieval sex worker. I hadn't planned to write a mystery play, but um, Colin encouraged me and um, the goose gave me many affirmations. So I, I took on the job. And as it developed, uh, my meetings with Colin Slee, the Dean, became a bit like theological wrestling matches as because he was trying to impress on me what you need in a mystery play, creation, the fall, Cain and Abel, and so on. And he was very concerned at, the pagan elements, and especially my references to God as female. I, meanwhile, was defending my vision of the goose as a manifestation of Mary Magdalene. And in fact, it was Mary Magdalene who helped us find common ground, which seems most appropriate. Um, 
The mystery play was performed on the 23rd of April, 2000. And I'm going to show it you now. Nope. Uh, yeah. Hopefully there, you can see it in Shakespeare's globe. This is Satan uh, breaking through the gash. The gash is, is which John Crow and the Goose uh, on the left of Satan dancing away there. Uh, they've just come through this gash, which was the gash was formed when the Jubilee Line extension tunnelers dug up the Crossbones graveyard. And Satan is using the Goose and John Crow, the two wickedest souls uh, in the world at the time. Uh, Satan is trying to use them to start a, an apocalypse. Uh, here's Di Sherlock, who first played the Goose in the year 2000. And um, the play was performed on the 23rd of April 2000, which was St. George's Day, Shakespeare's birthday, and also Easter Sunday. Uh, so it really did, it caused a bit of a sensation, in fact. Uh, a lot of uh, disgruntled Christians thought it was uh, diabolical, but the Dean stood by us. And indeed his successor, um, Andrew Nunn, the very Reverend Andrew Nunn, uh, developed a relationship with Crossbones. And here you see, he actually married uh, myself and Katie Nichols, my wife, and, and co-practitioner. Uh, he married us in, in Southwark Cathedral. And, and if you look at the audience, you can see there were quite a few pagans uh, and wild people there. And the Dean loved all this. And uh, he took it so to heart. Uh, I'll just, uh, here's, here's the, the marriage, can, the wedding continuing. Hopefully we're seeing all this. Let's just make sure I'm seeing it on. We can see it, yeah, yeah. Yes, good, good, good. There we are. There you can see it better, I hope. So this is us processing down uh, in Southwark Cathedral. Our, our processional music was um, God is a DJ by uh, Faithless, played on the church organ magnificently. And this is what I wanted to bring us to, because the dean once said to me, well, you're doing what we should be doing in the church. And he was, a, this is a very remarkable dean. He's only just retired, Andrew Nunn. But he took it upon himself to start a a particular service to be performed on the nearest Sunday to St. Mary Magdalene's feast day. So in fact, it's tomorrow, this is gonna be happening again for the seventh time, I believe, where the Dean comes to the graveyard and scatters holy water, but doesn't re-consecrate it because we decided that would be insulting to all the pagan, pagans who fought to protect the site. But what he does do is actually say, sorry, it's called an act of regret, remembrance, restoration. And on behalf of the church, he actually apologizes to the women of Crossbones and pledges that the church will do better in future. And although this is, of course, a, a, only a small symbolic act, a poetic truth, I nevertheless find it in, intensely moving. Uh, and always when we have the blessing, so this will also will be happening tomorrow, we combine it with the bards. It's always called blessing and bards. And the bardic part involves well, I perform work from the Southwark Mysteries and sometimes others do, or they perform their own work. And there are many songs and poems and little dramas that have been inspired by the story of Crossbones. I mean, most famously, uh, Frank Turner, um, the singer wrote a song called the, the Graveyard of the Outcast Dead. And it's through this work, uh, magical work effectively, uh, that the graveyard was saved, obviously, we had to underwrite the magic, magical works, underpin them with cultural interventions and relentless activism. But it led to the official protection, not only of our shrine to the outcast, but to the creation of a garden of remembrance to, dedicated to sex workers and to all outsiders. And all this had begun with Friends of Crossbones working with the security guard who was supposed to be keeping us off the site. He was actually paid to keep us off and he ended up giving me a key to the site. And we worked together then to create what became known as the Invisible Garden. So this is right in the heart of London. And this is a site owned by Transport for London, which is valued at 25 million. And uh, this picture probably taken around 2008. TFL literally had no idea, Transport for London had no idea that there was a garden on the site. They thought it was still an industrial work site. And um, so this is all the work that has been developing at the site. And eventually when uh, they needed to move our gates because our gates were originally adjacent to site that we weren't even contesting. It was the site to the north of Crossbones. And um, they, 
they were starting work on the site. So they moved uh, the gates here and you can see that they moved them with such care, they didn't handle a sink, harm a single ribbon. I'll um, just return briefly. Of course, the reason they partly respected the gates was because they understood they were protected by things they didn't fully understand. And we tried to encourage that belief by putting up, for example, paper cuts from the Day of the Dead. Or this, my partner Katie uh, made a crochet skull, uh, which as you can see, creates a sort of three dimensional portal at the gates. Uh, so come back to uh, the mystery play. As I say, it was performed in Shakespeare's Globe and Southwark Cathedral. And in it, the goose acts out aspects of the church's composite Magdalene. Um, she's possessed by the seven devils or presented as tabloid paparazzi, which Jesus expels. But as I went deeper into writing the Southwark Mysteries, I, I came to personally see the question of whether Jesus and Mary married and had children. Uh, to me, as a distraction, I, I'm not criticizing the theories that they did, but to me, it became much more interesting to think of the child as the esoteric doctrines that Jesus passed down to her, transmitted not in holy books, but in songs, plays, and stories, in theaters, taverns, and even in brothels. My mystery play has Magdalene smashing the pot of oil to anoint Jesus for death. And for this, of course, Judas scolds and insults her. When Jesus then embraces her as his priestess, Peter protests, and Jesus answers him directly in the Southwark Mysteries, do you not see? Mary Magdalene is the chosen one, for she alone followed where my secret path lead, where I must be made whole in each of my parts. Peter, of my church, I made you the head, but it takes a Magdalene to open its heart. And the mystery play ends in Southwark Cathedral uh, with an invocation from the book of the Magdalene, the seventh of the vision books, uh, and it envisages, envis envisages thank you, uh, the goose Magdalene being embraced back into the church in an act of mutual forgiveness. And here's a brief excerpt. Entombed in the shadow of Bedlam, the Imperial Museum of War, in the Garden of Peace, the Winchester geese consort with Quan Yin and the Magdalene whore. In the wards of old Guy's leaden tower, in the Elephant and Castle subway, they graffiti her name, she who comes to reclaim the world that was taken away on the steps of St. George the Martyr, red-eyed and roaring, a bum did totter and sway and topple and splay and stutter the words, she is come, she is come out of Egypt by Greenwich, upriver the dogs to her right, along the black beach around Limehouse Reach with the city of London in sight. In cathedral, Provost may ponder if he should unbar the great door with a wink and a nod to the glory of God in the guise of an unredeemed whore. Let Bishop's crook offer him counsel, ways and means for the door to unjam. If needs must be seen that the whore be washed clean of her sin in the blood of the lamb, then let it be so. But then let it go the guilt and the shame and the sin. Let go of the law that made her a whore. And then for God's sake, let her in. Let in, let in. Let no color of skin nor creed debar other from ceremony. Let the gong of Tibet bong out an octet with the bells of St. Mary Overy. And so we're coming into the final stretch of this, um, I'd like to offer the work at Crossbones and the Southwark Mysteries indeed, as a kind of exemplar of how a vision uh, can repattern our reality and manifest in ways that can change the present and the future, and in some strange way, even change the past. Because when we reimagine history, we change our whole relationship with it, if I would contend. In 1995, Crossbones was at best an historical footnote, a pauper's graveyard long ago shut down, abandoned, forgotten. And by the completion of the 23-year magic, magical work, 
at Crossbones, it was recognized as the final resting ground of the Winchester geese. It had become a world famous heritage site and visited by pilgrims from all walks of life. And there are now agreements in place to protect the sanctity of the site given both by the developers of the adjacent land and by the owners, Transport for London. And this year, which I must show you now, um, this year, here we go now, do we? Here we go, nearly. So, ah, hopefully you can now see a Roman mosaic. This is quite extraordinary, especially given the Isis and Magdalene references. <clears throat> Uh, obviously, this would have dated from not long after the Magdalene may have even been in Southwark. Uh, but this is a Roman mosaic on the site that I mentioned that it's just north of Crossbones and it's due to be developed. And this is what they've discovered, one of the most impressive archaeological finds for the, la for the last 50 years, a Roman temple just north of Crossbones. And so um, on November the 23rd, 2019, exactly 23 years to the night after uh, the Goose Vision, I completed my work uh, with the Goose Magdalene. And um, I asked her to lead Katie and I where she would, and she led us to our new home in Glastonbury. And my new book, Grail, uh, basically is charting um, our first year and a half here. And if anyone interested in that can contact me through the crossbones.org.uk website if you'd like a copy uh let me know i th i find her all over glastonbury and in, in obvious places you know there's a roman catholic church of our lady saint mary of glastonbury uh there's a a chapel which is actually the magdalene chapel uh is it, sorry it's actually the chapel of saint margaret uh but most people in glastonbury have reclaimed it as the magdalene chapel uh and uh, of course the goddess temple where the goddess is highly revered but I think you find the goddess not only in places that are self-consciously religious, but you know, in, in where the Hare Krishnas are serving the travelers uh, outside uh, the high, in the high street or down in the traveler's camp at uh, Beckery, close to the site of Mary Magdalene Chapel on St. Bride's Mound. So when we see her at work in others, especially those who live more on the edge than we do, then we truly begin, I think, uh, to comprehend her. But you don't need to come to, hang on, I'm being handed a note. Monday, Sunday church honoring. Thank you. Yes, Katie. that's Katie Chaos, uh, the other side of this screen, reminding me about tomorrow to remind you. But you don't, yeah, you don't have to come to Glastonbury. If you happen to be in London, you can come tomorrow and see her honoured at Crossman's Graveyard by the Dean at one o'clock with the blessing, the act of regret, remembrance, restoration from two till four with the bards, myself and others, uh, performing work inspired by crossbows. And then at seven o'clock in the evening at the gates in Red Cross Way for the monthly vigil, I believe it's the 229th consecutive monthly vigil. It began on the 23rd of June, 2004, and we haven't missed a single uh, 23rd, even during COVID. And as I say, I left uh, three or four years ago and um, it's continued with other people carrying it forward. So just my very final thoughts on this. Firstly, as a channel of the Magdalene current, I see the goose as primarily a, an agency of healing and reconciliation. I invoke her to turn me away from judgment to compassion for others, and no less crucially for myself. The healing of rifts and divisions manifests on many levels. Um, if we conceive her as the divine feminine incarnate in a sex worker, then the Goose Magdalene is vitally engaged in the work of sexual healing. And in this aspect, she can be invoked for each of us personally to heal our most intimate sexual or emotional wounds. In our collective spiritual experience, she mediates to reconcile tensions between the spirit and the flesh. These tensions amplified in the teachings of the church ever since at least St. Augustine. But the Goose Magdalene goes far beyond uh, consecrating the pleasures of the senses. On the deepest level, she's here to heal the rifts between the spirit in the flesh, the sacred in the profane, eternity in time. And the Goose always emphasizes the in. These are, these are contraries, but the one is revealed in the other. 
the spirit in the flesh, the sacred in the profane, eternity in time. And so with this in mind, I'm going to end where I began with a very short recital from the end of the Book of the Goose. This is the Goose's prophecy. And as I said, this was transcribed uh, along with a much longer poem in my original notebook on the Night of the Goose, 23rd November 1996. Um, I just should mention that um, you'll hear when I read the poem, I quote, the day shall be 23, then in the month of July, and the day shall be 23 in the year of Our Lady Mary Overy, Southwark shall arise naked in her liberty on the south bank of the Thames, arrayed in all her finery. You'll hear it in a moment and so on. But I recently checked my original notebook in which I transcribed the verses that night. And I was shocked to see that I'd originally written that in the month July and the day shall be 23 in the year of our Lord, 2023. So I changed the line because this was embodying the divine feminine and also to avoid the repetition of 23. But um, for anyone who's interested, so tomorrow is the date named in the goose's prophecy uh, for something apocalyptic to happen. Although as John Crow likes to say, it's already happened. Uh, we're just not paying attention. And with that in mind, I end with the goose's prophecy and then we'll open it up to questions. That's, I tricked mad John Crow when he was in his ecstasy to lend me his voice to make known my prophecy that in the month July and the day shall be 23, in the year of Our Lady Mary Overy, Southwark shall arise naked in her liberty on the south bank of the Thames arrayed in all her finery with all her children endowed with grace and dignity the deformed and the deviant embraced into her unity with Lambeth below her, Blake's garden in eternity. She shall open her loins to make all the concavity shall shuffle to left flick, then shuffle right another three. She'll strip the decks for one last sacred profanity and the hypocrite shall blanch. Does she sanction such depravity? The great whore of revelation is not that surely she relaxed here. You're over here. Don't go busting an artery or poisoning a river with your self-loathing fartery. The body we all know, dear, is privy to mortality. This flesh shall rot and wither as you're so fond of reminding me. And when your kind's done, when you're done despoiling me, when you've had your fun, son, you've no further use for me, so pipe down, shut your mouth. Show some respect, humility, and hearken to that silence. What is brimming with immensity unspeakable shall speak, and in one word unfold her mystery. Pronounce the end of time and beginning of eternity, and all her children gathered there in all their multiplicity with one voice shall speak her name. And her name is Liberty. Thank you. And I'm going to just finish by showing you the slides that I haven't. Thank you very much. And then we'll open it up to, um, to, to all of this. So uh, again, uh, I know Thomas is, a, is going to do that any second. Here we go, just a few slides. This is my friend Maya, a lovely image of the goose, I think, goose woman. Maya was a student when she did that. There's the map of the Liberty uh, referred to in that last prophecy. And her name is Liberty. Here's the shrine now at the gates. This is Red Cross Mary, who is always, she cradles a small goose. Uh, so that's the symbol really of mother of God cradling the Magdalene and the goose. And here she is uh, in a photo taken in the winter, Red Cross Mary with her goose. And there's an image from uh, Crossbones. And uh, for those of you interested, please make a note of the uh, website because the whole story in more detail and videos and much more links to my books and, and all sorts of things are all up there. And uh, I'm now gonna stop that share, hopefully you can see me again. 
and uh, I'll, I'll take questions, Thomas. I yeah. hope that's uh, enough. Yeah, no, thank you very much, John. You've done a brilliant talk. We greatly appreciate not only your talk, but all that work you've done. I mean, it hats off. Um, many people get downloads, but very few follow it up with discipline. I, I can tell you've been to Cambridge University. You've got that good combination of intellect <laughs> and openness to spirituality. Um, thank you so much for all that work. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah. Yeah. Ginger, you've got your hand up first. Oh, yes. I mean, I'm just thrilled to death. I, I want an absolute encompassing just spirit and and revelations and and just it's like it's i'm in your beautiful bubble of of, of everything i was floating along with you i do want to make just an observation my understanding is uh uh, our Yeshua, Jesus's great uncle, was a wealthy tin man, a, a miner, uh, whatever. He took Jesus to Glastonbury, where Jesus prepared a waddle for his mother. Then after he was gone, howsoever, then uh, Joseph of Arimathea brought Mary Magdalene, his mother, to Glastonbury. And that the song, even the hymn goes today, among the green, he walked uh, about speaking of Jesus. But what happened is uh, the Catholics, my understanding is they build cathedrals over sacred grounds. And so they built the Abbey of Glastonbury and then King Edward in the second, Edward the second raised it, burned it to the ground, but the monks, squirreled away or took the scrolls, the copper scrolls to Scotland. And that's where the Colburn Bible comes from. All these ancient scrolls of, so that's my understanding. And that's why all in Glastonbury speak of Mary Magdalene because she walked as well. She was amongst them. She walked amongst them. So it all kind of, it's like, it's all coming together. Thank you, my darling, for all your, <laughs> yeah, cheers, cheers. <laughs> cheers, salute. <laughs> Thank you, Ginger. If I can, may I just Thank briefly you. respond? Yeah, do reply. Yes, please. Yeah. That was, that's a very uh, interesting, th some very interesting lines there. You mentioned Joseph of Arimathea, of course. And yes, I mean, the thing is, there are many stories about Joseph, and I think they're all best regarded, as I say, as, as embodying poetic, maybe rather than historical truth. It's tricky when you try to prove this. Really, the stories about Joseph only start appearing in Glastonbury around um, the 12th century um, in, in the writings of monks. Now, that's not to deny, of course, oral <laughs> tradition. And, or even of older books that may have been lost. So all of this is, is the unknown, but certainly Joseph seems to appear around the 12th century in Glastonbury and then seems to, his legend carries on developing. And certainly, uh, as you say, Ginger, the, the Tin Man story, I think is very interesting. There is an old folk song in England, Joseph was a Tin Man. And um, there's a place near Glastonbury called Priddy uh, where as sure as Christ walked at Priddy is said. So the idea of Joseph then bringing Jesus is certainly also has some um, historical, you know, depth, even if it is a legend. I, I did say about the Mary Magdalene story, I've tried to trace this earlier, but I can only really find it existing in Glastonbury around the 80s and 90s. And I think that probably coincides with certainly the, the emergence of goddess worship on a very big scale in in Glastonbury. And by saying that, as I said earlier, when I talked about the poetic truth, that's not to dismiss it. It's to say that maybe myth and religion, spirituality has functions that a poetic truth can carry perhaps better than sometimes a literal truth. That's my thought on it. Great. Uh, Lawrence, um, yeah, go for it. Could you introduce yourself as well? Um, yes. Um, I sort of know John, um, 
we've been conversing. Um, I worked in Southwark for a number of years, just after the new millennium. And, uh, you know, strange things started to happen regarding my ancestry. I found out all of my ancestors, hitherto unknown, worked on the borough market and they lived in Southwark all around, all the places that John talks about. Um, and, you know, my great, great, great granddad, whose ancestry we believe is Scottish, he's buried somewhere in Southwark um, and not been able to find that out yet. There's a lot of burial grounds here. So, yeah, um, some mystical things started happening to me as soon as I visited there. And I won't go into them to multitudes, but it, it just, you know, avalanche of stuff started happening, you know, awareness-wise. Um, my bones are very cross with John, though, because for the last <laughs> six months or so, I've had it in my my bones, my intuition, that, the 23rd of July in 2023 was the month of the prophecy. But old John there has to hide it by talking about Mary Overy instead <laughs> of talking about the year of our Lord. And I get the, the sacred feminine, and I get yeah. why you wanted to preserve that. But bloody hell, man, you know, you left it to the last bloody moments and you feel <laughs> that. You know, um, come on, I've been struggling with this and trying to convince <laughs> people all over the globe, you know, that this is happening. And now you've come out and said what I've been trying to convince people of for a year. <laughs> so well done. Um, I'll be there tomorrow. Uh, I'll be there with you. Uh, and we've shared a lot. And uh, there's other stuff that I'm involved with, you know, with other prophecies that link into this. And I think it's a, it's a very, very big day tomorrow and um very big day and you've you've locked into something which is ancient primordial but also here you know here being one of the verses i'd love to actually read that tomorrow with your permission but uh, anyway we'll see how we go but um yeah tomorrow well um something very sacred and profane will happen tomorrow i've said you know tend to sense energy. I've just come back from a Greek holiday, Ephesus and Turkey, you know, visited the places where Magdalene was and, you know, went up the Acropolis in Athens and, you know, before you get out to the top, the, the thing, we had a really good guide and she she pointed out something. I've, I've been there a couple of times before, but she said, on the halfway up there, you know, she said, oh, on your left is, a, is an ISIS sanctuary. She said, you'll notice it because... The stone is different. You've got all the white marble up the top there, you know, Temple of Athens, you know, Athena. But halfway down on the left, very good guide, she said, that's the sanctuary of Isis. And it was red marble from Egypt. So you've got Isis being worshipped there, you know, under Southwark Cathedral, Isis. They found the jump. John knows all this. You probably all know it, you know. So I've worked at London Bridge. I've worked in Tooley Street. I've worked in all the places that John and the Goose and John Crow have mentioned about. It's in my bones. So every verse, every word has a resonance. And one thing, I won't go on with this, but my name's Lawrence, Lawrence Rush, Larry Rush. I don't recognise the name Lawrence, never been comfortable with that. So it's Larry Rush. So ever since I've been young, people call me Laz, Lazarus, Lazar. What are you calling me? That's not my name. No, but you're Lazarus. So I've had this throughout my whole life. For, for, this is football <laughs> colleagues, it's fam. Everyone calls me Lazarus. And I thought, what are you doing? And in recent years, when I've become familiar with other uh, stuff, um, I've now sort of accepted that Lazarus is a is something that I'm connected to. I won't go into it, but, um, you know, so Johnny Boy there, you know, he's partly responsible for that, although, you know, he's helped develop it. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff in play, definitely gateways, definitely pathways opening. So, thank you. Yeah. Sorry to go Thanks. on, but yeah. Larry. I'll leave it there. Yeah. No, but thank you, Larry. It's great to see you and hear you at once, because Larry's been... Um, getting interested in in this over the last year and, and has sent me 
I mean, you've been interested in it much longer, but specifically within the Southwark Mysteries and the Goose and Crossbones. And Larry regularly sends me stuff. I'm not always so good at getting back, but I try. And it's great to see you. Um, in terms of what you said, yeah, well, it allowed you to be the prophet going out there saying, he's talking about the 23rd of July, 2023. But I hope you understand, you know, for the poem, the year of our lady, Mary Overy, rather than the year of our Lord, it did seem important. And I did change the odd lines, you see. I think, I mean, it was extraordinary how much of the Book of the Goose and the Southwark Mysteries was, as it were, just transcribed. It, it, it was downloaded and the whole gist of it was there. But as a writer, of course, I will occasionally polish and shape things. And there's an example of where it, it's made sense for me. And in a way, in view of what you've said, Larry, I find that quite good, you know, that there is an esoteric dimension there that now you all know, and uh, others probably who talk to me can find out or talk to Larry, which is precisely that tomorrow, the 23rd of July, 2023, is when Southwark will arise naked in her liberty. How that will actually manifest, well, we shall see. But I'm a great believer in um, not taking these omega points too seriously. After all, in my lifetime, I've survived already quite a few ends of the world. Um, and mm -hmm. indeed, Jesus, at the very end of the Southwark Mysteries, says of God um, that, you know, un until he's no longer something out there, until we are one within, and until we stop waiting for the end of the world and let it begin. And that to me is very central to how I feel about these mysteries. Yeah, the world, it, we should all, those of us who have the spiritual life, it's almost our responsibility to project the idea that there is a future for humanity and that that future could be very, very wonderful and that it's already here in a sense. We only have to uh, really pay attention and stop um, stop the, the dramas. And that's easier said than done, our own projections. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, John. I'd like to just comment a, a couple of things. Um, again, thanking you. Um, what maybe you didn't realize before we kind of met up is that I lived in Southwark um, myself for a number of years. And I think I was there in 96. I was just moving out of London to the Cotswolds. But I lived in Southwark from 1990 to 96-ish. I ran a thing called Peace House, which was a center for mediation and spirituality and philosophy. And I was working in the House of Lords in, in because it's so that's quite close to the Lords. I'd pop up there once a month and run a seminar on peace and ethics. And so I know Southwark, Southwark very well. I worked for Southwark Mediation Service. And I was very, you know, it's a very mysterious part of the world. And the connection with Shakespeare has always interested me. You brought in Shakespeare into your talk and you yourself acted in some Shakespeare. Um, I've always been um, someone that can channel Shakespeare in my own way. <clears throat> and I have read a book by Ted Hughes called Shakespeare and the Goddess. And I'm interested in <clears throat> Shakespeare's called the Bard of Britain. He was intimately connected with Southern. There's all the mysteries about who was Shakespeare, what was the authorship of that. Um, he was obviously an initiate. He was a, he was a bard in the deepest sense of the mysteries. <coughs> and that part of London is steeped in what I call them the ancient Druidic mysteries, as was Blake consciously working. Hmm. <laughs> What's your view on Shakespeare and the mysteries? And what do you think he would have made of of uh, Mary Magdalene. Does Mary Magdalene figure in Shakespeare's work and why hasn't anybody done a thesis on that? Mm, interesting, interesting thought. <laughs> um, it's clear that, I mean, there's, there's a lot of evidence, even for the, if we assume Shakespeare is who many people do assume he was, which is obviously not in itself certain, but then it seems quite likely that he might, he may have been a Catholic at a time where that was not a great idea. So his own, even his sort of, um, his outward religion became a secretive thing, possibly. And um, I mean, clearly, although there are strong Christian themes in Shakespeare's work, um, we're, I think we're very aware also of, of pagan elements 
um, very strongly. Um, and particularly, of course, that Renaissance period allowed the idea of the poetic conceit so that you could be a good Christian and still write a hymn to Venus or Isis or, you know, I, I think this is an interesting thing that Shakespeare fully exploits. Um, I mean, wonderfully, say in Midsummer Night's Dream, for example, you know, where he actually allows the fairy world not only to um, to inter interpenetrate our own, but also allows some of the more dangerous and darker aspects of that fairy world to manifest. I thought, I mean, that's quite extraordinary. It's interesting, as you say, Thomas, I would agree with you. He was clearly an initiate in some form. It's the question is of what? Uh, obviously, I'm quite familiar with the Baconian um, view. And indeed, I was friends with John Michel, who, among other things, uh, championed the Baconian uh, story. Indeed, did Mark Rylance, I, to a great extent, um, you know, who was the who actually ran Shakespeare's Globe. I mean, I think he was convinced that it was Bacon. I always, I do have some difficulties with it. I mean, I do find there's an element of snobbery. Um, the idea that a spear shaker uh, or the son of a butcher or whatever he was, you know, could ever write these sublime works. And I, I think sometimes academic studies of Shakespeare have pushed him perhaps too far into the area of the court and the university. And that particularly struck me reading when I was researching the Southwark Mysteries, I came, I was thinking about, and I came across a reference to Romeo and Juliet being inspired by a fairly obscure Italian story. I and mean, they found, you know, the original in a manuscript. And so if he was a high, so the argument was, oh, well, he must have been, you know, Bacon or somebody at court to have had access to this sort of material. Whereas, of course, the simpler idea was he was hanging out in a stew or a, a tavern on Bankside and some Italian sailor told him the story. You know, I mean, sometimes we can overcomplicate these things. And I think the thing I loved about what the goose showed me about Shakespeare was the man and the, in a way, the man of the people. Because, you know, Shakespeare's plays were performed on Bankside in the Globe and the Rose. I mean, they were surrounded by bear pits and brothels. Uh, that was why people came to Bankside. It wasn't a polite entertainment area. It was, in fact, it was quite dangerous as well, full of, you know, um, uh, coney catchers and cut purses of all kinds. So to me, actually, I think discovering all this in the course of researching the Southwark Mysteries, it re-energized Shakespeare for me because I, you know, I mean, he was arrested for nearly killing someone in a duel. He, he, and Marlowe himself was killed, you know, in a bar. They were, they were quite wild, you know, they were probably as wild as, say, the uh, some of the decadent poets of, of the turn of the century and the symbolists. Um, so, yeah, I think Shakespeare is very complicated because <laughs> clearly, he clearly, you know, he knows the, his stuff that would make him a court man. But he's got the common touch. And, and there's a wonderful book I'd recommend to people who enjoy a bit of bawdy or bawdry. And that's a book called Shakespeare's Bawdry, which I had recourse to when I was writing. Uh, it was published in the 40s or 50s, so it's relatively discreet. But I mean, it establishes, you know, that Shakespeare has, I think, 68 maybe names for the female part that are uh, used, you know, and, and some are very beautiful, like Venus Glove is my favorite. Whereas a clack dish is pretty crude and, you know, male goal orientated kind of stuff. So, um, you know, he's, he's got the whole range of stuff. And that to me does suggest Shakespeare, when he was on Bankside, he wasn't walking around like a monk. He was probably in some of those brothels. And if he wasn't there for business, he was probably chatting to the women, you know, to because in my own experience, often sex workers have got some of the best stories. And although they can be discreet, they, uh, they don't usually name names, but you mm. hear wonderful stories if you make friends with sex workers. <laughs> so I've, I've got a final question. Um, we're waiting for our next speaker, but we started today's conference with a brilliant uh, musical performance. I hope you'll watch it on Catch Up. I will, yes. Um, by Jaya, who is an um, amazing woman from, from um, um, Boulder in Colorado, who's staying here in France with me. 
and she has worked as a sex coach and counsellor, um, including to sex workers. You know, it's a sort of thing in America, people coming out, getting rid of the shame and saying, mm. no, I, I just choose to work with my body and it's not something to be ashamed of. Um, and then we have the, the <clears throat> I have a good friend who has been the speaker at the Green Gathering for many years like me. She wanted to set up a temple for Aphrodite in London. And in the temple for Aphrodite, there would be priestesses resident giving like sex coaching advice as it was in the ancient Aphrodite temples. So you went and Corinth was the headquarters. Mm. You went to the Aphrodite temple to pray to the goddess to send you a beautiful partner or whatever. And and to get advice on your sex life. Um, and and of course, around the temple were, let's say, the, the more refined type of brothels mm. where you would where you would get let's call it spiritual sex. <clears throat> and we heard from Jaya earlier about this notion that sex can be a vehicle to illumination. It can be a, a path to wisdom, actually, not something dirty and shameful. So my question is sort of, is it time to set up a temple for Aphrodite in London? Would it not be a good place to put it as Southwark? And, and to have people that are actually trained in um, you know, the goddess mysteries at their highest. And and this kind of, I mean, what Jaya said is that we need to raise the consciousness around sexuality. Yes. And if we can do that, we can save humanity. Is that, is that what, is that what the goose would want? Oh, I think uh, so. I'm just asking, I'm being provoked. <laughs> yeah. I'm just asking for a friend. <laughs> just asking for a friend <laughs> yes i think thomas yes yes and yes really is the short answer uh i think it would be entirely appropriate to have a um, training of, of of sex workers um particularly of course because you mentioned this idea of spiritual sex and um we know that various tantrikas and as sadhus have practiced the idea of sex in graveyards and although that can be sensationalized as a sort of in a sun expose sort of way. Clearly there is a, a, a very deliberate in intent behind that, which is precisely, you know, to, um, to bring together death, sex and death, Eros and Thanatos. And I think that's clearly used very powerfully. I, I have to say my longer answer would have to be, um, I'm not sure that the um, site owners or the charity that runs it are quite ready for that. They've taken an awful lot from us. I, I think it would be worth, it would probably be worth um, if, is it Jaya is wanting to- Yeah, Jaya about. was our speaker earlier, yeah, yeah. Yes, I think if Jaya was to approach them and then they asked my opinion, I'd be very supportive of it. But, uh, you know, I know since 2019, I haven't been directly involved in the garden. And I, you know, I've, I've been quite disciplined about that because otherwise I'd never have, left that project and 23 years of my life felt like mm. a magical uh, length of time to devote to the goose and and you know although i still work with this spirit i'm working you know i i did declare really on my last vigil the goose is loose and that to me is a very important concept it, it means i've laid it all out there people can you know they can read the poems they can study the they can study the ritual forms of the halloween of crossbones and the um the vigils and so that to me is really important actually because i think mm. you mentioned earlier about portals and gateways and uh one of the, the deepest blessing we can make at crossbones is open pathways for the dead and the living you know it's it's really for us all to be able to fulfill our potential our most intimate aspirations and that to me is 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 the spiritual life and to be able to do that it's important to get out of the way. And that is the thing the goose taught me, not once, but again and again and again, wherever I got in the way. I mean, because in a way, at her, in her pomp, she's like a, you know, a hurricane or a tsunami of energy. And you get in the way of that, it either drives you mad or kills you. Whereas if you're out of the way, and that was how, going right back to the beginning, that's how that first vision was, that the goose was coming through. And I was sort of, I had felt I'd prepared myself enough to be able to observe it, you know, as John Constable, 
as she did this sort of dance with John Crow, which was otherwise, frankly, quite terrifying. And then as, I, as the work developed, in fact, I became very ill before I did the first Halloween of Crossbones, about two months before, and I was in a delirium, and the goose said to me, you have to honour a living sex worker in public on stage. That didn't mean have sex with them. It meant to say, this is my goose of honour for the night, and she is holding the energy here, and this is what she does, or let her speak for herself, in fact, which is what she did. But in order to persuade her to do that, uh, I wrote a poem for her called The Book of the Honest John, and actually performed it over the phone before we'd met, or you know, we'd met at a conference, but, and that was to persuade her to do it. And, and that poem actually presents exactly um, the sex worker as a spiritual healer. So what you're, this is a long winded answer to what you're saying. Sure. So I would say it's absolutely um, relevant. And certainly there is this section in that of uh, where she's talking about the different forms of sexual healing and she says, um, let's do Magwitch, uh, washing your feet, then wiped, wiping them dry with her hair. Um, let's do the blindfold, the butterfly stroke. Let's try the him and the her. So there's a sort of a, a playfulness of that, of, 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 of the idea of a sex worker, you know, in a, one sense, servicing a client that's the imagery and yet hopefully the reference resonates much more with what you were talking about earlier about mm. ideas of sexual healing sex education uh, you know in working with partnerships and i think this is the thing that's so misunderstood and and indeed even some of the sex workers i know would say it's not really about performance or you know um any of these ideas of sort of the, the the ways we objectify sex that so much of sex including for sex workers is about emotional empathy and things like this and that i think is hugely surprising to a lot of people that that concept and it was perhaps even to me initially but as i managed to get my head around that that actually it really does make sense um and you know, I'm, I'm not sort of condoning all sex work. There's, there's some terrible abuse that goes on. And indeed, we've heard some of those stories too at Crossbones. It's important that all stories are heard at Crossbones, not only the ones we agree with. But we have also heard many stories from empowered sex workers, both male and female, <laughs> who, who feel they've made a choice and they don't identify as victims. And they do, many of them would see their work as being essentially some form of healing. And I think that it's important to respect that as well. And to therefore say, maybe there isn't one size fits all with sex. Sure. You know, sure. But actually, uh, yeah. Ginger, Ginger, go for it. Yes. Uh, for me, we're talking apples and oranges because all the indigenous, the tribes, the grandmothers share the information of how to consummate your love. I love it's it's totally sex and the consummation of love are this is just the antithesis to what I understand all the ancient tribes, the grandmothers taught, the fathers taught, the elders taught that it was, and that's why it was such a natural act. And I, I'm thinking of the sex stuff as a, like a business, which they say prostitution is the oldest <laughs> business, whatever. But yeah, I'm just, very, um, I won't say confused because I am very, um, I, I know that it is apples and oranges of which we are speaking. And so just wanted to kind of pop that in because yeah, all the wonderful, it's just a natural, beautiful thing with all the indigenous peoples and there's yeah oh and just one little anecdote I love this about the Cherokees 
So when two people want to quote unquote get married, come together, howsoever, uh, in the lodge, one family has to stand up for one side and one the other to say, yes, we agree. We think they should. Well, guess what? They have a year. And if it's not working out after a year, they can say, even if a child is born, the mother goes back to her tribe. They say, hasta la bye-bye, been nice knowing you. Mm -hmm. And move on. <laughs> <laughs> now, for me, that works. There's no courts. There's no anything. But anyway, so I just wanted to kind of pop that in. Uh, yeah, it's a whole different um, arena for me. Thank you, Sex. Ginger. I hear you. I do. He I hear what you're saying. And um, working backwards quickly, I think what you're saying at the end there, a year and a day, of course, that's been revived in a lot of pagan traditions in the West uh, as hand fasting, which is what you do. And I think, yeah, I, I agree. There's a lot to be said for that. Um, also working back what you were saying earlier, you know, I totally agree that, you know, in a natural society, um, women would um, educate women and, you know, and men, you know, and, and um, if we would have a much more healthy society. But unfortunately, as we know, you know, um, I did read St. Augustine's um, confessions when I was at university and, you know, he wasn't a bad man, but he was obsessed by sex. And, then, and he was obsessed by his own sinfulness because he couldn't stop thinking about it and even acting on it. But in the Gospel of Mary, Mary Magdalene speaking in the Nag Hammadi, yes. Jesus and Mary, they speak of physics, of how the body, it just, and yes. then that Jesus is, Yeshua is very specific. He says, there is no such thing as sin. Sure. It's only, and he uses the word adultery, but in the Hebrew, it means idolatry. It means worshiping something else sure. other than the beautiful naturalness of, you know, yes. taking it to the sex level as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, so that's yeah. just my little snippet there of my understanding. No, I hear it. And as I say, I think in, in a totally natural society, um, the even the need for, for sex work as we know it certainly wouldn't exist. I mean, we're in a deeply sick society and, and it's in that sense, I would say that many sex workers are actually healers precisely because of this, because it is a very sick society. And we, of course it can be argued, does the very existence of, of women being available to men for sex, you know, I mean, clearly there are debates that go on right at the heart of feminism about whether, you know, whether one can talk of an empowered uh, sex worker with agency, for example. And yes, I mean, it's, as I say, I wouldn't want to take a black and white position on that. I, I, I think it's important that voices are heard. But I do know that, you know, the whore has been both desired and demonized throughout, the certainly, fact. you know, it civil is a culture. Fact. Yeah. Yes, and then just one more little segue back to uh, what you allowed is that, what is the solution? You know, that, that's yeah. where I am. So, you know, yeah. because all the pedophile, the pedophilia is what really disturbs me, especially yeah. by the Catholic church. Oh my God. And yeah. um, so I'm, what I, I always told my people is don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. I so, agree. so that's what I'm, uh, I think that's where I am in the now, you know, I, I don't know, but because about the, I have studied, but what do I know? I, I, I know now what is the condition. And then, so how do we, how do we resolve this and move on? Let's put the history in the past for me, and then let's let's move forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and this is so how I would see Christ's 
no, you know, not in the role of the judge of sin, but as a healer him, himself and, and Magdalene embodying this same healing energy. I maybe because I, I, I think we need to wind me up. And also, please forgive me. I'm going to go after this and not stay for the next speaker only because I haven't eaten all day and I rushed home for this. But I, I there's this piece near the end of the mystery plays where Satan is really trying to. I mean, he says very rudely, um, we'll have the slut and the slag at least. And what about these closet queers? I've got a parlor full of priests taking each other from the rears. So th this is, of course, Satan having a go at the gay priests. By, but Jesus replies, they too are from your power released. I look not at their parts, but here, where angels wrestle with the beast, where there is love, there is no fear. To which Satan replies, oh, no, I will not budge from what Levi's law permits, the book of Leviticus, of course, which uh, sees homosexuality as an abomination, to which Jesus replies, and who are you to judge what they do with their bits, but them that do willfully destroy, who abuse and exploit and corrupt and defile, Satan asks, and the bishop who buggered the altar boy, Jesus says, may well. <laughs> in a hell of his own stew a while but not just to stew in his own rancid juice but to be but to repent and be reconciled to repair the damage and to heal the abuse the scars he has left in the heart of the child for all that enter my keep their bonds i can break there is none here asleep that i cannot wake now to me that is the jesus that i can believe in who's actually an active force in in our lives to transform it and i see thomas back and i think my time's up really thomas but thank you for having me and then just a quick question is your uh celebration going to be videoed tomorrow is it going to be on youtube or uh, some you of it will be certainly i think the vigil in the evening will okay. certainly be and, and quite likely the blessings and bards okay well i'll look for it i'll thank I'll you ginger side and then look and lazarus I'd love to see you there too. Yeah, Lazarus. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> Very quick. You've got a new name, Larry. <laughs> Although John's got to go, but it's uh, sorry. Yeah, John's got to go. But in answer to Thomas, you were talking about Aphrodite, and uh, you were talking about yeah, Gyre, right. Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> My son lives in Boulder, Colorado. I go out there regularly, so I'm a lover of Boulder. Um, but all I would say is that when you know John's John Crow, the Goose, and our friend here has mentioned about it. You know, it's many names. You know, you've got Kwon Yin, you've got Mary Magdalene, you've got Isis, you've got Ishtar, you know, the goddess of love and sexuality. So by naming it Aphrodite, my concern, why not sacred feminine? You know, I know it's been used a lot, but let's let's not get hung up too much on one name because there are more <laughs> ancient names. You know, Mesopotamia, you go back, you go back. And and it's all the same, you know, it's just renaming of the sacred feminine, the divine. So that's my only uh, message to you. If Jai is saying, let's get a thing to Aphrodite, I would say, oh, maybe, you know, um, let's think make of another it more, name. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, or make it a neutral well, by name. By many or, names, yeah. Or any name, yeah. And what's in the name? Anyway, that's hmm. it. That's good. No, thank you. That's a very good thing. So we're waiting for our next speaker um, who is joining us from. Oregon, uh, sorry, Seattle in Washington, and she's due any minute. Um, <clears throat> I wonder if, Kate, if you had any points to, to raise with John. You've listened intently, and you run the Goddess <laughs> Temple in Stroud. What, what do you make of all this? No, I mean, it's really amazing work, really fascinating to hear, and I love the way you've um, mixed magic with practical on the ground and, you know, um, liaising and negotiating on many levels with what you've done um really amazing and I, I suppose um through throughout all of that and the day really but it, it's sort of come up latterly in the conversation just now is it's that sense of imminence and um to me that's what the path of goddess for want of a better expression is wherever we experience goddess, whether it's in a temple or by a tree or in a river or, you know, at a spring. And um, it's that capacity to 
exchange energies and and get out of the way and have that experience of imminence and and I wonder if that energy or that dynamic you know because as we know a lot of Christian uh Church of England Catholic whatever it's all about looking out and seeing God as you know up there somewhere but that I wonder if that um experience of of um imminence of of experiencing god goddess spirit wherever you are you know in a in a the sacred and the profane whether that actually is part of the magic of undoing the the ills that we're talking about you know um yeah that, that's mm. that, thank you it's a really fascinating talk thank i'm going to have to watch the recording there's so much in it thank, thank you, you. Kate. thank you for that response can i very briefly respond? sure john respond yeah I, I think i think that's this idea of imminence yeah really important because i we live in a dualistic universe don't we obviously like light and dark male and female and you know as blake of course that was his greatest i think Recognition without contraries is no progression. It's it's at the very heart of what we are and what we're about. And, and, and somehow this desire to fix it in one or the other, to make the light holy and the dark evil. Um, without the dark, there's nowhere for a star to shine, you know. And, and it, equally, I feel, you know, ideally we are looking at a male and a female expression of divinity in this universe and we kind of need both the imminent and the transcendent we need in a sense the male aspects do tend to objectify god some of the advantages of that perhaps are that um are the that they create a sort of desire for a kind of perfection to therefore to improve ourselves and there are positive aspects to that but equally, I think, you know, it can get horribly out of balance. And then it, this quest for perfection becomes actually fascistic. And, and I think, I, you know, this is, I don't wish to stereotype the masculine and the, and the feminine. And clearly, it, I say this on the understanding that men and women have both these elements at work in them. But one could speak of the feminine perhaps as being more concerned with completion and wholeness rather than with perfection and in that sense i feel this is where we need to find a new balance so we don't stop questing for for sort of the enlightenment if you like but perhaps what the divine feminine can teach us is we really don't have to try so hard it's already here it's already given us actually probably gratitude and love are our best response to being alive and, acceptance um, acceptance just accepting oh that is what i was gonna say ginger but basically yeah. that the upshot is forgiving the self for whatever path led them on a specific journey of understanding and wisdom accepting that wisdom because it ultimately cascades into the greater and i think it's um taking away the, the disdain of walking that journey, that path. Not everybody's going to be walking that path. Some have already done so, not in a, in a, in a paid sense, I am coming. but just by, you know, experience because they don't have any guidance as young people these days. And I think uh, Mary Magdalene, you know, all forgiving all understanding an aspect of the feminine where you know it's okay this is your path this is your these are your choices and that's okay mm -hmm. you know there is wisdom there and there's understanding there for the greater whole and thank you for walking your path so that the greater whole can understand and yeah. um so <clears throat> i think that by elevating not elevating like making it it's um you know a job career but you know um although it has been for many um i think that it's given um an understanding um 
of self, I've worked in the, the welfare sector for many years and I've, I've worked with women too. And um, a lot of the time it's facing the self um, and forgiving the self. And this is where humanity is on a greater platform not just that on all sorts of levels it's that inner forgiveness and then if you can forgive you well then because you understand your journey then you can forgive that person and that person and that person because you have no room to judge i think we heard about forgiveness earlier yeah thank you very much alex um for those comments um i'd like to just thank yeah Final I'm going response. to be leaving you, yes, Thomas. Yeah. I have to, only to eat. No, no, no. We'll be we, watching we, um, all this on video. Yeah. Sure. We want to ju uh, just to thank John again, finally, for joining us. And um, have a great day tomorrow. Yes. Um, and thank you again for all your work. It's been brilliant. And um, we've got our new speaker coming in, um, Anna Dare from um, Seattle. You can, you'll have to listen to her on, on camera. I, I certainly will. And please forgive yeah. me, Anna Death. Yeah. Because, no, no. Uh, yeah, I haven't eaten all day. But lovely to it, talk John. to you. Thank you for all your um, interventions. They were very provocative in, a, in the best possible way. And thank sure. you, Thomas, for inviting me. And No, it's, yeah. it's our pleasure. And That's you've added to the rich. Yes. You've added to the rich uh, mosaic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Well, thank, thank you. The blessings yeah. of the Magdalene be with us today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. 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 Right. So look, here we are with our final dear speaker. Last but not least, um, Annalisa Dares joining us from Seattle. So bless you. Thanks for coming in. Um, she's been involved with the helping to coordinate the Mary Magdalene Studies Association for the last few years has written stuff and given a couple of talks. And she's joining us today to talk about Mary Magdalene and the goddess in the film world, which is an important dimension. She herself runs um, a, a uh, Journey to the Goddess TV project and has interviewed dozens, if not hundreds of goddess scholars, and has just completed a PhD as well at the Pacifica Graduate Institute. <laughs> which is going to be published, I believe, next year now. Um, so she's, you know, um, one of our dearest sisters in this project. I think you're going to love the talks that that were recorded today. And you're going to be adding, I hope, to that mix in your own unique way. So, Annalisa, over to you. Hi, everybody. <coughs> Thanks for having me, Dr. Thomas. Um, and sorry I'm late, but I'm happy to be here. Um, okay, so I just want to give a little bit of context. Um, this is going to be a little more free flowing, actually, because usually I have everything really planned out what I'm going to say, but um, this time I don't. I'm just trusting the goddess that, trusting Mary Magdalene, <laughs> I will know what to say. Um, so in 2014, I embarked on my first Mary Magdalene pilgrimage. It was solo. Last year, I uh, I read the blogs that I had written during that time. And at the end of that journey, I came to realize that my longing, my searching for the real Mary Magdalene or for this woman that they called the Magdalene and this outward search, the journey, the pilgrimage, um, the devotion, the learning was actually about me, it was actually about learning who I am and what it means to be a woman at the most fundamental levels. And so I came out of that experience with this idea of journey to the goddess, that the journey to the goddess is a journey back to the self and a journey of wholeness especially for for all of us, but especially for women who have come from cultures, right, that have denigrated women and the divine feminine. So it's a return to wholeness. wholeness. And more recently, I've come to kind of languages that it's actually the journey to the goddess, the, the journey through women's spirituality is actually a journey toward God realization. Um, so that's, I guess, the container that I want to speak to today. So as I've tried to, over the years, talk about what Journey to the Goddess is, 
um, I, I've come to realize that I, there's like three, there's actually six core tenets that I'm borrowing from the Hindu tradition <laughs> that I see that underline the work, that underlie it and support it and are working through it towards this self-realization or God actualization. Um, and I think that um, as a whole journey to the goddess emulates these principles. So um, in Hinduism, there's six branches of yoga, right? And uh, the first one I'm gonna speak to is jnana or jnana yoga. Um, and that is knowledge or learning and wisdom. So that is the role of the sage, right? Um, and so that obviously is my own journey. When I, after I left the pilgrimage experience, I went straight into graduate school and I was so hungry. I was like, I have to know, I have to know, I have to know, I have to know. And so um, that is part and parcel along, you know, that is the journey of the goddess um, that I try to put forth in the, in the uh, YouTube channel. Hatha yoga, that's another one where I'm, I'm really like, it's not so much that I have, we're doing yoga postures <laughs> in the YouTube channel, but the physicalizing, um, I kind of look at it as the dancer archetype. There's movements and um, realizing uh, yourself as a di divine being kind of through the different, um, the dance of flow and structure that is dance and movement. Um, so that one is kind of less, less present, but it's still, it's still there and fits and starts like when I am, when I interview, um, dancers, um, like Indian classical dancers, for example. So that's present in the channel and then Raja yoga, which means Royal. Um, and the focus on Raja yoga is meditation. And that's, that's the really structured, like very strict, you know, boundary, um, focus branch of yoga. And a lot of it is about actually withdrawing this, the senses. But I think for my purposes, I really hone in on that kind of the meditative practice. Um, so that, uh, and the contemplative. So it's the archetype of the, the, the contemplative. And of course, Mary Magdalene, especially when we get to the medieval period, like that is the medieval Europe period. That's the main archetype that Mary Magdalene embodies in the medieval um, imagination. And then the other one that she embodies, um, and that is also very present in um, the Journey to the Goddess YouTube channel is karma yoga. And that's the path of service, of selfless service. And that's the active, right? That's the very active. It's It can be like, it can be literally like community service that's, devo that's maybe um, more secular, or it can be obviously very religious. <laughs> um, so karma yoga, all toward the greater good. And um, also, I guess there were times in the medieval period when Mary Magdalene was also associated with the active branch of um, religion. Um, but more frequently, we have that juxtaposed between Mary Magdalene and Martha, where Mary is the seen as the contemplative and the mystic, and Martha is more the one following the path of karma yoga. And then, of course, we have bhakti yoga, which is the path of devotion. So we can think of singing. Like I grew up in a non-denominational Christian church, and all I remember from that experience, aside from the fact that I really didn't get what they were saying, is the singing. I loved the singing, and that really um, resonated for me when I started to explore Hinduism and, you know, kirtan and their devotional singing and their devotional poetry. And I feel like I live my life in devotional service to the goddess. So that the very act of making the YouTube channel is bhakti yoga for me. And then Tantra, which is the branch that I'm actually exploring on a kind of a personal and a scholastic level right now. Um, that one is based more in ritual and it's the inner sacred marriage of the feminine and masculine. And I heard you, when I came in, you, you all were kind of having that discussion about the feminine and the masculine, right? And, um, and so, one of the when I was doing research on these six branches, um, one of the sites I went to talked about it as the consecrate consecration and like making sacred. So it's so the focus is on rituals to make sacred again. And that's the whole point of my doctoral thesis. That's the whole point of all these goddess performances that I make and then I put up on YouTube. Um, 
actually, it's the whole point of the work that I do. It's making, making the feminine sacred again, bringing it back into our consciousness, making the female experience and the female body sacred again. Um, so Tantra, Tantra is um, really special to my heart. And um, I just love that um, the word Tantra means to weave. So it's weaving, for me, it's kind of like weaving all of these yogas together and the feminine and masculine towards, you know, God realization. And again, I'm sure probably everybody here, but maybe those at home who will watch this later, um, just so we're all on the same page, the, the word yoga means union or to join. So it's joining um, individual consciousness with um, universal consciousness or universal mind. So it's uh, dualism to non-dualistic consciousness. So that for me is kind of all of the all of the um, the wisdom. These are the wisdom traditions that are underneath the journey to the goddess and the work with Mary Magdalene. But it started with her. She was my guide and my muse. Um, and then another point that I want to bring up is that the work is also about what I call the four R's and this I'm really detailing in my upcoming book, but I'll give you a little snippet here. The four R's are um, re, uh, rematriating, resacralizing, regenerating, and rewriting. So rematriating um, feminine symbols and language. So the idea that my view is that women have always had their own um, language system and symbol system based on our embodied experiences of being female. And those are either lost or subsumed or thwarted or denigrated under patriarchal systems. So Journey to the Goddess, uh, my, my book, all of my work is geared toward remembering, re rematriating symbols that have been lost or subsumed. Um, Resacralizing. So we've already kind of talked about that. Resacralizing the female body in specifically is my kind of go-to, the, the female body and female power. Um, uh, regenerating, regenerating women's wisdom traditions, um, and also our, the way that we pass on knowledge with one another. You know, I think that there's probably always been communities of women that have been sharing and um, teaching one another, but I really feel like as a woman in the 21st century, a Western woman, that I, I don't, I have totally been cut off from the lineage of women's wisdom sharing. Um, and I think a lot of women have, and there's, and this is part of, I think the patriarchal process is, um, is the divide and conquer, <laughs> dividing us from one another um, so that we don't trust one another and we don't have these nurturing relationships. Um, and then, you know, whatever, all the psychologi 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 psychological processes that then um, keep us from overcoming that division. And then the last R is rewriting. So, and rewriting R-I-T-I-N-G. So like re-ritualizing. Um, for example, um, menstrual rites, like that's a big part of my work is rewriting, um, resacralizing menstruation with rituals. Um, and I have done this now um, with my doctoral thesis, with my book and with, I think five performances now at least around the world in which when I go to the land, the land speaks to me to tell a new story, to rematriate, <laughs> resacralize, regenerate and rewrite uh, stories about the goddesses that have been kind of gone, as stories that are really about goddesses and, and female power and retell them to center that power and wisdom and symbolism. Um, and so I, what I would like to share today is one performance that encompasses probably almost everything I just said, definitely the four R's and um, probably embodies the six branches of yoga almost. Well, I'll have to think about that because this is kind of a new, a new kind of concept for me that I'm working with these six branches of yoga and how it applies to my work. So I'd like to share that if I can, Dr. Thomas. And then I can talk a little bit about, you, you had wanted me to speak about um, Mary Magdalene and film. And there's one performance, maybe two that stick out in my mind. Am I, can I share? 
Yeah, you can share. It's it's open for you to go. Yeah. Okay. This is it. Okay. So last time I tried to share something here, I couldn't get the sound to work. So you have to let me know if the sound doesn't work or if it works. I think it should be. Hi everyone, welcome to Goddess Fridays on Journey to the Goddess TV. You can. My name That's is fine. And okay. I am the founding creatrix and hostess of this channel. Today is the fourth of a four part series on Mary Magdalene and regeneration. In the Eastern Christian tradition, there's a story about Mary Magdalene traveling to Rome after Jesus' death and resurrection. When there, she meets with the Roman emperor Tiberius. She tells him about the death and the miraculous resurrection. He doesn't believe her. He says that a man could no more resurrect from the dead than the egg in her hand turned red. And thus, in that moment, the egg turned red. So this story, too, is about Jesus's power to bring life after death. But to me, I see hidden in these stories ancient goddess symbols of death and new birth with Mary Magdalene at its center. In 2018, I traveled to Vatican City, where I performed secretly a retelling of this Eastern Christian story, and it was laid in with goddess symbolism. My hope is that in retelling the story in a way that centers the feminine, that it can inspire women to come home to their innate feminine wisdom and power. I am now going to take you on a journey to the goddess in three symbols. In many creation stories, the universe is birthed from a cosmic egg as a child is birthed from her mother's womb. The egg is like a cosmic womb, dark, enclosed, and the primeval home to all of creation. Though the ancients weren't aware of it, the ova, the egg inside a woman's womb, is another parallel to the cosmic egg. The macrocosmic egg is then mirrored in the microcosmic egg. I believe that the cosmic egg represents the totality of the feminine creative center and her creative potential. Even though Jesus is the egg in this story, I believe that this egg originally referred to the divine feminine power to create new life from death. The second important symbol I worked with is the color red, because it can symbolize the power imbued in women's blood. Red color has been used by humans as far back as 100,000 years ago in South Africa, and is commonly believed to represent blood as a symbol of death, but also of life. Archaeomythologist Maria Gambutis believed that for some ancient cultures, red color emphasized the life-giving and the life-taking power of women's menstrual blood and post-birth fluids. Unlike in patriarchal systems, where menstrual blood is often considered dirty, impure, shameful, and even as a threat to life. In essence, I believe that the red symbolism in the story attributed to Jesus's resurrection likely originated with what may have been considered women's magical powers to create new life and bleed without dying. May we remember that it was always Mary Magdalene who held the red egg in this story. Perhaps to suggest that Jesus's ability to resurrect had something to do with her. The downward facing triangle is an ancient symbol for woman and vulva. I painted the triangle onto the egg with my menstrual blood. It was essential for me that I combine the three elements the egg, menstrual blood, and the downward face and triangle to affirm the feminine symbolism in this story. Hmm. Finally, I centered Mary Magdalene as the protagonist, not the messenger. I see this story as Mary Magdalene's ability to resurrect herself and all women from the shadow of harmful patriarchal narratives about women, particularly women's bodies. In the Western tradition, Mary Magdalene has long been known as a lowly sinner turned saint, 
she epitomizes this dichotomy, which has arguably been projected on all women touched by Christianity. In my version of this story, Mary Magdalene speaks from the Gnostic text, The Thunder Perfect Mind. This text beautifully expresses the two extremes women are expected to embody in our culture with lines like, I am the whore and the holy woman. I am she who is honored and she who is mocked. With dignity, Mary Magdalene uses this text to call out nearly 2,000 years of a smear campaign that did everything to strip her of her power and personhood. She has been used as an example to demean all women, to keep us in our place. I believe that the true meaning of Easter is a celebration of the feminine power to regenerate new life out of death. And this originally was a power attributed to goddesses and women. We don't even have to become mothers to recognize our innate feminine power. This ability to resurrect, to create anew, to regenerate is a part of who we are whether it's biological or otherwise. Thank you so much for joining me. Now I invite you to witness this retelling of the Easter story with Mary Magdalene at its center, the regeneratrix fully embodied in her feminine wisdoms and power. <laughs> I am the first, and I am the last. I am the I am she who is honored, and she who is mocked. I am the poor and the holy woman. I am the putana and the donna santa. I am the wife and the virgin. Io sono la moglie e la vergine. I am the mother and the daughter. Io sono la madre e la figlia. I am the limbs of my mother. Io sono le membra di mia madre. I am humiliation and pride. Io sono l'umiliazione e l'orgoglio. I am ashamed. I am without shame. Io mi vergogno. Io non mi vergogno. Fai attenzione a me. Don't know me. Io sono niente. Sono Maria Madalena. Thank you so much for viewing everybody. If you liked what you saw, then I encourage you to like this video. Okay, I think um, what I'd like to say, what I just realized I didn't say in that uh, introduction to the performance is that I actually performed that in front of the Vatican, as you could probably see, on Easter Eve at like 11 p.m. the day before Easter 2018, um, just to heighten the level of significance involved here. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so that performance and the introduction to the performance, um, like I said, 
embodies everything that I just spoke to um, prior to showing it to you. And, um, and what else? I think maybe I can transition a little bit into talking about a few Mary Magdalene performances that I have liked that I've seen. Um, and I'll be honest, I haven't, I haven't seen many. Um, I haven't seen many, but the ones that I have seen that really spoke to me are, um, I think the director's name was Abel Ferreira for something like that. And Juliette, Juliette Binoche played Mary Magdalene and it was kind of a movie within a movie. And so it followed her journey coming to portray Mary Magdalene. And it was so powerful because it was, it wasn't even like a movie within a movie. It was a third layer of meta because it was like the woman, Juliette Binoche, actually like, you know, playing a woman who was playing Mary Magdalene. And Juliette Binoche, you could see in that film, was actually affected by the process of playing a woman, playing Mary Magdalene, coming to um, fall in love with Mary Magdalene, the woman that was Mary Magdalene. And I'm pretty sure that this actually is the case because when I went on my Mary Magdalene pilgrimage a few years after that film came out, at the um, Hostillerie de la Saint um in, in La Saint Baume, they had a flyer um, for some festivities they'd be giving there that year, and she was like going to be hosting it. Um, so it really felt I really felt like there was a moment in time where that playing that role really actually impacted her relationship with Mary Magdalene. And, um, and then I think um, um, the Italian actress, uh, oh my God, in The Passion of the Christ. And I, I, I can't remember if I've seen the whole film or just her portrayal of Mary Magdalene in that film. Um, oh my God, why am I forgetting her name right now? Anyway, that was just another portrayal that I, I really liked. Just beautiful, raw, and real. Contrasting, like when I see <laughs> photos of Runa Mari, is that her name? The woman who played in the film with uh, Joaquin Phoenix, you'd see like backstage photos and she'd be like hanging out there smoking. And I was like, like, you know, I, I don't know. I, like as an actor, you're. Tr I know that you're trained to portray anybody, but like Mary Magdalene to me feels so sacred that like I want the person who's embodying her to be her <laughs> fully. I don't want to see you like, you know, it just felt disrespectful to me, to me. Like for, for me, that would like the whole filming process would have been a sacred um, ritual pilgrimage endeavor. That's my thoughts. Other people might not agree with me there. Um, and maybe she did a great job. I don't know. I, I've, I've just seen parts of that film. Um, so I, if I, that's what I have kind of prepared and what's coming to me. Is there anything else you'd like me to share, Thomas? What was, what was that last film you were talking about? Um, you mentioned an actress who was smoking backstage. What, what's that oh, film? That's the one that came out more recently. Um, the one with Joaquin Phoenix. The one that was like banned here at first because it was produced by Harvey Weinstein. I can't remember the name. Okay, so I don't know that film. Um, yeah, you do, it was you... very famous. It was very famous. So what sort of year are we talking about? Like within the last five years or? Yes. Um, Yes. Right. And is is Walking Phoenix, is that the name of an actress? I haven't heard of her. Yes. Um, it's a man. It's I'm a looking, man. Yeah, I'm looking up the name of the film right now as we speak. Right. Um, it was the film, oh, it was the film called Mary Magdalene. It was 2018. Yeah, I've seen that one. That was a very good film. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. So it doesn't, you know. Right. He, Thank he, you. No, that's yeah. great. Um, <clears throat> Go ahead. And then there's the more recent one, which is now a Netflix series called The Chosen, which is worth watching, I would say, if nobody's seen it. Um, that's made 
by an American um, contemporary film director as a series. And it, it retells the Mary Magdalene Jesus story in the first um, sequence of, of it's, it's worth watching. But they're in the middle of making it. We don't have, um, you know, the second series yet. So watch watch out for that. It's quite interesting. But actually, as you say, there's very few Mary Magdalene films, really. I suspect there's more that could be made, better ones. Um, yeah, actually, interestingly enough, I um, the second book I have on my mind is one about Mary Magdalene, and I want to incorporate my pilgrimage experience, but also um, some papers that I wrote in graduate school into that book. And I was um, sharing that with a friend, a filmmaker friend the other day, and he started visioning a whole TV show <laughs> um, from this project, this book idea. So there's possibly another one. Well, let's work. hope. Yes. <laughs> let's hope. Um, I, mean, I mean, I'll just start with the first question. I know Alex has got a hand up, but let me just do this one whilst I've got it on my mind. Um, and that's this question of film itself as a genre. In the days of Mary Magdalene, the days of Leonardo da Vinci, there was no film. <clears throat> Films are really recent thing that we've got. It was actually invented in Lyon down the road by the Lumiere brothers. The first scratchy little films they made of workers leaving factories in the 1890s. And then the Americans got involved and it leaped to Hollywood. And But it, as a genre, it's very new. And I'm just wondering, um, <clears throat> is it itself, we've talked about eschatology and apocalypse and so on in, in the theological sense, is film part of the growing revelation of the goddess herself? It all depends on light. It enables us to talk like we're doing now on Zoom and record stuff. This is unthinkable, we couldn't do this before. There's all these amazing movies that come out every year showing the lives of people, men and women. Um, I'm just I'm just thinking, is film itself, I don't know if anyone's written about film studies and goddess studies. You know, who's making films about, about the goddess? <clears throat> I know there's a few documentaries out there, not just Mary Magdalene, but bigger. Indian film is doing lots of, <clears throat> you know, interesting stuff. I, I have a feeling goddess cinema has not yet come of age. I think there's some great films to be made still. Have you looked into any of that? And do you think um, Hollywood might get its act together? And Because we talk about screen goddesses, but I don't think they fully grasp what that could mean, you know? Right. Yeah, no. Um, you know, it's interesting. I think like, just like very basically, film and TV is great because it has a, it's wide reaching. Like when you're doing theater, you're only playing to a small audience and the here and now and what happens tonight will never happen again. Like you have a structure and you're saying the same lines, but then, you know, but with film, you, it is, once it's there, it's like concretized and it has wide, access as long as we have the technology to project it out, right? Um, so at the very basic level, yes, um, it could have something to do to help awaken our goddess consciousness. And um, there was this really famous um, playwright, uh, well, playmaker, um, who's no longer with us. Um, he wrote The Empty Space, Peter Brook, there we go. Forgetting everybody's names today. And mm. so he would talk about film as like how film functions like memory, like our minds do, which is like all these like these clips, like these short clips and, and they don't have to be sequential um, and how that's um, a different experience than being in the theater. Um, so I just, I say that because like I'm, as like an actress, I'm partial to theater and I feel like the trend, I feel like theater is much more tends to be much more transformative because you can engage the five senses in a way that's almost at this point impossible in, in film. Um, so I think that theater actually has a great impact, has a great potential to impact our goddess consciousness, um, even though in a way also doesn't have the same wide reach as film does. 
Um, in terms of those people in Hollywood making films, it's gonna have to be at the grassroots. I mean, I have a friend who just married a film producer, a Hollywood film producer, and he had like asked me a few different times about like, you know, women's stories or biographies that he thinks, you know, might be worth producing. Um, so I think that there might be a few people out there that are curious, but the machine that is Hollywood I don't think is that interested. You know, there might be like a few films here and there that get through, that break through, but if there is gonna be that interest, it's gonna come from the ground up. It's gonna be independent filmmakers and then having like breakthrough success, I think. If you haven't seen Supergirl on Netflix, I, I would say that's a secular kind of goddess type thing. Uh, mm. Supergirl, you know, challenges Superman for for Heroine of the Year award, and it's fun um, and quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Alex, you've got your hand up. Go for it. Well, it's good that you 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 kind of landed on that point where where the feminine challenges the masculine, and it's it's brought it up. I'm not a feminist. I'm an equalitist, and with the rise of the feminine uh, and you know the embodiment of Mary Magdalene. Um, and, you know, the feminine finding her, her place again. Do you think we as the feminine are supporting our men folk in that change? Are we creating our own divide by pushing them away by saying you're part of that? Or are we giving them an opportunity to evolve with us and actually be that partner to the masculine? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, for me, for me, my journey had to start with myself, though. Right. I had to start with me. And I had to go through anger and pain and learn the problem, learn the deep root problem that's gone on. But also when you learn the problem, you also learn that it's not, there's not one person or one group of people to point the finger at. Right. So the, are we creating that divide ourselves? I, some people probably are. Yeah. Some, some people are for sure. I mean, like, um, there's absolutely some people within the, the feminist branch that are um, probably unknowingly a lot of them, probably a lot. Not realizing that they also, as the feminine, they have an opportunity to, to be the feminine in supporting the masculine in this evolution. Right. Absolutely. And I think we just each have to come to that on our own because some people just need to spend a lot of time being angry. <laughs> that, um, I've also, I, coming back to what you were saying about where you first, you know, had to go through your own processes. Yeah. Now, when you were talking about the two women and the two actresses, there were, you were saying two separate incidents, weren't you? Yeah. And two separate act, and films, two separate actresses. Now, in your first part, you said it was phenomenal because there was almost like three layers going on in that process. But on the second one, you were quite disappointed because she was not the epitome of the role. So do you think by you being the observer and already having the awareness, but that person in the second film, she's embarking on that self-awareness journey, journey that you're currently talking about. Does that make sense? I think so. Is it possible that she's like on, on you the- You were witnessing, oh, you were witnessing, because you're the witness in this. This is right. your observation, isn't it? So you witnessed the first actress um, um, learning on right. three different layers, but you, but seeing it as an ob in an observational way to see that the one that wasn't quite there yet. Yeah. I'm having a fag. Yeah. She wasn't quite, she was a bit more of the whole than the, you know, the, the same. Or, or just um, like the Was she part of, on her evolutionary process and were you observing that? I, that, I just thought I'd put that back to you. Yeah, no, that's an interesting question, quite possibly. I mean, yes, because we're all on some kind of journey. <laughs> we're all on some kind of soul journey. So yes, um, absolutely. Um, I've got one more before I get switched over. Yeah, yeah, of um, course. You were saying about the egg. Um, I d we're in a, a shamanic druidic culture, mm -hmm. very um, earthy based. 
Um, and I know a lot of women and I've done it myself over the years. I don't do it anymore I'm past that age. But, um, in pre, you know, in, in my younger days, I would pee outside oh, cool. on my menstrual cycle because I'm gifting my eggs back to the earth that I have not used. Um, and the earth is carnivorous. Mm -hmm. So she's eating that and she's recycling that. But because we're in a culture where we're all going to the loo, unless I'm a walker, so I'm always 